Rodney Jones, I see you're the only one that's not muted. Is there anybody else on here? Or am I the first one? Salute, it's, uh, it's 6.30 in the morning in Phoenix. Oh, um, I heard someone. <laughs> Greg Stanton, I'm, it's, it's 6.30 in the morning, 6.20 in the morning and I'm here. There's a Rodney Jones, that's it. Oh, Greg Stanton. Six, it's 6.20 in the morning, brother. I can't hear you. Some weird audio. We got a weird audio going on. All right. Oh, there. Oh, there we go. Can you hear me? Okay, it's still weird audio. I I can't hear you for some reason. Okay, let me switch it up. Thank you for letting me know that. I can't hear you. Is it? Do you have the connection in your ears, your iPods? Now your picture's not up.
Testing one, two, three, four. Audio check. Testing one, two, three, four. Loud and clear, Larry. Excellent. Can we just get a couple of folks to just give us a little audio from their WebEx connection? Good morning, everybody. Good morning, ma'am. One, two, three, four. Testing, testing, one, two, three, three, nine, one. All right. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Good morning. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Excellent. That was a little that was a little low, but I think we're okay. Most most everyone's coming through loud and clear. One, can two, three, me? four. This is, uh, this is Rep. Carberhall. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, Mr. Carberhall, you are a little low. I have some weird setup because I, for some reason, I have everybody on video, but I can't hear them. Um, and so I, I also have the phone now so that I can hear the audio. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. It's a little low for your. Are you on a laptop or a, a mobile device? I'm on a desktop. Okay. This is a mobile device that you're that you're hearing me on. So for the desktop. My. Sure. So for the desktop, my, if you want to. My desk. My desk. Had to do a call in, but with the phone because the audio was distorted on the video feed. Okay, sure, understood. Um, and that may clear up. That may have just been an initial uh, issue. Also, you can switch the audio back onto the desktop. And if you move your mouse around and select the three dots and you'll see speaker, microphone, and camera, you can select uh, which speaker that audio is coming out from to be able to test that. Do you not feel that distorted? And it's got turned off. Yeah. So Rick Larson is doing a sound check. All right, watch out, Eric. I got We got. We got this again. We can hear you loud and clear, Mr. Larson. Great. I think. Uh, can I just say? I think I hear too much of Salute Carbajal. So if you could. I feel like fix, I feel like Salute that. to announce the imposition of martial law from that setting. <laughs> can you hear me? Salute, comrade. Comrade Carbajal announces <laughs> martial law. Seems very official. Is he in the chaz? <laughs> in the chaz. <laughs> I want to let you know the chaz is like 30 miles away from me. It's nowhere near where I am. Something like that. <laughs> Maloney suggested Carball was making some sort of announcement from there, but it, I think that's actually how he decorates his living room. <laughs> are you are you kidding? His wife decorates it for him. If he's, <laughs> if he's like me, she even dresses him. <laughs> All right. That's actually that's actually his bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> this is support yeah. staff. I've just. The living I've room just been statues in it. That's right. I've just been reminded to remind everybody that this is already on live stream, <laughs> just so you all know. Okay. 
I see how doing public, them. The, the public will see how well we get along. That's wonderful. Because it's true. Yeah, they can see there were equal opportunity insulters. We get everybody. <laughs> Everybody's too quiet. Well, we're counting on you waking us up. Scare them into here. Can you hear me? Sing yeah. a few notes and we'll tell you, Salute. All right, I, all right, I made it. I, I my desktop not is, isn't working. Oh no, Salute, we can hear you. The question is, can you hear my vote? Your vote, absolutely. <laughs> if anyone was paying attention to that yesterday, good to see you, Salute. Or I guess not see you yet, Salute. But. It's morning, very early know. California. You're over in California, right? So That's it's right. you got six thirty over there. Yes. It's oh a, man. It's really early. Hi, Abby. Hi there. This is Grace. Yes, it is six, a little after six thirty. Yeah. Oh, good. I am. I am. Grace, who is up Grace. at six thirty, and video. Yeah. Grace looks perfect. I know. <laughs> Very impressive. Like we're going to the airport. Oh my goodness. Oh, uh, nope. You didn't say I look perfect. I can't see. I can't see you. Salute. Probably because you're young. Gentlemen are all wearing yeah. reasonable yeah. in the Midwest. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Morning. Morning. Hi, Sherry. Morning, good morning. Good morning, good morning, everyone. It's not even that early here in uh, see my colleagues. Kansas. Hello, Salud. West Coast. Salute, it's Alan. Can you hear Salud, me? Salute, you do look me? perfect, just for the record. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> good morning, my West Coast people. Good morning. Committee on good Transportation morning. Infrastructure good will good come morning. to order. Uh, the order of business is to continue amendments uh, to HR2. Uh, I'm pleased to see that um, uh, we have a number of uh, early risers on the West Coast. Thank you very much for the early hour. Uh, you're looking great. And uh, we're ready to proceed as soon as they hand me an amendment. There we go. Okay. Uh, first, uh, uh, first amendment uh, to be considered uh, is an amendment uh, by Mr. Stanton. It will be designated by the clerk. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR2, offered by Mr. Stanton, number 021. Uh, without objection, the uh, amendment be, will be considered as read. Uh, Mr. Stanton uh, is recognized uh, for three minutes in, to speak on his amendment. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everybody. This amendment deals with zero emission vehicles. Zero emission vehicles have tremendous potential opportunities. Greg, you came through strong at first, and then you faded out a little. Maybe you moved away from the mic or something. I don't know. Mr. Chairman, can you hear me now? Yeah. Zero emission vehicles have a tremendous potential opportunity to provide climate, human health, and business benefits through the elimination of harmful tailpipe emissions, as well as an introduction of a more reliable technology. Recognizing that alternative fuel vehicles are heavier than traditional diesel powered trucks, the FAST Act included a very modest weight exemption for natural gas vehicles to compensate for the additional weight of natural gas fuel systems and tanks. This helped level the playing field for these trucks that were unable to haul the same amount of freight as diesel powered trucks. In 2019, the provision was expanded to include uh, electric vehicles, battery electric vehicles. My amendment would take it a step further and simply add zero emission vehicles, including hydrogen and other innovative technologies, to the exemption. Diesel engines have had 100 years to be refined to meet current standards. This exemption would ensure newer vehicle technologies that offer environmental, clean energy, as well as business performance benefits are competitive by bringing these vehicles more in line with other alternative fuel commercial vehicles and providing fleet operators incentives to invest in more sustainable fleets and energy efficient trucking technologies. Encouraging implementation of innovative vehicle technologies and heavy duty fleets across the country strongly aligns with the investments we have made in alternative fuel corridors and in the research and development of alternative fuel vehicle technologies and infrastructure. By simply adding zero emission vehicles to the current weight exemption, we can support ongoing efforts to reduce pollution stemming from, transport, from the transportation sector, creating safer driving environments, and keep America and our commercial fleets on the cutting edge of technology innovation. And I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. Uh, thanks, gentlemen. Others wish to be heard on the amendment. Uh, then I'll speak to the amendment. Uh, as I understand uh, the amendment, uh, this would uh, provide the same exemption uh, previously provided uh, for compressed natural gas vehicles. Uh, it would uh, go to electric vehicles. Some have been critical because at this point of time, there is only one uh, uh, heavy duty electric uh, truck out there, the Tesla. Uh, however, uh, I am familiar uh, with both Freightliner and Volvo and uh, perhaps another company uh, who are working oh. on full size uh, on uh, on long distance uh, 80,000 pound uh, trucks? Uh, so I think it uh, I think it's a meritorious amendment. I've got to say one other thing. Coming from the West, the great thing about electric trucks, we have had to build extra lane miles in Oregon as freight traffic rose through a series of mountains in southern Oregon on Interstate 5, the fifth busiest truck route in the world uh, because the trucks can't proceed, many of them at much more than six or eight miles per hour up these very steep grades. An electric truck uh, will handle those at a speed limit and then it will regeneratively brake on the way down the other side. So uh, in addition to providing zero emissions, it will actually uh, reduce the potential for having to uh, build more uh, passing lanes on uh, mountain uh, mountain roads uh, throughout the western United States and any other parts of the country that might have uh, mountains. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I'm prepared to accept the amendment. Are there any amendments to the amendment? Uh, hearing none, uh, I'm going to ask unanimous consent that the amendment be adopted as written. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, the uh, clerk designate the amendment for Mr. Babin. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 2, offer of Mr. Babin, number 041. Um, uh, I've been asking the consent the amendment be considered as read. Uh, Mr. Babin is recognized for three minutes uh, to speak to his amendment. Trying to figure out which one this is. Yes. 41. 41 is this? Uh, it's section 9510 okay. of the bill. 44, I've got 4405, uh, 126. These numbers have kind of gotten me confused. 
Okay, here, you want to take? The what? The borders, okay. Yeah. All right, thank you, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Uh, I'm concerned that some of the language in Section 4405 as written may result in an inspector. Uh, wait a minute, this is border crossing. I'm, I apologize. First, I want to thank my colleague and friend, Henry Cuellar, for his good and bipartisan work on this amendment. Simply, this amendment will fix Section 9510 in the Chairman's bill because concerns have been raised that this section rolls back recently achieved safety, security, and efficiency improvements, including a reduction in blocked crossings on the Laredo International Rail Bridge. These improvements, which were based on agreements made between Kansas City Southern, Union Pacific, the FRA, CBP, and SAT, which is Mexico CBP equivalent, protected trains crossing the southern border from theft, vandalism, and trespassing, and did not come at a loss of American jobs, wages, or hours. To the contrary, due to the more efficient use of our border infrastructure, more trains have been able to cross the border, which has brought more jobs to Laredo, my friend Henry Cuellar's district, and other nearby rail yards. If the unreasonable restrictions imposed in the underlying bill are enacted, all of these gains will be lost during a time when we are all trying to help our economy to recover uh, from the pandemic. To close, TSA and CBP both emphasize that a train at rest is a train at risk. And by that standard, Section 9510 of this bill only imposes further risk. Today, I'm offering this amendment, but I am choosing to withdraw it but urge the chairman to work with the committee and across the aisle to ensure that all the good progress made on this issue is not lost. When I say across the aisle, I'm actually helping my friend Henry Coyer on the other side of the aisle uh, to, to fix a problem in his district. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that something that we could work with uh, going forward? Uh, certainly, uh, you know, Mr. Bramman, I'm, I'm familiar with this. I've had numerous conversations, Mr. Cuellar, uh, I have visited, I will visit again. Uh, we do need to find a solution to this Nettleson problem. It, it is complicated uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, trains being conducted within the U.S. Uh, by Mexicans who do not meet U.S. standards. Um, so uh, I, I, there's got to be a solution somehow. I've talked to labor, I've talked, we've attempted to talk to Kansas City Southern, who I think uh, could be more forthcoming. And uh, I, I hope that we can get this resolved to our mutual uh, concern, because I, I raised the issue of block crossings earlier uh, in the hearing, and it is an ongoing and tremendous concern. So with that, I, I appreciate the gentleman's offer to withdraw, and uh, we'll continue to work on maybe, and hopefully we can work out something before we go to the floor. Absolutely, okay, thank you. Okay. Yield back. Uh, without objection, the amendment is withdrawn. Next amendment. Uh, the clerk will designate the amendment by Mr. Levinsky. 197, uh, I've been handed 197 by Mr. Levinsky. I can't hear you. An amendment to the amendment in the nature of substitute to HR 2 offered by Mr. Levinsky, number 097. Oh, uh, this is a revised 197. 197. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, without objection, the amendment is considered as read. Mr. Pinsky is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as an engineer, I'm a big advocate for technological innovation in transportation. I, I, Dan, uh, if you could speak up a little bit louder, please, or or it could have, the staff could turn up the volume, one or the other. Go ahead. All right. There. Good. Is this good? Yeah, good. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, uh, I'm an engineer and I'm a big advocate for technological innovation in transportation. Today, road transportation, as we all know, is being enhanced by innovative driver assist technologies that many of us have on our cars, SUVs, and trucks, such as automatic emergency braking, advanced cruise control, and lane departure correction. This amendment would create a new $20 million a year grant program that would help get these driver assist technologies on buses. These would only be driver assist. They would not take the drivers out of the buses. 
The program would copy the structure of the successful National Fuel Cell Bus Program from a few years ago. That program helped launch the zero emission bus industry by bringing together a consortium of interested parties to develop that technology and bring it to market. The fuel cell bus program successfully incentivized manufacturers to invest internally in developing te the technology, helping bring the technology to market faster, spawning an entirely new manufacturing sector, creating hundreds of U.S. jobs, and keeping America competitive in zero emission technology manufacturing. The program that would be created by this amendment would seek to achieve similar outcomes in the driver assist technology space for buses. By funding the establishment of, a, of three nonprofit consortia made up of industry, labor, transit agencies, and testing facilities to advance critical driver assist technologies for buses. This amendment is supported by labor groups, including TTD and TWU, and received, it has received encouragement by transit agencies and manufacturers working to advance new transit technologies. Mr. Chairman, I ask my colleagues to join me in uh, supporting this amendment, and I yield back. Are there other members who wish to be heard on the amendment? Uh, hearing none, I'll speak to the amendment. Uh, I rise to uh, support the gentleman's amendment. Uh, as the gentleman stated, uh, this would uh, not exceed level three let automation, driver assist, uh, it is supported uh, both by transit unions, by transit companies, and by manufacturers. Uh, it could uh, dramatically enhance uh, safety in certain circumstances uh, and, uh, and facilitate uh, more throughput. So uh, with, uh, without objection, uh, uh, I'll ask unanimous consent without objection that the amendment be adopted. Hearing no objection. The amendment is adopted. Uh, the clerk will report uh, amendment by uh, Mr. Gibbs. An amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR2 offered by Mr. Gibbs, number 024. Uh, without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. Mr. Gibbs is recognized for three minutes. Good morning, Chairman. My amendment uh, strikes section 6 from this bill. Section 6006 would establish that this committee considers the creation of a new task force to create an excise tax on the movement of freight, and if this is a viable option for raising highway revenues. Creation, I believe that creation of this, tax, of this task force is premature. This bill has an extremely high price tag without any serious proposal to how to pay for it, and this uh, proposal seems to me to be equivalent of the value-added tax, which I don't think is the answer. I believe that any, any consideration of an additional excise tax is premature until Congress considers all funding op options and the impact of these options that would have on American companies and American consumers. So if you're going to do a task force, Mr. Chairman, I think you ought to open it up to everything and look at uh, vehicle miles <coughs> tax, uh, all, all our different options, and not just have one that look at a specific excise tax uh, that's dangerous. I think that's uh, for a tax on different levels of moving freight. And uh, I think it, it, it sure looks like a value-added tax, which I think is very harmful to our economy and our, our American companies and consumers. So I yield back. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Others wish to speak uh, to the amendment? I do. Uh, Mr. Lowenthal is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I oppose the amendment and urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to do the same. <clears throat> As this committee knows all too well, Every time we consider the surface transportation bill, we must look for more money to fill in the growing shortfall of the Highway Trust Fund. It's imperative that Congress examine ways to raise sustainable, dedicated revenues for transportation improvements. I've worked on this concept of a freight way bill since I first came to Congress, and I've met many members on this committee on both sides of the aisle about this approach. A freight fee is based upon a simple principle. The users and beneficiaries of our freight system should help fund its improvement. Section 6006 of the Invest in America Act does not impose a new fee or any new tax. It simply convenes a task force to examine this approach. The task force would study how much money it could raise, how we could administer a fee without having a burden on the freight industry. 
Underlying bill makes key improvements that will enhance our freight infrastructure, but we all know that our states and districts will need additional resources in the years fo as we go forward. The current infra grant, grant program for freight is oversubscribed 12 to 1. That means dozens of worthwhile projects to improve the movement of freight across the country are delayed or shelved. This section is supported by a broad coalition of freight stakeholders, including departments of transportation, port authorities, local entities, and freight corridors across the country. I urge all members to vote, to vote no on the amendment, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Others wish to be heard on the amendment. Uh, hearing none, I'll speak to the amendment. Uh, I would rise in opposition uh, to the gentleman's amendment uh, if this were suddenly and abruptly uh, invoking a new fee. Uh, I would uh, be adamantly oppose it. However, uh, what this does is initiate a study on yet another potential source uh, of funding for the future as we move away from uh, diesel and uh, gasoline-powered uh, vehicles. Uh, we, uh, you know, we need to find ways to uh, have uh, infrastructure self-funded in the future. I've always appreciated the self-funded uh, nature of infrastructure, though one could argue that uh, we're uh, better off to borrow money for capital investment like infrastructure than we are for operating uh, the, the federal government on a day-to-day -day basis, which we do all the time. In any case, uh, we do need to find solutions. My state has a weight mile tax, uh, which is reassessed every five years uh, to determine the burdens put on uh, the road system by various users. Uh, when I was first in Congress uh, for two or three uh, Lou, T, and whatever yeah, uh, iterations, uh, the industry attempted to repeal it. Now they have come uh, to terms with it. We collect it electronically. They don't have to stop. They drive through. Uh, the, uh, they find that diesel is less expensive uh, in Oregon. Uh, and uh, and uh, they, they are, uh, you know, fine with it. And it helps us to mitigate uh, properly and compensate for the impact of uh, heavier trucks. And we do allow uh, uh, triples and uh, over 80s with permits. Uh, on on our highway system uh, to make a fair contribution. So this, uh, this also has potential for the future. The bill also includes provisions for a nationwide pilot program on VMT. Uh, I expect in the next, uh, uh, next surface reauthorization, uh, you know, five years from now, that uh, we will be moving uh, to new ways to finance infrastructure. So uh, I would uh, strongly oppose the amendment. Uh, are there amendments to the amendment? Uh, hearing none, uh, the question is on uh, the amendment. Uh, so uh, please, those who are going to vote in favor, unmute. If you are in favor of the amendment, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, please mute. Uh, those who are opposed, please unmute. Oh. Those who are opposed to the amendment signify by saying no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the no's strongly have it. The no's have it, and the amendment is not agreed to. Uh, the clerk will report uh, an amendment by uh, Mr. Maloney. An amendment to the amendment in the nature of substitute to H.R. 2, offered by Mr. Maloney of New York, number 086. Uh, I would ask him to consent the amendment be considered as read. Mr. Maloney uh, is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, pretty simple amendment. It would restore the National Scenic Byways Program, uh, which has gone unfunded for um, eight years since 2012. Um, these scenic byways are in every part of our country, and there's probably not a member of this committee um, that doesn't benefit from the National Scenic Byways Program in my own beautiful Hudson River Valley District in New York. Uh, these these byways uh, uh, pass by uh, extraordinary sites like Bear Mountain or the United States Military Academy, West Point, and Storm King Mountain, uh, Washington's Revolutionary War headquarters uh, in Newburgh, New York, and the connection to Beacon. Uh, but of course, that would be true of every member of this committee. Um, it would reauthorize the program for five years, provide millions to local communities, 
Uh, and I should note the chairman's longtime uh, stalwart support for this program, uh, which of course uh, supports many areas in his own beautiful part of the world. Uh, so I urge my colleagues to support the amendment, and with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Uh, other members wish to be heard on the amendment. Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Davis recognized three minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to my colleague, Mr. Maloney, for offering this amendment. Uh, cutting straight across my district is historic Route 66 that I've been fortunate to tour numerous times to see the economic impact it brings to our community, supporting many jobs and key activity, key economic activity in our rural and small towns. Uh, for example, along Route 66, we can see a giant pink elephant statue and other larger-than-life sculptures at the Pink Elephant Antique Mall in Livingston. They can see a movie at the, the Whale Day Theater in Edwardsville, which originally opened in 1909, or stop for an all-day breakfast at Jungle Jim's Cafe, a quintessential roadside diner in Springfield, Illinois. Because of the economic catalyst many of these byways serve, I strongly support reauthorization of funding for the program. And for that reason, I urge my colleagues to support this amendment and yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. If others wish to be heard. Uh, if not, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Oh, yes. Mr. Chairman. Yep, uh, Ms. Titus. Thank you very much. I'll see Mr. Davis's pink elephant and I'll raise him an Eiffel Tower and the pyramids here on the Las Vegas Strip. Uh, I'm the Democrat co-chair of the Congressional Travel and Tourism Caucus, and I want to thank Mr. Maloney for leading this effort to reauthorize the National Scenic Byways Program. I have the first nighttime scenic byway in my district, which is the Las Vegas Strip. There's nowhere else in the country within just a couple of miles. You can see a pyramid, the Statue of Liberty, the Doge Palace, a pirate ship, and the Eiffel Tower. All around Southern Nevada, too, there are spectacular byways that cut through places like Red Rock Canyon, the Valley of Fire, the Spring Mountains, gorgeous uh, natural resources that people can enjoy and uh, gaze at with wonder. So I wholeheartedly support this amendment, and I yield back. Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes. Uh, well, Mr. Weber. Mr. Ah, Weber, Weber, I see you, Randy. Go right ahead. You're recognized for three minutes. I'll see her Eiffel Tower and raise her an Alamo. I'll yield back. <laughs> hey, I thank the gentleman. Uh, others wish to be heard with uh, scenic wonders in their district. Oh, uh, <laughs> Mr. Little Graves. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I just want to quickly thank Mr. Maloney uh, for, for bringing this bill up. I, I know that um, uh, last year I had a chance to, to work on this bill. Um, with Ms. Cicilline, and I think I recall my, my good friend from Illinois uh, jumping up on the floor and, and speaking in support as well. Um, so I, I just want to urge adoption, and I appreciate my friend from New York uh, taking the lead on this. Yield back. I thank Mr. Graves. Oh, hello, Mr. Any Chairman. more scenic touring? Yes, it, me. Oh, Alvio, recognize yes, for three I minutes. Mr. Uh, Sirius. Congressman Bologna for this. This is great, but I just want to remind everybody that the real thing is in my district, the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> so noted. It's not quite on the highway, but okay. Uh, with that, uh, having taken a tour of part of America, I got to add my part. Uh, uh, you can uh, see, uh, I mean, there, we heard some very notable things, and uh, I have the, oh God, I forgot the name already. Oh, prehistoric gardens where you can see fabulous politically, I mean, environment, whatever, biologically correct uh, dinosaur replicas amidst an old growth forest. So I think uh, we all need to tour around each other's districts a bit. Um, I've been in Rodney's district. I did miss the pink elephant and jungle gyms, but uh, my wife is from your district. If I ever get back there, I'm going to look them up. <laughs> all right, thank you. Um, you know, actually, uh, I, I, I do strongly support the amendment. I would, I would disagree. I, I think what uh, uh, Mr. Maloney meant was, uh, I think the program was last reauthorized in 12. Actually, this was a program that uh, John, uh, Senator John Rockefeller and I created way back in the 90s in one of the T iterations. I can't remember what the acronym was or what it stood for, but it, it has been a longstanding uh, program and, and it's meritorious of support. I fully support the amendment. 
Um, I'm uh, willing to uh, accept the amendment by unanimous consent. Uh, I'll ask uh, unanimous consent that the amendment uh, be accepted. Hearing no objection, the amendment is accepted. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the clerk will designate uh, uh, Mr. Gibbs. An amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR2, authorized Mr. Gibbs, number 025. Uh, without uh, objection, the amendment is considered as read. Mr. Gibbs, the right time for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> My amendment would strike section 9511 from the bill. Section 9511 would expand the scope of our service laws to apply to railroad yard master employees. Employees in, imposing hours of service restrictions on all employees engaged in all activities is impractical and unnecessary. Current hours of service laws already cover employees directly involved in the movement of trains along the rail, rail line. A yard master is a supervisor of a rail yard. Yard masters monitor activities of workers in and around yards and coordinate freight car movements for loading and unloading. The yard master is merely a conduit working from an office and transferring directions and instructions from management to the employees on the ground. The yard master, as much like the other management employees, is engaged in an activity that could impact the safe operation of the train. They are already subject to hours of service laws already. The vast majority of yard masters work at a set shift with set days off, already reducing fatigue concerns. These work schedules and hours of work are already addressed in the current regulations and railroad collective bargaining agreements. In a recent Federal Railway Administration study, 99.8% of all train accidents were attributable to personnel other than yard masters, and of the and two, only two tenths of percent is attributable to yard masters, and zero were proven to be related to fatigue. That's a uh, Federal Railway Administration study. Hours of service laws are intended to promote safety while employees are directly involved in the operation or movement of trains. And when a yard master takes on these roles, hours of service laws already apply. This provision would not increase the safety of railroads, and the FRA data supports this by finding that zero accidents are attributable to yard masters have been related to fatigue. I, uh, Mr. Chairman, I am prepared to withdraw this amendment and look forward to continuing with the chairman on this issue, or working with the chairman on this issue. I yield back. Uh, I thank the gentleman's uh, willingness uh, to withdraw. We are always uh, uh, interested in the highest levels of safety, and I, I would be interested in working with the gentleman uh, to examine, uh, you know, the uh, whether or not uh, this is uh, necessary, and and what are the conditions uh, in. Uh, it's a very complicated environment in some very large yards. So uh, with that, I. Uh, Appreciate the gentleman's willingness to withdraw, and uh, without objection, uh, the uh, amendment is withdrawn. Uh, clerk will report Mr. Cohen. An amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by Mr. Cohen, number 087. Uh, without objection, the amendment. Without objection, the amendment is considered uh, as read. Mr. Cohen is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate the uh, work of the committee and the, and the chair in helping get some of my proposals into the main bill and into the manager's amendment. But this is one that, that, that still needs to come, and it's an important bill. DUI is a serious issue in our country. Uh, this DUI bill would require all the states to report DUI arrests and DUI uh, convictions to a central base, uh, which is the Interstate Identification Index. Uh, state and local officials have to report all these arrests and the, be there, and, and they have a system and they can keep everybody uh, a, 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 a registry. What happened in, in outside of Memphis in North Mississippi several years ago was some people were going for a vacation and a fellow was DWI, uh, and he hit and, and killed two young women. It was a very serious... Uh, tragic event, he'd had five different DUIs that had all been adjudged first offenses in Mississippi because they didn't have a registry and didn't report anything to where people knew the priors. And he had seven or eight priors. Oh, seven or eight priors, and he only was charged with the first offense. Okay. Even though, uh, even though he had all The gentleman, the so gentleman will suspend. Someone is not muted. Please. 
I'm looking around, can't see who it is, but anyway, we want to be able to hear the gentleman. Gentleman may continue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. But what this would do is require all DUI offenses and convictions to be reported to this interstate identification index, and, and that would allow states to know when there's a multiple offender and to charge them as such. If this man had been charged properly, he wouldn't have been on the road and these people wouldn't have died. Uh, only 79% of the agencies in my state participate right now in this program, and, uh, and, and no state has 100% of its law enforcement agencies reporting this data. It's something that time has come and needs to occur to save people from being victims of, of DUIs by multiple offenders. Uh, this would stop grants from going to states uh, for just DUI in general. Instead, they would all go to programs where they have to make inform people about the dangers of driving while intoxicated and, and the specific program. And I hopefully that would get the states to comply. Uh, the Mothers Against Drunk Drivers have been helpful with this. Uh, this has its place, but it doesn't have its place in anybody that's driving a car and help us stop people that drink and drive. That's what this bill is about, and I, I move passage. Others uh, wish to be heard on the amendment. Okay, uh, with uh, I will then uh, recognize myself. Um, I have uh, worked very closely with mothers against drunk driving since uh, my first uh, days in politics as a county commissioner. Uh, my wife's sister was killed uh, by a drunk driver, so we've been personally affected. Uh, by drunk driving, and I don't think there's anyone who takes a stronger stance against it and wants more enforcement. But my particular concern with this amendment is the perverse impact uh, of saying that if a state doesn't properly report DUI uh, uh, arrests to uh, that they would lose drunk driving prevention funds, uh, which seems uh, a perverse way to enforce of this provision. I, I'd be happy to work with the gentleman to find uh, other ways uh, to improve or incentivize uh, reporting by the states of drunk driving so we can have a meaningful national registry. We've been working on this for years uh, for people who have lost uh, their driving privileges in commercial vehicles uh, uh, so they can't move uh, to another state uh, un unbeknownst to that state with a, uh, with a bad uh, driving record. So uh, I'd urge uh, the gentleman, if he would, to withdraw and uh, we'll work on alternate, alternative ways uh, rather than withholding uh, the funds to prevent drunk driving. Uh, knowing, I, I think it was uh, uh, Light Horse Harry Lee said it's better to run away today than to be able to fight another day. And in the spirit of Light Horse Harry Lee, I will withdraw the amendment. I thank the gentleman for his, his offer to withdraw. And um, uh, with, without objection, uh, the amendment will be withdrawn. Uh, the, uh, the clerk will report amendment by Mr. Gibbs. An amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR2 offer Mr. Gibbs, number 027. Zero what, seven? Two seven. Okay, two seven, I thought you said three. Okay, zero two seven. Uh, without objection, uh, the amendment will be considered as read. Uh, Mr. Gibbs recognized for three minutes. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my amendment would strike section 4202. Bob, Bob, you might just speak up a little bit more. Okay. Uh, my amendment would strike section 4202 from the bill. Section 4202 would make FMCSA's compliance safety and accountability program or more commonly known as the CSA safety record public once again. Allowing section 4202 would reinstate a program which has substantial flaws that negatively affect a trucking business rep reputation and safety rating. If another vehicle causes an accident with a truck, should the truck be penalized when the other vehicle is determined to be at fault? Well, the answer, of course, is no. Yet under the CSA program, that accident counts negatively towards the carrier score. Under this language, an accident not caused by a truck driver will impact on the carrier score. This can result in lost business and unintended economic damage to the trucking industry. C CSA scores should be used internally for resource allocation and that will ultimately determine if a carrier is safe to use. FMCSA has responsibility to ensure our roads are safe 
and should not be using flawed methodology to brand companies as unsafe or unfit to use. I urge adoption of this amendment by both sides of all members present, and I yield back. Other members wish to be heard in the amendment. Uh, hearing none, I'll address the amendment. Actually, uh, I've been intimately uh, involved in this issue since I chaired the Transportation uh, uh, Service of Transportation Subcommittee in uh, 2007 to 2010. Uh, held uh, numerous hearings on this, uh, was very critical of FMCSA, their criteria, particularly the no-fault uh, criteria if your truck is parked. Uh, they have dithered for now more than a decade. Uh, the problem is they have uh, accumulated some data. It's incomplete. Uh, it has created problems for brokers. Uh, brokers would like to have a meaningful database uh, that has proper criteria uh, so they can weed out uh, unsuitable uh, drivers so they're not subject uh, to litigation for having uh, brokered a load uh, to someone with a miserable driving record unbeknownst to them. Uh, only, I think, 3% uh, of carriers are currently rated as most are unrated. Uh, so it's this big black hole out there. Um, and uh, the, uh, you know, there's two solutions proposed. We fix this, uh, this uh, crappy system, uh, get it up and running and use proper criteria, uh, or uh, we go through what would be probably a very long and contentious battle over waiving any uh, liability for brokers no matter who uh, they chose to carry a load. Uh, so this would, uh, if uh, FMCSA can get it uh, together, get it done properly, this does not uh, and will not implement ultimately their uh, stupid criteria of saying if your truck was properly parked in a legal spot uh, with your triangles uh, out uh, and some idiot uh, still runs into you, uh, that uh, it would go down as a black mark on your record. Uh, what we need is a system that makes sense. There are a few bad drivers out there. We want to locate them, uh, and uh, we want to be sure that uh, they are not uh, on the road. So this, uh, by, by uh, prohibiting any further modification of the system, we're going to continue with the status quo which is uh, trial lawyers are, are reaching through for the incomplete data based on statistics uh, that are not uh, founded in truly in fault uh, and, uh, and uh, suing the brokers uh, along uh, with others in the case of accidents. Uh, so I, I think that uh, you know, we will certainly have the capability of reviewing uh, this criteria uh, and this system once it is complete, and if it still includes tallying, which I am assured it won't, uh, you know, drivers who uh, were totally not at fault with a properly parked truck, uh, then, uh, and other, other instances, uh, then I would uh, urge the committee to, uh, you know, to vitiate the program and get them to do it right. But they tell me that they are developing it. They are going to use reasonable and sensible criteria. They're trying to improve reporting by the states uh, so that they have more criteria to input into the system. And then when they finally do get the system up and running, uh, the brokers will be able to uh, choose from uh, companies which have a good rating that is meaningful and not be subject uh, to litigation. So I would strongly oppose uh, the amendment. Uh, do others wish to be heard on the amendment? Uh, hearing none, uh, are there amendments to the amendment? Hearing none, uh, we would move then to voting on the amendment. Uh, those who are going to be in favor, get ready and unmute. Those who are in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, thank you. Mute or be quiet if you're here. Uh, and uh, those who are opposed, uh, get ready. Unmute. Nay. 
Wait, yeah, wait, yeah. I call the vote. I'll call the vote. You wait, it's, we gotta get, we should have worked this out after two days. I tell you to unmute, you wait a second. I say, those opposed will signify by saying nay. All together now. Nay. 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 Thank you. Uh, in the opinion of the chair, the nays strongly have it. Mr. Chairman, ask for a recorded vote. Uh, the gentleman requests a recorded vote. Uh, recorded vote uh, is ordered. I don't have that script in front of me with all the rigmarole. I rise in opposition. The gentleman, uh, no, that's the wrong one. No, I need the rigmarole. No, it's not. It's not. Oh. Can't I just say ditto? Okay. Uh, a record vote was requested. Uh, a sufficient number of members having requested a record vote pursuant to Rule 5E, the Rules Committee on Transportation Infrastructure record vote on the amendment as ordered as mentioned at the beginning of the mark of the Committee Rule 5F on the House Rule 11, 2H4. The chair will postpone further proceedings on the amendment until a later time. Mr. Chair? Mr. Yes. Mitchell here? What's, what's um, that? Mitchell here. I, I'd like to propose a unanimous consent that we spare the chairman the rigmarole and simply acknowledge we all, by this point in time, know the rigmarole and spare you from trying to ramble through it. Uh, uh, I believe that's appropriate. Thank you, uh, Paul. I would really appreciate that. I must consult with the parliamentarian uh, on, on this to make certain that would be proper. I don't want to jeopardize any votes on any amendments uh, in the future. So just give me, let, everybody just pause for a second. Let me check. Parliamentarian says it's fine. Now, why they didn't tell me that someone could have asked for that uh, 25 or 30 amendments ago, I don't know. Thank you, Paul. Sorry you're retiring. Uh, you've uh, helped expedite in a number of ways. Uh, we'll move on to the next John, amendment. John Kiyote's happy to help you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you're helping everybody. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Gibbs uh, has another amendment. The clerk will report. Uh, it was number uh, 027, according to what they handed me. Whoops, sorry. So they handed me the wrong one. That's what he just handed me. Okay. Okay. There's a lot of paper up here. Yeah. We'll figure out what one. I mean, do you know what one we're looking for? I don't. They don't. Too many thousands piece of paper. No. No. Uh, sorry, Mr. Gibbs. We will go to the next one and then come back as soon as they figure out what that one was. Okay. No, there were, yeah, it should have been, anyway, yeah, we should have gone, we should have gone. We're just going to switch to the next Dem, we'll go to the one. Well, we just did, Mr. Gibbs, so we would go to a Democrat normally. Yeah. So I, I don't know, I don't know why months. that happened. Thank you. Uh, Is that okay? Okay. Um, okay, uh, designate Mr. Garamendi. Uh, Mr. Garamendi, one, four, zero. An amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by Mr. Garamendi, number 140. Uh, the, uh, without objection, the amendment is considered as read. Uh, the uh, uh, gentleman is recognized for three minutes uh, to speak in behalf of his amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm not sure you can hear me. If so, please say so. Uh, we uh, can hear you. You're coming across do. loud and clear early in the morning. Good, John. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if I had a really good amendment, I'd put one that would require rural broadband. My uh, system is all but down here in rural California. But this amendment deals with a, a special program uh, for highway safety, uh, and it deals with the excess funds that are not uh, allocated in the normal process. It would allow those excess funds uh, to be reallocated rather than going back into the pot and distributed by a formula. Uh, it changes the base text of your bill uh, to allow the current system to continue. Uh, for California, it's uh, money that would be used for the uh, enforcement of highway safety by the Highway Patrol and other agencies. 
And so it would basically uh, modify the existing bill and allow for the continuation uh, of the existing program. And with that, uh, I would ask for an aye vote. I thank the gentleman. Others wish to be heard on this amendment. Uh, hearing none, I'll speak to it. Uh, I would note that this is the same as Rouser 025. Uh, I would rise in opposition to the amendment. Uh, it would require a National Highway Transportation Safety Administration to transfer excess funds from priority safety programs, which are, we just had a discussion of this, drunk driving, growing threat, distracted driving, novice drivers uh, to highway programs uh, that are less prescriptive. Those are, those are three of the greatest causes we need to deal with in terms of 36,000, the 36,000 fatalities uh, on an annual basis. Uh, I think we need to look at ways to get the states, uh, individual states, to better utilize these funds. Some states are 100% fully and meaningfully utilizing them, other states aren't. Uh, rather than transferring the sons to less effective programs that are less targeted at the major cause of highway fatalities, I would strongly prefer uh, to look at ways uh, to uh, remove whatever impediments there are uh, or concerns by the states that aren't fully utilizing this funds. It's beyond me why no state uh, would not want to utilize those funds fully in terms of traffic uh, enforcement. So uh, I, I would have to uh, oppose the amendment. Do others wish to be heard on the amendment? Uh, are there amendments to the amendment? Uh, hearing none, I will proceed to a vote. Uh, the usual, those who intend to vote in favor will unmute at this point in time. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, okay, uh, the gentleman will mute. Uh, those uh, who are uh, opposed to the amendment will unmute and signify by saying no. Nay. No. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the no's strongly have it. Noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Uh, Mr. Uh, the clerk will designate Mr. Stauber. Oop. Sorry. Mr. Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. Okay. Clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of substitute to H.R. 2, offer Mr. Stauber, number MN-31. I don't know what MN is, but okay. Thank you, Chairman uh, uh, Wait, wait, wait. i got to say magic words. Uh, without uh, objection, the amendment is considered as read. Maybe we can suspend. No, we, we won't suspend those. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Member Graves. My simple amendment benefits both infrastructure projects that are under review today and in the future. This amendment provides a necessary update to the National Environmental Policy Act by disallowing injunctions filed to halt a project completely. Instead, it allows for the sponsors to remedy the issue and continue to build. According to the Council on Environmental Quality, 60% of highway projects in this country take more than six years to complete an environmental review. A major part of this issue is the continued weaponizing of the court system. Whenever we want to build a highway, develop a renewable energy project, or lay a transmission line, these projects face an array of lawsuits solely designed to stop progress. NEPA was designed to function as a checklist used by project sponsors to comply with applicable laws. However, environmental groups based in Washington, D.C., and sometimes funded by foreign sponsors, turn their checklist into a roadblock, halting projects in Minnesota, Missouri, Oregon, and elsewhere. Asking for an injunction to stop a project during development of a highway is no longer a good faith effort to hold sponsors accountable. It is now an ideological tool deployed at every turn to undermine development of shovel-ready projects. We can do things better. Should there be a NEPA violation, let's give the sponsor the opportunity to re remedy the issue before putting folks out of work at the whim of ideology. Thank you. 
I thank the gentleman. Uh, are there others who wish to be heard on the amendment? Hearing none, uh, I will speak to the amendment. Uh, I would rise in strong opposition to, to uh, the gentleman's amendment. Actually, as, as I uh, mentioned yesterday, uh, less than 3% of projects, 3% of highly, federally funded highway projects go through a, few, a full EIS process, which I believe is what the gentleman is referring to in terms of length of time. Uh, the other 97% are either categorically exempt, meaning go right ahead, uh, or go through a very simple environmental analysis, which takes very little time. Uh, a very small minority of the projects, the 3%, are major projects. And since he mentioned my state, uh, I'll mention uh, a, a very contentious project uh, in the uh, Portland area, not my district, Mr. Blumenauer's district, uh, in the Portland Rose Quarter, uh, which had not gone through a, a full process. And uh, there was a massive outpouring of opposition by all of the, or many of the affected citizens and businesses in the area of this very large, very expensive project. Uh, and had not the state chosen, uh, and they did finally under pressure, the State uh, Transportation Commission uh, withdrew their approval uh, the opponents would have had no recourse uh, to prevent, uh, you know, essentially irreconcilable harm, which is uh, the beginning of the project, tearing things down, uh, excavating, uh, and, uh, you know, by getting injunctive relief. It's infrequently used. It is used in some percentage of the 3%. Uh, so even if it is 60% of the 3%, that's 1.8% of the federally funded highway projects. Uh, so, uh, and again, many of these are controversial. There's been an issue pending in California for 25 years to build a new highway uh, to the ocean, which has faced massive uh, opposition uh, uh, from uh, both sides of the aisle through very, actually, Orange County. And, uh, conservative area, uh, and uh, injunctive relief has been sought, much litigation has gone on, I doubt the thing will ever go forward, and um, you know, those are the kinds of things that people point to. Well, they are delayed for a purpose. Uh, no one wants them except, uh, you know, the uh, pointy head engineers uh, somewhere in CalDOT or whatever, whoever a private entity, if it's a P3, wants to push the project forward. So I would strongly uh, oppose uh, the gentleman's amendment. Uh, do others wish to speak on the amendment? Uh, hearing none, uh, then I would ask if there are amendments to the amendment. Hearing none, uh, we will then proceed to a vote. I'll just remind everybody, if you're gonna vote aye, get ready, unmute. Those in favor of the project will sign, of the, sorry, the amendment will signify by saying aye. 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 Mute, please. Those opposed uh, to the project, please unmute. <laughs> please signify by saying no before you answer the phone. No. 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 Uh, in the no. Opinion of the chair. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll request a recorded vote. A recorded vote is requested. We dispense with the reading, and the recorded vote will be uh, in the queue for a later time. Uh, please, clerk will designate Mr. Cohen. I believe he has an amendment at the desk. Number eight, zero, eight, nine. zero eight nine. Cohen. An amendment to the amendment yeah, in the here. nature of a substitute to HR two offered by Mr. Cohen. Number zero eight nine. Uh, without objection, the amendments considered as read. A gentleman's recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a very, very important issue to me and people in my district. And I think to everybody. 
uh, it's the, the Underrides Act. And, and we've got part of it is in the bill, and I thank the chairman for getting parts of it in the bill in the Invest in America Act. This amendment would build on those provisions that are already included by directing NHTSA to conduct a pilot program to be able to effectively assess the feasibility of requiring side guards on tractor trailers. We have rear guards on tractor trailers to save people's lives. We don't have them on the sides of vehicles, and a lot of vehicles and accidents slide under tractor trailers and, and, and then die. Uh, according to the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, in 2015, which is the last uh, time that we have figures available, 301 of the 1,542 passenger vehicle occupants killed in two vehicle crashes with a tractor trailer died when their vehicle struck the side of a tractor trailer. In comparison, 292 people died when their passenger vehicle struck the rear of a tractor trailer. So it's about equal in the number of people that die from going under the rear or on the side. But the same problem exists in that you go under and you get serious head injuries or, or and, and die. Uh, side guards are not required. Uh, rear guards are. Because of gaps in federal crash data, data, the researchers can't determine exactly how many of these crashes involve underrides, but they estimate that underride occurs in about half of the fatal crashes between large trucks and passenger vehicles. In 2017, a study was conducted, a successful crash test on guards intended to prevent a passenger motor vehicle from traveling under the side of a, tr of a trailer. As such, it is an opportune time for the Department of Transportation to institute a pilot program for side underride guards on trailers to evaluate the effectiveness of this life-saving safety equipment on a wider scale. The pilot program would provide critical operational data to assist the Department of Transportation in developing a federal safety standard. It's my hope that a pilot program can produce the necessary information for us to take action and prevent these deadly truck crashes. I'd like to thank Senator Gillibrand, uh, my Senate sponsor, and my distinguished and esteemed and revered uh, House sponsor, Mr. Desaulnier, uh, for co-sponsoring this bill with me, the Stop Underrides Act. I also thank several other committee members who've also co-sponsored this bill. And I'd urge my colleagues to support the amendment, and with that, I yield back my time. Uh, other members wish to be heard on the amendment? Hearing none, uh, I will address the amendment. Uh, uh, I reluctantly rise in opposition. I have met uh, with families uh, who lost loved ones uh, in underride accidents, and, and I understand uh, their advocacy and their concern. I've also met with uh, numerous families who have lost loved ones in uh, underride accidents uh, due to insufficient rear uh, underride protections. The bill mandates uh, strong new uh, underride protections uh, for the rear crashes, which are more frequent according to the statistics I've seen. And uh, the, uh, the bill has a requirement of the secretary to study the feasibility, benefits, and costs of side underride guards on commercial motor vehicles with a, uh, uh, with a pilot program. Uh, while I support the gentleman's intent behind the amendment, uh, I think the study in this bill was thoughtfully crafted uh, to ensure uh, its success uh, as we deal with design and feasibility issues on different uh, types of, uh, of vehicles. Uh, so I would have to uh, oppose the amendment. Uh, do others wish to be heard on the amendment? Uh, hearing none, are there amendments to the amendment? Hearing none, uh, we will proceed to a vote on the amendment. Those who intend to vote in favor, please unmute. Those who are in favor of the amendment, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. I didn't see an aye. Yeah, I, th I think that was twice, Steve. We heard you. <laughs> You can't talk by uh, And uh, uh, the, please mute. Uh, those who intend to vote in opposition to the amendment, please unmute. Signify by saying no. nay. 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 No. In no. Opinion, Sorry. In the opinion of the chair, the nays strongly have it. You, you could have popped up and nobody The nays it. have it. And the amendment is not agreed to. Okay, uh, uh, the chair is uh, going to engage in discussions and Mr. Lynch is uh, going to replace him for a few moments.
I will now call up the following amendments uh, that the majority and the minority have agreed to to move on and block. Harbor Hall, 74, Finkenauer, 82, Finkenauer, 83, Finkenauer, 84, Mr. Brown, 218, Mr. Graves of Louisiana, 02, Mr. Gallagher, 115, Gallagher, 116, Alderson, 021, Crawford, 052, Crawford, 056, Crawford, 06, Davis, 112, Gonzalez Colon, 134, Gonzalez Colon, 132, Alderson, 25, Graves of Louisiana, 121, Gibbs, 031, and Gonzalez Colon, 149. The clerk will now designate those amendments within the on block. An on block amendment offered Mr. Lynch. To the amendment in nature substitute to HR2, consisting of the following Carver Hall 74, Finkenauer 82, Finkenauer 83, Finkenauer 84, Brown 218, Graves, Louisiana 02, Gallagher 115, Gallagher 116, Balderson 021, Crawford 052, Crawford 056, Crawford 06, Davis 112. Gonzalez Colon of Puerto Rico, 134. Gonzalez Colon of Puerto Rico, 132. Balderson, 25. Graves of Louisiana, 121. Gibbs, 031. Gonzalez Colon of Puerto Rico, 149. Without objection, the amendments will be considered as read and uh, recognize. All right, I recognize myself uh, for one minute. This package of amendments includes 14 amendments filed by the Republican members and five amendments filed by Democratic members of the committee. The topics span many areas in the bill, in the bill uh, from highways, trucking, safety, rail, and research. We are packaging these amendments, which have been cleared for inclusion by both sides of the aisle to help expedite today's proceedings. Again, these amendments include Balderson 021, Balderson 025, Brown 218, Cabo Hall 74, Crawford 06, Crawford 52, Crawford 56, Davis 112, Finkenauer 82, Finkenauer 83, Finkenauer 84, Gallagher 115, Gallagher 116, Gibbs 31, Gonzalez Colon 134, Gonzalez Colon 132, Gonzalez Colon 149, Grays of Louisiana, 121. Grays of Louisiana, PL02. And do any other members wish to recognize, to be recognized to speak on this uh, amendment on block? Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman, Gonzalez Colón for Puerto Rico. Gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to offer my amendment Gonzalez Colon 132, 134, 149 uh, in block package. Uh, the reason for, for these, everybody knows about the hurricanes and the earthquakes in Puerto Rico in the last few years. So this uh, amendment uh, will do Section 1202 to include funding for pre-disaster training programs as well as program development that are necessary to help agencies and regional stakeholders plan and prepare for multimodal recovery efforts. Intimately, immediately post Hurricane Irma and Maria, the island, the island transport and communications infrastructure were in ruins. No commercial trucks could use any of the main roads due to debris and the state of roads themselves. Uh, supplies made it to the island, uh, but were stranded in the port of San Juan, unable to reach those in need until, of course, the access to the roads, uh, roads were restored. This amendment will seek to create a region-wide telework program 
to provide flexibility for those who are able to continue to work from whatever they are. I'm also happy to see the Amendment 134, which encouraged the Secretary of Transportation to procure additional data as necessary from the University Transportation Centers, or UTCs, such as the University of Puerto Rico, Mayagüez Campus, private sector providers necessary to develop the, the transportation demand data and modeling study. The study will help better understand the shifting patterns of transportation demands while formulating data to construct forecasts which will help travelers to make informed choices and reduce traffic congestion. The University of Puerto Rico in Mayagüez campus, part of the National Institute for Congestion Reduction, contributes to the sole research policy center of reducing congestion. By allowing, by allowing this uh, amendment, the Secretary of Transportation will, can buy uh, research and data from all UTCs and will continue to work on critical issues and solve national problems. Lastly, my amendment, amendment, amendment included in the block uh, 149 encouraged the secretary to include projects uh, in multimodal transportation system management and operation elements that better integrate the ability for users to plan, determine, and pay for multimodal trips in the prioritization process in, uh, for the Community Climate Innovation Grants. Uh, this system and operations projects are uh, are specifically designed to help agencies manage uh, transportation networks, provide information to commuters, and address incidents quickly. Uh, this will help transportation system react and respond to incidents and events faster and more efficiently than ever before. Uh, this will be critical for towns and regions planning for major events such as concerts, among many others. So I thank again the chairman for including my amendments in the M-Block package, I, and I encourage all uh, my colleagues to vote for it. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Graves of Missouri for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm glad that we could find some amendments uh, to package together and move forward, and I appreciate uh, very much the majority working with us on this, and I'd urge all members to, uh, uh, to support and yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Well, thank minutes. you. I, I don't think I'll be as brief as uh, Ranking Member Graves, but thank you, Ranking Member Graves. Uh, I, I do want to thank the chair and the ranking member and, and our staff on both sides for putting this on block together. And in this on block, it, it, includes, uh, it includes a provision that we put forth that deals with campaign finance uh, in HR 2. The Secretary of Transportation has the authority to issue civil penalties against rail companies that block a crossing for more than 10 minutes. The amendment that's included in this en bloc simply states there may not be an assessment on that civil penalty to require an individual finance a campaign in a congressional election. I bring this up as I brought it up in an earlier markup because when HR 1 was passed on a partisan roll call in this House, there was a provision that make sure that any fine collected by the federal government could go to all of our own congressional campaigns. I don't think anybody in this room, anybody online, or anybody watching would support or should support a proposal like that. So we want to make sure that every time that we vote to increase a civil penalty in this, com in this committee room, that it could never go to any of our campaigns. It's a great amendment. I really appreciate everyone working together to put it in the en bloc. And with that, Mr. Chair, thank you again, and I yield back. The gentleman yields. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Iowa, Ms. Finkenauer, for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm so happy to see my amendments 82, 83, and 84 included in this en bloc. Uh, it's a great bipartisan group of folks and uh, happy to see that happen. Um, I also want to say, you know, my three amendments that this includes uh, center all around a crucial theme for Iowa and for my district. And that's making sure that rural America has a seat at the table and is aware of the funds that we are making available within this bill and this transit bill today. Um, one of the bills or one of the amendments actually is called Rural Safe Roads or Rural Safe Routes to School. Um, and that's Amendment 82. Uh, so I grew up in Sherrill, Iowa, which is a small town in rural Dubuque County. 
and I'm very familiar with our uh, school districts all across the district. Some are in bigger cities like the Dubuque School District, which encompasses the city areas, but also rural areas. And then others are mostly encompassing uh, rural school districts. So um, what this does is making sure that rural school districts receive outreach and are aware of the funds that develop safe walking and biking routes near our schools improving safety and access for students in rural areas as it in also making it easier for students to participate in after school events and extra extracurricular activities which um, as we move through this pandemic and uh, uh, hopefully come out of it when we get this vaccine um, we can have those events happening and uh, get back to some sort of normalcy uh, and we want to make sure that our kids can get to school safely to be able to do that. Um, the other amendment I have is stormwater best management practices. This is 83. Um, so farmers are actually some of the best stewards of our land. I know we've got hardworking family farmers within my district who've been on their land for generations. And when I go out and visit farms in Iowa, I see firsthand the innovative approaches they're taking to conservation and how they are partnering with community leaders and industry to protect water quality. So that's why when we talk about ways to reduce runoff and manage stormwater, agriculture needs to be part of that conversation. Uh, bringing in the Department of Agriculture to work with the Army Corps and the Department of Transportation to help review our policies on stormwater management, it just makes sense. Um, and then also, I heard Mr. Garamendi mention this, that he wished he had an amendment on broadband. Well, this would be one of them, uh, the rural input on broadband deployment regulations. So when it comes to broadband deployment, the challenges facing our rural communities are especially complicated. Uh, two weeks ago, I actually held a, a virtual hearing here in the district um, talking about distance learning and how kids relied on online classes, obviously during this pandemic, um, even more so. And as part of our uh, conversation, we talked about the new federal investment in broadband deployment. One of our guests, who is a rural internet service provider, spoke up and said, you know, she is, is wanting to highlight some of the challenges that they're facing. Um, it's extremely challenging in places like Iowa. Um, and also, our construction season can be much shorter than in other places in the country. And some of our communities are ex extremely remote and surrounded by farmland. So uh, I tell this story because it underscores why we need to make sure that our rural communities and internet service providers have, who serve in those communities have a seat at the table when it comes to developing the new dig once regulations. Um, I know there's so much more work to do. I am really excited about the work we have done. And, uh, and with that, I urge my colleagues to support this amendment, support rural areas as well as our cities. And um, with that, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Graves, for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this uh, unblock amendment includes uh, two of our amendments. The first one has to do with evacuation routes. Uh, last Congress, the Disaster Recovery Reform Act included Section 1209 that required that the administrator of the Federal Emergency Management Agency and uh, the Federal Highway Administration get together to develop updated standards for evacuation routes. Mr. Chairman, this was a result of a 2016 flood that we had a 1,000 year flood event where the interstate barrier that, that um, uh, between the east and west lanes actually held back uh, six feet of water, exacerbating flooding. So the interstate barrier actually caused flooding and induced flooding on the northern side of the interstate. Um, and it, those, those walls should have had drain or weep holes in it. It didn't. Um, so we, we, we had, I believe it was 1,200 people, including one of my coworkers, stuck on the interstate. The, the interstate actually became a liability where we had to redirect things like helicopters, water, food, and other supplies. Some people stuck there for days because they couldn't get off of the overpasses because everything was flooded as a result of these walls. So we asked FEMA in the Disaster Recovery Reform Act to come up with better standards. They've failed in their standards, so this simply has Federal Highway Administration take the lead on this, update the guidance to where our evacuation routes can actually serve their primary purpose of evacuation. Second Amendment here, um, what it does is it, uh, it's an ITS-related amendment. Mr. Chairman, I noted yesterday that 
if we can go right here with our phones and we can say, all right, I'm leaving here and I want to go to this spot, that data can all be aggregated and shared with an intelligent transportation system that our states and municipalities run, of course, in an anonymous manner. But what it can do 20 minutes before you get there is it can begin developing traffic models to let your, your, your traffic light system know where cars are going to be, when they're going to be there, and can begin adjusting to where we can maximize the efficiency of our surface transportation system. Mr. Chairman, I said it yesterday. The fact that it is 2020 and we still drive up to traffic lights with no one around and sit there and wait for 90 seconds or longer for these things to turn green is unbelievable. This is an opportunity to change that using existing real-time anonymous data and helping us to advance technology. It's something that should have been done years ago and um, I appreciate the inclusion of these amendments in, uh, in, the, in the unblock. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Brown, for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Federal Lands Transportation Program provides critical funding to our nation's land management agencies to improve and maintain their critical transportation infrastructure. It's an important program, and I'm pleased to see the authorized level for this program significantly increase in this bill. The primary recipient of the funds allocated under this program is the National Park Service that oversees some of our country's most heavily used parkways. The Baltimore Washington Parkway, also known as the BW Parkway, runs through my district and can experience as many as 120,000 vehicles per day. Many of us who commute in and around the National Capital Region are familiar with its traffic challenges and the safety issues that arise from a lack of maintenance. My amendment, including in this on block amendment, is simple. It requires the GAO to study how the National Park Service prioritizes its most frequently used roads, what's working, and what we can do better. The underlying bill already establishes that a high commuter corridor is one that experiences, on average, 20,000 commuters per day. According to the National Park Service, there are several parkways within their jurisdiction that meet this threshold, and we ought to have a better understanding of how we are allocating federal resources to meet the demand. My amendment does not take a position on how these resources should be allocated. It simply directs the GAO to look at how these resources are typically prioritized, as well as the challenges facing the National Park Service. Congress must have more clarity on how the Park Service prioritizes maintenance of federal lands transportation facilities. We must ensure that the Park Service properly addresses the maintenance backlog and prioritizes federal land transportation facilities that are in need of repair. I thank my colleagues for supporting this bipartisan amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Balderson, for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I would also like to thank uh, Chairman DeFazio and, and other members uh, to allow me to speak on this uh, amendment and to include it in the end block. So thank you very much uh, for both these amendments. I was happy to see that the Invest Act in America includes a comprehensive study on safe interactions between automated vehicles and road users. This study will ensure the increasing deployment of automated vehicles does not jeopardize the safety of existing road users. I believe it's crucial that we understand and examine the ability of AVs to interact safely with road users and identify barriers to improve the safety of everyone on the road. While this study includes motorcycles in its definition of general roadway users, the bill specifically recognizes that bicyclists and pedestrians have unique characteristics that need to be accounted for in the study. You don't need to be a rider like myself to understand motorcycles have their own unique challenges and characteristics that aren't always accounted for by cars and trucks, similar to the special circumstances that we need to study for bikes and pedestrians. Concerns regarding the deployment of autonomous vehicles is not new to the motorcycle community. Back in 2018, Michael Sayre, Director of Government Relations for the American Motorcycle Association, told publication Ride Apart, the AMA wants the technology to be developed with us and with motorcyclists in mind, rather than deploying the technology and then trying to work motorcyclists into the picture. A 
According to a position paper from the European Association of Motorcycle Manufacturers, ACEM, among vulnerable road users, which includes pedestrians and bicyclists, motorcyclists are the only road users who share all kinds of road and traffic environment conditions, including full velocity range with cars. This creates a major safety challenge. Following the Federal Highway Administration's 2016 motorcycle crash study, the NTSB identified the vehicle crash based warning and prevention systems on vehicles, passenger vehicles, and connected technologies all have the potential to prevent crashes involving motorcycles. However, these systems are not always being designed to, to detect or fully integrate, integrate motorcycles. Additionally, there are countless examples in the United States of AVs and cars on autopilot failing to detect motorcycles in normal riding situations resulting in accidents. My amendment would simply ensure that motorcyclists receive the same priority considerations as pedestrians and bicyclists to ensure the study accounts for the close proximity of motorcyclists to other vehicles. Additionally, the bill creates a working group to assist in the development of the DOT study and recommendations. The working group includes representatives from all 15 organizations and industries, but does not include any motorcyclist or motorcyclist organizations. My amendment would ensure that a motorcyclist rights group is a representative of the working group. With, a, with over 8.6 million motorcyclists on the road in the United States, they need a seat at the table to ensure their concerns are voiced regarding the deployment of this new technology. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Allred, for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to yield back my time, uh, but I, I will uh, jump in later if, if need be. We appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Allred. The gentleman yields. The chair right now recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Gallagher, for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank my Democratic colleagues for accepting two of my amendments to the on block. My amendment number 116 would reauthorize the Motorcyclist Advisory Council at DOT. The council has not finished its work, and my amendment would reauthorize it for six more years so that the 9 million registered motorcyclists in this country would continue to have a seat at the table with regulators, which is absolutely essential. The on block also includes my amendment number 115 which establishes an advisory board at the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration focused on issues of discrimination and harassment of women in trucking. A constituent group in my district brought to my attention that women can sometimes face unique challenges in trucking, like needing to pass an overnight training evaluation with a male instructor. And my amendment would give these women a voice at the highest levels. And I think we all have an interest in ensuring we can get more interested in uh, more women in the trucking industry. And so I urge my colleagues to support the unblock and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. At this time, do any other members wish to be recognized to speak on the unblock amendment? Hearing none, the chair uh, determines that the question is now on the amendment. All those in favor of signify by saying aye, please unmute and say aye. 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 All aye. aye. Okay, please mute. All those opposed, please signify, signify by saying nay. In the, in the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. And the, the on block is adopted. Clerk will designate uh, Mr. Stauber, amendment at the desk. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of substitute to HR 2, offer Mr. Stauber, number 043. Uh, uh, I ask you to extend the amendment being considered as read. Mr. Stauber is recognized for three minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman DeFazio and Ranking Member Graves. For the provision in this bill to become a reality, we need a cobalt supply chain. According to the nonpartisan International Energy Agency, electric car cars and electric vehicle charging stations require precious metals. Cobalt, for example, amplifies charging batteries in electric vehicles, while copper is a powerful conductor of electricity. The world's leading exporter of cobalt is the Democratic Republic of Congo. 
Let me read the findings in my amendment that I ask you to listen to while looking at these two young children in the picture I have on the easel. UNICEF and Amnesty International estimates that 40,000 boys and girls work in mines across the Congo for up to 12 hours a day and earn no more than $2 a day. The boys and girls working in mines in the Congo do not attend school. They are beaten by security guards and they are exposed to high levels of cobalt but are not issued protective equipment. <clears throat> Supporters of the Green New Deal and its provisions contained in the underlying bill continually turn a blind eye towards these horrific practices overseas because it hurts their arguments against responsible mining. Instead, we can mine cobalt and other minerals here like we have mined iron ore for a century and a half. There are massive, untapped cobalt reserves in my district in northern Minnesota. The, joy, the choice here is clear in my mind. Instead of sourcing minerals from foreign child mines, we should have a union-protected workforce negotiate a collective bargaining agreement so we can ethically fulfill our need for cobalt and other metals. My amendment, HR2, would require copper, nickel, cobalt, platinum group elements, rare earth elements, and other minerals needed for renewable energy technology, national security, and everyday life be sourced from within the United States. If this committee is serious about putting electric vehicles on the road, I suggest we do, we do so by supporting ethical labor practices. I ask you to vote in favor of my amendment, and I yield back. Uh, do others wish to speak to the amendment? Hearing none, I'll speak to the amendment. Uh, I certainly, as I'm sure every other member of this committee on a bipartisan basis, uh, opposes uh, child uh, labor and child mining. Uh, and, uh, you know, we should do everything and anything we can to prevent that. Uh, however, uh, you know, the many of the minerals uh, that the gentleman refers to uh, are needed in complex batteries, your iPhone, your iPad, your vehicle, and others. And at this point, there is not uh, an adequate supply. With the unbelievably stringent uh, Buy America provisions we are adopting in this bill, uh, you know, transit uh, companies uh, acquiring electric vehicles will lead the way to all American products. Uh, and that will encourage uh, the uh, production of these rare earth materials where they are available uh, in the United States. Uh, there are laws against the importation of materials uh, produced by child labor not under the jurisdiction of this committee. Uh, the uh, if the uh, you know if the production is, of these uh, materials can take place on private state uh, or uh, other lands, uh, that's one thing. If uh, if the gentleman is attempting to encourage them uh, on public lands, uh, that would be the jurisdiction of the Natural Resources uh, Committee. I served on that committee for many years, and uh, at that point in time, we found uh, very uh, few available resources. We discussed this, uh, um, you know, uh, the nature of the availability of these rare earth minerals on public lands. Um, and of course, uh, we do have the problem of the 1872 uh, Mining Act, uh, which uh, does not, um, you know, provide any return to the federal taxpayer for minerals extracted from federal land. Zero, nada, zilch, unlike states, tribes, and private entities who extract a royalty. Uh, we've been, um, I believe, uh, that resources has moved or will move a bill this year on royalties. I moved a bill twice that passed in the House, uh, never got past the Senate because of Harry Reid blocking it, because of foreign companies mining gold in Nevada. Uh, but, uh, you know, who knows, uh, perhaps someday we will close that loophole and get a fair rate of return and we'll revise other aspects of the 1872 Mining Act. So I'm certainly happy to, to work uh, with the gentleman, but uh, in this case, uh, at this point in time, it would prohibit 
the further production of electric vehicles uh, in the United States of America. So I would uh, oppose the amendment. Are there others who wish to speak to the amendment? Uh, hearing none, uh, are there amendments to the amendment? Hearing none, uh, we will uh, move uh, to vote. Of those who intend to vote aye, please unmute now. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you, please mute. Uh, those who intend to vote nay, please unmute. Those uh, who are not in favor, signify by saying nay. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the nays have it. Mr. Chair, ask for a recorded vote. Recorded votes requested, it will be postponed. Clerk will designate amendment by uh, Ms. Fletcher. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of substitute to HR2, offered by Ms. Fletcher, for 030. Uh, amendment's considered as read without objection. Uh, the gentlelady is recognized for up to three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm offering this amendment to HR2 so that the high occupancy toll or hot lane miles will once again be counted rightly under the FTA formulas. Uh, prior to January 2015, FTA's State of Good Repair program provided funds for an urbanized area's hot lanes for motor bus operations based on an apportionment calculated from vehicle revenue miles and directional route miles. Without specific direction from Congress, FTA adopted a policy that now excludes hot lane miles from this competition. Initially, FTA grandfathered lanes that had been recently converted from high occupancy vehicle or HOV lanes to hot lanes, but that eligibility for hot lanes was ceased under a policy statement from FTA. Under a 2015 circular, FTA ended this grandfathered consideration for hot lanes ceasing all funding from section 5337 for these services. The FDA has maintained that it was unable to continue to allow prior services to be grandfathered under provisions of authorizing language in MAP 21, in addition to the inclusion of any new services. It stated that any further modifications would have to be the direct result of congressional direction. So I would like for the Congress to give them that congressional direction. Um, their position really contradicts what Congress intended when it specifically provided that high intensity motor bus operations would be eligible for federal funding if public transit provided it on a facility with access for other high occupancy vehicles. These hot lanes are used across the country in my home in Houston, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Seattle, Northern Virginia, Dallas, and many more places. And my amendment would eliminate any exclusion of eligibility for a transit operator who provides uh, hot lanes for high intensity motor bus operations. The restored eligibility for funding will result in more than $15 million in funding for Houston Metro um, annually. So that's an example of the kind of impact this, this provision can have. And for growing areas like Houston that lack large rail infrastructure for public transit, hot lanes have been found to be both the most economic and effective platform for delivering much needed capacity for public transit. So I urge my colleagues to support this amendment and I yield back. Uh, are there others who wish to be heard on the amendment? Uh, if not, I'll speak to the amendment. Uh, as I've mentioned uh, to members on both sides of the aisle previously uh, during this markup, no matter uh, you know what uh, the merits of their particular proposals, uh, any changes at this point uh, in funding formula levels uh, would require uh, rewriting the legislation that would not meet the timeline set by the leadership to bring this bill to the floor, so I must oppose the amendment. Others wish to be heard on the amendment? Mr. Uh, Chair, could I, could I address that briefly? Um, I think that, um, could I address that? Uh, the gentlelady, I will recognize her to address that, yes on my time. Thank you. I would just um, point out briefly that the FDA has dragged their feet when it comes to providing, providing the information that we have asked for about how this amendment would affect regional funding and how it would affect um, 
formula formulas. It's not only my office, but several others um, have requested this information early on. And I believe that every member should have a clear picture of what these changes would look like for their local MTAs. So I, I will not ask for a vote or a recorded vote at this time. If we can um, try to continue working for, with the committee um, and with our offices to get the data from the FTA so that Congress can consider this question at a later date on the floor as HR2 advances. But it is it is my view that Congress and not the FTA should ultimately decide this policy. So um, with that in mind, if that's something we could agree to work on, um, I will withdraw my amendment. Uh, I thank General Lee for withdrawing. I'm sure we will work with her if FTA can possibly uh, produce that uh, within the very short time period uh, that we would have. However, uh, generally all of our runs from FTA take a couple of weeks and, uh, you know, we don't have a couple of weeks, but uh, we'll, we'll see if perhaps they can speed up their process. And I do agree that the authority ultimately should reside with Congress and not uh, the bureaucrats. Uh, I thank the gentlelady. Without objection, the amendment is withdrawn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the uh, clerk will designate Mr. Stauber. An amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2, offering Mr. Stauber, number 045. Uh, the uh, amendment uh, without objection is read. Mr. Stauber is recognized three minutes. Thank you, Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Member Graves. Uh, you know, I don't think I'm the only one who considers five to ten years to permit and build a road a mind-boggling failure of this country's transportation approval and construction process. We have 20 to 30 million Americans unemployed right now, and many in Minnesota. People have lost their jobs, their ability to put food on the table, and yet there are projects that sit idle while years of permitting process are still going on. Enbridge Line 3 in my district has been going through the approval process since 2014. This means that thousands of jobs that could be filled by hardworking Americans who are unemployed are not available. It is time to take a serious look at how we do business in this country and reform our permitting process so that we can rebuild our infrastructure while getting pe <coughs> excuse me, people back to work. The 404 permitting process that my amendment addresses is just one example. My amendment will preserve high environmental standards while removing duplicative requirements. My amendment simply would allow a permit seeker to only seek the state 404 permit and not the Army Corps 404 permit only, and I repeat, only if the state's standards are equal or higher than the Army Corps uh, environmental standards. This amendment is a win-win for industry, our environment, and getting people back to work. I urge support of my amendment, and I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, as wish to be heard on the amendment. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Graves. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I want to thank Mr. Stauber for bringing this amendment up. I think he's identified an important efficiency. And Mr. Chairman, I want to also compare this to what the committee adopted yesterday in the Garamendi Amendment number 128 that, that largely allowed for states to develop or to uh, have a, a comparable environmental review process affirmed by the federal government. Uh, to be clear, this, this amendment does not jeopardize the environment. In fact, this is going to result in saving money by allowing for a more efficient project process. This is nearly identical to what the committee adopted yesterday in Garamendi 128. Um, and, uh, and, and I would strongly urge the, the chair and members to, to work with Mr. Stauber to, um, uh, to see if we can work this out. If we can save money in the projects, then we can then we can do more projects. And, and so it's saving time and saving money. Yeah, well, someone might have. Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes, Mr. Uh, Farmer. I ask to be uh, recognized on this amendment. Uh, absolutely, uh, three minutes, sir. Thank you. You know, I, I understand that uh, the, the approval process can be delayed, but I'll give you a good example. So in the West Roxbury neighborhood of Boston that I represent, uh, Enbridge came in and uh, they're, they're putting in a, well, they've put in a, a high pressure gas line uh, that runs through a blasting zone. We, so we have a quarry there that's actively blasting. And despite all of the safeguards that you would think would be in place, uh, 
they were able to put in uh, a high pressure gas line right next to some homes, a school. And, and so we've been in and out of court. We tried everything we could to, to push back and, and ask them to relocate it to, to a main thoroughfare so it would be in the middle of the road. That's all we're asking, just move it. We're not, we realize that we, we do need natural gas uh, to heat our homes, but, and it's the Northeast, so we recognize that, but we could not even get them to move the location. Uh, and now I've got another situation down in, in Weymouth that I'm gonna talk about in a minute, but you know, you're asking to, to, to uh, reduce the leverage that I might have had to get them to lo relocate that pipeline, and I'm just very nervous about that, and I, I oppose the amendment. Uh, you know, I did have an amendment that would, would allow a state official, similar thoughts that you have. I had an amendment that was gonna empower the, the highest ranking public safety officer in the state to intervene if, if they thought that the pipeline was unsafe. I thought it might be a good way to address the situation that I had, but the, you know, the natural gas folks uh, opposed that <clears throat> vociferously uh, when I had proposed that when Mr. Schu uh, Schuster was the, was the chair. So uh, based on my own experience and, and trying to defend my, my uh, constituents in the face of a, a very unwise decision, I would be forced to oppose this amendment and uh, I would urge my colleagues to do the same. Thank you, I yield back. Other gentlemen, sorry, I saw Mr. Palmer with his hand up, Steve, and I didn't, and I, Mr. Palmer is recognized. I'll always uh, defer to, to Mr. Lynch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanna point out that uh, the, there is a, a delay cost that takes money out of what uh, we appropriate for construction. And to give you an example of this in Texas, there were three projects. Uh, uh, this is a Texas Department of Transportation report. One they called small project, medium project, and a large project. The small project was uh, a rural, in a rural setting. It was delayed for 33 months. That added an additional three and a half million dollars to the cost of the project. That was about $96,000 for every month of delay. The medium project uh, was uh, 49, uh, uh, it was a $49.6 million project. It was an urban freeway project. Uh, had a 58-month delay. It added $17.8 million to a project that was less than 50 million. That's almost 300,000 for every month. And then the large project was on uh, to put a, an interchange on I-10 uh, just outside of San Antonio. It was delayed 11 months, but the pr delay cost was $5.1 million. $147,000 a month. So when we have these delays, we're spending uh, surface transportation money. So I, I just think that this is something that we should strongly consider. And uh, will the gentleman yield? Back. Will the gentleman yield? I'll yield to the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to make note, um, look, I don't, I don't want to drag this out any longer, but, but my, my friend, uh, Mr. Lynch, brought up the issue of, of ensuring that you have a federal uh, agency there. No, number one, Look, this would actually presumably give more control to your state government, which I'd like to think that you have a closer worker relationship with. Number two, let's put something in that says that this doesn't, this doesn't eliminate the federal government's ultimate control over the process. We're, we're doing the same thing twice. I've heard the chairman say uh, yesterday, and I think maybe even again today, that 97% of projects don't even go through these NEPA type reviews. This is specifically a 404 Clean Water Act wetlands permit. Many of our states already have processes because we respect our environment as well. So, so under the amendment, if the, if the state has a comparable process, then, then all it's saying is don't go through the hoop, don't go through the same, the same process twice and pay for it twice. But if you're concerned about the feds having that ultimate veto authority, fine, let's keep that in there. I, I don't have any problem with that. No one wants to short circuit the environment or, or cause the problems that you, you relayed. And, and so let, let's try and find a solution here. I think this is a waste of money and time, and I think Mr. Schauber's amendment makes, makes a lot of sense. Thank the gentleman. Others wish to be recognized. Uh, if not, I recognize myself. There is a process by which a state can take control of the 404 process. 
However, at this point in time, only two states in the United States of America have chosen to exercise that authority and go through the process. And those are the states of New Jersey and Michigan. So in those states, uh, this is done at the state level uh, with a process that has been reviewed and approved by EPA. Uh, there'll just be general oversight exerted. For the other 48 states, uh, they have chosen not to go through this process. Uh, and the law, the, what the gentleman proposed says that if the, if the uh, state has uh, an a, a equivalent or higher standard, well, guess what? Trump just gutted the Clean Water Act. I mean, you might all miss that. Uh, we did have testimony in the Water Resources Committee by the Assistant Secretary uh, on this issue about 14 months ago. They're proposing a new rule to gut the Clean Water Act. And when I asked him how many stream miles will be impacted by this rule, he said, I don't have that data. I said, how many uh, acres of wetland will be impacted by this new rule? He said, well, I don't have that data. Well, actually, there was data uh, that was, uh, uh, you know, uh, accumulated uh, through research by the previous administration, which he chose not to refer to or look at. And uh, particularly in the Western United States, 70 percent of uh, stream miles, tributary stream miles, will lose protections. And a number of states have laws that say that they can't regulate beyond the federal regulation. So when all federal regulation is removed from those 70 percent of stream miles, game on. Back to the good old days. Dump your crap out the back door of the factory into the stream, and if people want to drink it downstream, hey, clean it up. That's your problem. 70 percent. He didn't have that number. And then uh, on wetlands, critical for wildlife, absolutely critical for migratory wildlife, pretty important to the, you know, to uh, a, a number of uh, both environmental groups and hunting groups in the United States of America, migratory birds. Of course, they're trying to kill off the Migratory Bird Treaty too, but they haven't quite succeeded there yet. Um, they, uh, they are also uh, vitiated of the rules regarding filling of critical wetlands. And the estimates are more than 50 percent of the wetlands in America will have zero, no protections. So the state's higher standard in many cases will be nothing, or the equivalent standard will be nothing, because the federal standard will be nothing. So we would hand over to the 48 states that haven't gone through the EPA process to do their own work on 404, the authority to approve anything and everything on 70 percent of the stream miles and more than 50 percent of the wetlands in the United States of America. I find that unbelievably unacceptable, and uh, therefore I strongly oppose the amendment. Are there others who wish to be heard on the amendment? Hearing none. Are those who wish to amend the amendment? Hearing none, proceed to a vote on the amendment following the usual process. Those who intend to vote in favor of this amendment will unmute. They will signify by saying aye. Say aye. 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 Thank you. Please mute. Those who intend to vote in opposition, please unmute. Those in opposition, signify by saying nay. Nay. Hey. I wish we could do things in unison. Uh, the, uh, in the opinion, Chair, the noes have it. Mr. Chair, I uh, request a recorded vote. Reeves, recorded votes request will be postponed until a future time. Uh, the uh, uh, clerk will report, uh, Mr. Cohen. An amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2, offered by Mr. Cohen, number 093. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is my school bus uh, bill, and what we're trying to do here is, is get seat belts. We've got in the bill automatic braking system, and that's well and good. Children have been, are 
passengers and school buses. We entrust them to the school bus drivers, some of which are better than others. But seatbelts, I think, would save a lot of lives. And we've been trying to get this passed for quite a few years. We've had accidents in, in Tennessee and other places around the country where we've seen uh, the lack of, of, of seatbelts uh, be res partly responsible for the death of children. Uh, we've got a study in the bill, uh, but we need to move it a, a step further to make sure this finally happens. This has been years and years and years. Uh, 2016, we had a horrific crash in Tennessee that killed six children. That's when I introduced the School Bus Safety Act to implement safety recommendations from the, from the National Transportation Safety Board. They're in favor of this, to make school buses safer and to prevent such crashes from occurring in the future. That was in 2016. According to the National Highway Safety Traffic Administration, in 2007 and 16, 1,282 people were killed in school transportation-related crashes, an average of 128 fatalities per year. We as Congress must do more to protect our children. Uh, the National Transportation Safety Board has recommended school buses be equipped with seat belts and automatic emergency braking and electronic stability control because they can help prevent or mitigate the severity of these tragedies and merit swift congressional action. My amendment would ensure that these important improvements to school buses are issued by a certain date and required on new buses in a timely manner. Without congressional direction to issue a federal safety standard by a certain date, critical safety regulations can languish for years at the Department of Transportation or be abandoned entirely. The Department of Transportation under either administration has not been as involved as they should be in helping our children on school buses. Uh, even after a safety standard is written, DOT can needlessly delay compliance with the rule for years, costing lives during this interim period. Here we are four plus years later and no action. For instance, despite issuing a final rule to require entry level driving training for all commercial motor vehicle drivers, including school bus operators in 2016, the Federal Motor Safety Administration recently extended the compliance date to the rule until 2022, and it could be delayed even further. Therefore, Congress must not only require a rule be issued by a certain date, but also limit the time to comply with the rule to a reasonable period. This issue is too important. Our children are too important to allow the Department of Transportation to drag their feet, which they've done in the past, and they've got the, the, the blood on their hands of children who've died. I'd like to thank Senator Duckworth, who's my sponsor in the Senate, and Advocates for Highway and Auto Safety for supporting this amendment. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment, and I hope you'll do it in thinking about the children. It's important that we, we help the children in, in, when they're in, in a school bus. So I yield back the balance of my time and, and, and pray for your uh, positive consideration. Uh, I, uh, I thank the gentleman. Uh, uh, are there others who wish to be heard on uh, a requirement that within one year's uh, all school buses uh, must have uh, safety belts and shoulder harnesses. Yes. Yeah, I would recognize the gentleman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. School bus transportation is already the safest form of transportation above all others, according to uh, DOT statistics. The bill contains, this bill, contains provisions addressing ways to improve school bus safety. It directs the DOT to comprehensively address illegal passing of stopped school buses, initiate a rulemaking process to consider all the ramifications of seat belts on large school buses, their benefits, their, the recommendations of the FTSB, the experience in states that have set seat belt laws, including the usage rates in those states, evacuation issues in water and fire incidents, especially for younger students, and the overall availability of school bus transportation. The amendment by my friend Mr. Cohn would prejudge the outcome of the seatbelt rulemaking that we're asking for in this bill and preclude the examination of all the ramifications of such a decision that I just talked about by imposing a mandate for a final rule to require new equipment to the tune of about $10,000 per school bus without any review of whether this is appropriate based on all the information that we're waiting to hear, that we're asking for. Now, the school bus suppliers representing public and privately owned operators have written a letter supporting the provisions in this bill, and they oppose this particular amendment. At this time, I ask for unanimous, unanimous consent to insert this letter in the record. Without objection, so ordered. I believe that we ought to listen to the dedicated folks that actually operate the nearly 5,000 school buses on the road out there every day to transport our, our, our very precious cargo, our children. 
I know many of these good folks in Pennsylvania who are dedicated to the continuation of this remarkable safety record. I just think that, uh, that it, we, we should let this run its course as we have directed and get the information before we prejudge it and, uh, and predetermine what the out outcome should be. I don't know what the point of, of asking uh, the NTSB to do this and then just doing it for them without any of the information. So I would urge my colleagues to oppose this amendment at this time and with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Others wish to be recognized. Uh, Mr. Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm actually gonna go back. I, I, I gotta tell you, I, I, just yesterday, just yesterday, we agreed to accept an amendment by Mr. Garamendi that explicitly, it explicitly says that a state can assume the, the, the environmental compliance for the federal government. This committee just ex ex accepted it explicitly that says that, that, and it's not just limited to 404 as Mr. Stauber's amendment, it says any environmental regulation, it allows a state to, to put a, a process in place and, and, and to basically serve as a surrogate. And so, look, Mr. Mr. Stauber's amendment, which is which a much smaller scope, and, and, and all I can do is look at this and say, well, because Mr. Garamendi was a Democrat and Mr. Stauber's a Republican, that that's the only reason the amendment was shut down. I just, I think it's, it's really frustrating, Mr. Chairman, to watch that happen. And I just wanna ask if you would please ask your staff to see if you could work with Mr. Stauber and come up with something on that amendment uh, that would be acceptable to the committee because I think that there is a way for us to work this out just as we did yesterday for my friend from California, Mr. Garamendi, and I yield back. Well, Mr. I thank Chairman. the gentleman, although he wasn't speaking to the amendment uh, in question, and I'll address that in a moment. Others who wish to address this particular amendment? Hearing none, uh, I'll respond uh, on the amendment and uh, briefly on the gentleman's remarks. Uh, I rise in opposition uh, to the amendment. Uh, the gentleman points out that this has been uh, controversial for quite some time. I remember consideration in one of the T's back whenever. Uh, and uh, we do have, unfortunately, some contradictory uh, analysis. Uh, the National Highway uh, Trans Traffic Safety Administration uh, say that it could increase student fatalities uh, on an annual basis by 10 to 12, and any one child lost is too much. Uh, and, um, you know, we are mandating a process with a date certain. Uh, the gentleman wishes to mandate by a date certain. Uh, I would like to go through a full analysis with public input, uh, testimony uh, to uh, the regulatory agency in uh, the analysis and rulemaking process, uh, that hears uh, from survivors, victims, uh, and uh, also hears from safety experts, uh, those who agree and disagree with the mandate, the utilization, the conditions, and uh, the ways in which uh, these buses should be, these, these, these should be, I'm, uh, excuse me, someone is not muted, uh, uh, should be uh, mandated. So. Uh, I uh, would uh, rise in uh, opposition uh, to the amendment and wish uh, to go uh, forward with the, uh, with the study with a mandated end time. Uh, uh, in response to the previous gentleman, uh, the issue here is uh, in the context of the repeal of the Clean Water Act by the Trump administration. Uh, so allowing this authority to go to the states, as I mentioned, and this is fairly unique, and I don't know how many states have it, but I know there are a number in the West who have, a, have state laws that say they cannot exceed the federal standard. Uh, when the federal standard goes to, uh, you know, uh, you can dump stuff in 70% of the, the streams that are tributary uh, across the country, uh, and with no regulation at the federal level, those states can't exceed it. Uh, when the federal regulation goes to, you can fill in half the wetlands in the country with no regulation, states can't exceed it. That's the context in which it's being considered. If there is some way to facilitate uh, things that are unnecessarily bureaucratic but not actually uh, protecting critical tributaries and wetlands, 
uh, I would be happy to consider uh, well, the a, a way to move forward. I'm Mr. sorry. Mr. Chairman, if uh, I might, we, we've Mr. moved Chairman, beyond Chairman, that Chairman. amendment, and we have many, 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 many more amendments, and I would hope not to go past midnight tonight. So uh, with that, uh, anyone else wish to be recognized on this amendment? Okay. Uh, are there amendments to the amendment? Hearing none, uh, the question, did someone want to amend okay, the amendment? Okay, this is Congressman Cohen. Can I close? No, you don't get to close, Steve. <laughs> uh, the, um, we will now proceed to a vote on the amendment. Uh, those who are in uh, favor of the amendment uh, will signify, will unmute and signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, those who are opposed to the amendment will unmute and signify by saying nay. 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 In, nay. in the opinion of the chair, there is a near unanimity among nays. The amendment is, I'll pause. The amendment is not agreed to. Mr. Chairman, I'm not going to ask for a vote. Well, it's, it's too I'm late now, Steve, and you're not recognized. Adios. <laughs> uh, uh, <coughs> the clerk will designate Mr. Stauber. An amendment to the amendment in the nature of substitute to H.R. 2, offer Mr. Stauber number 046. Uh, the amendment is considered as read. Uh, the gentleman may proceed for three minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair, uh, Ranking Member Grave. I'd like to again refer to the disturbing findings in my mm -hmm. amendment. Ele electric vehicles require precious metals, and the Congo is the top producer of cobalt in the world. UNICEF and Amnesty International estimate that 40,000 boys and girls work in these mines for up to 12 hours a day and earn no more than $2 a day, if any money at all. They do not attend school. They are beaten by security guards and are issued no protective equipment. They crawl into small holes and dig by hand for metals that power our electric buses and electric vehicle charging stations. <clears throat> My amendment to HR2 would require the Secretary of Commerce to certify that no electric vehicle charging stations, electric buses, or other emissions reductions technology are built with minerals sourced from child labor as defined by Article 3 of the United Nations International Labor Organization Convention. Adoption of my amendment is common sense, and I expect a unanimous vote in favor. Green technology is reliant on supply chains originating with children working in horrid conditions. We don't have to be re re reliant on these supply chains. We can fulfill the need for our minerals right here in America. I urge adoption of my amendment so the Commerce Secretary can ensure our supply chains are ethical. But before we vote, I ask that you look into these children's eyes and recognize that the precious metals that power this country are currently derived from their labor, and it must stop. Thank you, and I yield back. Are there others who wish to uh, address the amendment question? Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Palmer, had his light on first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just like to point out that in addition to um, the points raised by Mr. Stauber, and I, I very much appreciate that, there's also a national security issue here about many of these um, uh, materials. Uh, they're rare earth materials that exist here in the United States, but we import 100% of those materials and, and the refinery process for that uh, is largely in China uh, for many of th these materials. So I, I want to speak in support of Mr. Stauber's amendment and I yield back. Others wish to address the amendment. Uh, Mr. Perry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, too, want to speak on behalf of Mr. Stauber's amendment and echo the concerns that he has raised, as well as the concerns of uh, the national security concerns that uh, my good friend Mr. Palmer has re raised and remind everybody that while we call these rare earth minerals, that's what they're called, they're not rare. They're here in the United States. We could get them. We don't have to rely on child labor from Africa 
often owned by China. Not a strategic competitor, a strategic adversary. In many cases, the Communist Party is the enemy. We're relying on our enemy to provide the minerals to power these electric vehicles that this committee is trying to force most Americans to buy because they're so opposed to fossil fuels. That's a whole other issue. But the issue is they're not rare. The problem is, is that committees like this one, policies coming out of this committee and other committees make them untenable to get in the United States, unaffordable, unavailable for us to get them. We don't need to quit using electric vehicles and promoting them. If we want to embrace them, that's great. But let's start using the minerals that we have here and not promoting child labor in Africa and act like it doesn't happen and not promote uh, the, the Communist Chinese Party and, and, and the national security compromises that come with that because we want to drive electric vehicles and act like it's not happening. It's happening. We have a chance to do something about it right here with this amendment, and that's why we should all vote aye. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, do others wish to be heard on the amendment? Seeing none, hearing none. Uh, we had a discussion of this on a previous amendment. Uh, you know, as I said, uh, we have adopted very, very stringent uh, uh, actions against SOUs, state-owned enterprises, uh, and increased Buy America requirements substantially in this bill outside the jurisdiction of this committee. Uh, there are laws and prohibitions on the importation of goods made by child labor, both in administrative rules, uh, in uh, trade agreements, and uh, under the jurisdiction of both the Commerce Committee and I believe uh, the Education and Labor Committee, but not within this committee. Uh, and therefore, uh, I certainly agree with the intent uh, however, uh, you know, I will oppose the amendment. Are there others who wish to be heard on the amendment? Uh, hearing none, are there amendments to the amendment? Hearing none, uh, we will proceed to a vote. Uh, those who intend to vote in favor will unmute. Those who wish to vote in favor will at this point signify by saying aye. Aye. Please, thank you. Uh, those who wish to vote in opposition to the amendment, please signify, uh, unmute, and signify by saying nay. 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 Can, can you chair the nays have it? Mr. Chair. Uh, Yes. I'll request a recorded vote. Uh, recorded votes requested. Recorded vote will be postponed. The uh, next uh, clerk will designate the next amendment. Mr. Lynch. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of substitute to HR2 offered by Mr. Lynch, number 085. Uh, they handed me 081. Hold on. Let's check. Uh, how about the ferries? Eight, four. What do you got, Steve? Eight, four. All right. Uh, excuse me. Um, well, this one's not numbered 85 either. It's numbered 84. Which is 084, apparently has many amendments. <laughs> amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR2 offered by Mr. Lynch, number 084. Uh, amendments considered as read uh, without objection. A uh, gentleman uh, will have uh, three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this amendment is generally in harmony with uh, Mr. Garamendi's uh, amendment yesterday. This amendment would increase funding for ferry boat and ferry facility construction by about $30 million for each of the fiscal years 2022 through 2025. Uh, given the continuing concerns regarding uh, traffic congestion and its contribution to global climate change 
in our coastal and waterfront communities. Uh, communities are increasingly relying on ferry systems as an efficient and low-cost mode of transportation. Robust ferry networks reduce commuter traffic on roads and highways and serve to connect otherwise isolated communities. That's why uh, towns like Hull, Massachusetts, Hingham, Cohasset, Situate, as well as the cities of uh, Quincy and Boston, including my own neighborhood of uh, South Boston on the waterfront and uh, the North End in Boston, are seeking to dramatically ramp up their ferry networks and routes. I know that Mayor Walsh of Boston has uh, also included the expansion of the urban ferry service in Boston as a critical component of, its, of his uh, comprehensive climate action plan. However, uh, these and other efforts to build up our ferry system will require significant federal support in order for communities to acquire additional vessels and repair or construct new ferry docks and terminals. Uh, so I, I know that the chairman is a uh, longtime advocate of uh, ferry uh, usage and uh, ferry as a, ferries as an alternative or, or a multimodal way of addressing some of our traffic problems in uh, major cities. And uh, my question is whether he believes that there is sufficient funding already included in HR2, uh, which would be sufficient to meet much of the growing demand across our districts and across this country uh, in expanded ferry programs. Uh, in response to the gentleman, uh, if you'll yield. I will yield. I uh, thank the gentleman. Um, I would like to have more money in a hell of a lot of these programs uh, than it is in this bill. Uh, you know, the transportation needs of America are vast, uh, and this is money that is productively spent, and virtually every penny of it recirculates in the United States of America with our strong Buy America requirements. We did increase uh, the ferry program by 50%. Uh, in this bill, uh, and hopefully that's an adequate number. Uh, if not, we can revisit it at a later date. Were we to revisit it now, we're going to run into the same issue, which uh, I referenced uh, to uh, one of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle earlier in recalculating uh, the, uh, the uh, splits in the programs and the amount of time it takes FTA to do this. Uh, so uh, I would, uh, you know, uh, reluctantly uh, oppose the amendment, uh, I yield back. Well, I thank the chairman. I, I do appreciate the 50% increase. Uh, that is significant. Uh, and uh, I, I appreciate the willingness to uh, have a further discussion uh, with uh, Mr. Garamendi and others uh, to, to really amplify what we're doing in terms of ferries. And, and because of the 50% increase, um, it's probably wise and prudent, I think, to uh, see what that does, uh, that 50% increase does to uh, increase capacity, and then we'll go from there. So at this point, I'd, I'd withdraw my amendment. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Uh, without objection, uh, the amendment uh, is withdrawn. Clerk will designate uh, Mr. Stauber. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR2 offered by Mr. Stauber, number 048. Mr. Uh, without objection, the amendment is considered as read. Mr. Stauber is recognized for three minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair DeFazio, Ranking Member Graves. Uh, the sense of Congress simply states that states should be utilizing the life cycle cost analysis, or LCCA, to evaluate the total economic cost of a transportation project over its expected lifetime. LCCA helps states identify cost-effective options for construction and saves money over time. By encouraging competition and ensuring resiliency in construction practices <clears throat> and material, we can do more with less and ensure that our roads and bridges in which we are investing are, all, are able to last longer and cost less. I also appreciate the chairman's comments in support of LCCA in the past during several hearings and roundtables. I am, however, disappointed <clears throat> that despite Chairman support, it was not included in the underlying legislation. My amendment does not require states to perform LCCA, nor does it carry any unfunded mandates. Rather, it simply recognizes LCCA as an effective practice in responsibly spending tax dollars. I urge, my, I urge the adoption of my amendment, and I yield back. Uh, others wish to be heard on the amendment? If not, I recognize myself. Uh, I rise in strong support of the gentleman's amendment. 
uh, you know, I believe that states should use a life cycle cost analysis uh, to look at the total uh, longer term impact, some of which will be intergenerational of these projects, which is why I'm, uh, the bill encourages using more durable materials. We shouldn't be building any more 60-year bridges. They should be at least 100-year bridges. So we're not saddling uh, two generations out uh, with uh, massive uh, new costs, et cetera. Uh, so this uh, amendment has great merit. Uh, and without objection, I'm uh, willing to accept uh, the amendment by unanimous consent. Uh, hearing none, uh, the amendment is agreed to. Uh, the clerk uh, will designate uh, Mr. Lynch, uh, and I believe this is 081. Are we on the same page? I don't whatever they hand me. Uh, go for 85. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Uh, clerk will designate. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 2, offered by Mr. Lynch, number 085. There's, uh, it, before we proceed, uh, there is some bizarre interference somewhere out there. Thank you. Uh, uh, without objection, the amendment is considered as read. The gentleman is recognized for three minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this amendment would increase our funding for community safety grants in the section of the bill that addresses the transportation of hazardous materials. So this is, goes to the pipeline issue. Uh, funding for these critical public safety grants would be increased under my amendment from $4 million to $15 million annually through fiscal year 2025. As most members know, the Community Safety Grant Program is administered by, the, by FIMSA, the Federal Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, and that is the agency responsible for protecting people and the environment against pipeline leaks and the discharge of hazardous substances. This grant program provides vital funding to community organizations to maximize the ability of our constituents in cities and towns to respond to hazardous material incidents. It also supports roadside inspections and other hazmat training programs for the state and local law enforcement personnel. This funding has proven to be vital for communities, including areas in my own district that are situated along hazardous material transportation routes due to the proximity to natural gas pipelines and other high risk energy projects. So this goes to the situation that I have, as I mentioned before, in West Roxbury, where they, were, they put a high pressure uh, gas line right through a bla active blasting zone and uh, in proximity to a lot of uh, residential homes and also to the great detriment of the residents of the town of Weymouth, Massachusetts, which is a beautiful coastal community in my district that is facing a, uh, a plan to install a, uh, a natural gas compressor station. Uh, it also infects the, infects the, affects the communities of Braintree, Abington, and the city of Quincy. So the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission approved the construction of that uh, natural gas compressor station, but recently the First Circuit Court of Appeals reversed the air quality permit, so we're, we're back uh, uh, in a position of limbo for right now. So the major high-risk energy project that we're talking about this Compressor station is located adjacent to the Fall River Bridge and, uh, and also a very densely populated area in North Weymouth. Uh, so this, this amendment would give greater opportunity, greater resources for uh, the community of, of, uh, of Weymouth and others to, to test the wisdom and, and prudence of some of these projects and, and to push back. Uh, but given my great respect for our chairman, I'd like to ask Mr. DeFazio if he's confident that the funding level, I know we're doing a couple of things in this bill, is the level for community safety grants already included in HR 2? Do you think it will be sufficient given all the need we have out there to assist our communities in mitigating the risk of hazardous material transportation? And I will yield to the chairman for his, his remarks. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Um, uh, similar to the uh, amendment regarding ferries, we're looking at a 400% increase in community grants in this bill. Uh, we will see if uh, that becomes fully uh, utilized uh, in the future, and um, you know, should it become fully uh, utilized and communities 
uh, and, you know, indicate that they would uh, like to have more resources, it is a meritorious program, uh, then uh, I would certainly consider, uh, you know, either in, in the future or uh, technical amendments in the future to uh, attempt to increase funding. I yield back. I thank the gentleman, and, and I, I accept the explanation there, and I, I think that's a reasonable approach. And with that, I will withdraw my amendment. Thank the gentleman. Uh, the clerk will designate uh, Mr. Bost. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 2, offered by Mr. Bost, number 049. Uh, the amendment without objection is considered as read. The gentleman is recognized for three minutes to speak in favor of his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Private property rights are a fundamental part of the human liberties and our freedom. Our nation's founders enshrined this principle in the United States Constitution. They determined that no, no one's property should be taken by government unless two conditions are met. First, they at, that any such seizure be for public use. The definition has long been recognized as a means to larger scale public projects, such as roads, utilities, schools, hospitals. Second, the prop property owner received just compensation for the loss of the use of their land. Unfortunately, in recent years, this definition of public use has been stretched beyond reason. No longer is eminent domain being exercised for national or regional significant projects to benefit many thousands or even millions of persons. Now it's being used to seize private property, to expand bike paths, hiking trails, and citizens' backyards. While I'm I appreciate these trails, provide recreation for, for certain Americans, I certainly don't believe that our founding fathers had in mind uh, of doing this when they drafted the Fifth Amendment. Most of home and landowners' negative impact by these abuses activities are middle-income families. They, can afford teams of, they can't afford teams of lawyers to legally challenge against the governments and activist groups which deep, with deep pockets. My amendment is simple. It prohibits the use of federal transportation alternative program dollars to fund projects that include land acquired through eminent domain. An exception is made for those projects that demonstrate a clear safety benefit to children and elderly or those with disabilities. Mr. Chairman, this shouldn't be a partisan issue. I think most members of this committee can reasonably agree that non-motorized transportation projects have their place in transportation planning. And the same, at the same time, there needs to be limits on how far the government can go to seize private property in the name of public use. My amendment helps strike the balance by ensuring the federal funds are not available to fund abusive um, eminent domain practices. I urge the adoption of the amendment, and with that, I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Others wish to be recognized. Uh, hearing none, I'll recognize myself. Um, you know, I have long uh, been opposed to uh, taking of property by eminent domain. In particular, I, I would note that the Bush-Cheney Energy Act delegated the authority to take property uh, for private profit and private use uh, to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, a political commission made up of faceless political appointees. Uh, and there's an extraordinarily controversial uh, project pending in my state. Uh, so I am against uh, delegating, in particular, to private for-profit projects. In this case, we are talking about a valid form of public transportation. Now, the gentleman might not believe that cycling uh, or others are legitimate forms of transportation. I do. Um, you know, if you look, uh, when I took the committee last year uh, to see what uh, was going on in Europe on both uh, moving away from fossil fuels and alternate transportation and innovations in transit, uh, you know, we were in, uh, in Copenhagen where 60% of the people on a daily basis commute in the major city by bicycle. Why do they do that? Uh, because they are in lanes that are protected from and separate from the automobile traffic. 
so they can take their kids in the tow along trailers and anything else and they are confident they're gonna get there alive instead of sharing the roadway with vehicles that weigh 20 you know, or 50 times as much you know, as uh, they, uh, they do or 100 times, whatever. Um, and uh, this is only targeting the transportation alternatives program. Uh, it doesn't target uh, the Federal Transit Administration. Uh, it doesn't target uh, the highway projects, uh, where I think are some of the most controversial takings uh, uh, going on. Uh, but those are all for public purpose. Unfortunately, the standard was changed by the Supreme Court, uh, and I believe it was the Kelo decision, which was in Connecticut, uh, where the Supreme Court deemed that, in fact, uh, governments could use eminent domain to take private property for private development and utilization, uh, you know, a departure from a couple of hundred years of precedent. Uh, I attempted uh, with uh, then uh, Chairman Oberstar to legislate uh, against uh, the Kelo decision. Uh, we were never successful in uh, overturning it. Uh, so uh, private uh, you know, use is now delegated to at least uh, uh, one federal agency, uh, probably can be used uh, by others given that decision. Uh, so in this case, for some reason, we're going to signal out transportation alternatives, cycling, pedestrian, uh, scooters, uh, whatever might use uh, these lanes. So I would strongly oppose the amendment. Uh, do others wish to speak to the amendment? Uh, hearing none, are there amendments to the amendment? Hearing none, uh, we'll proceed to a vote. Uh, those who intend to vote in favor will please now unmute. Those who are in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, those who intend to vote <laughs> in opposition will now unmute. Will now unmute and will signify by saying nay. 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 Opinion of chair, the nays have it. Mr. Chairman, I ask for a roll call though. Roll call vote is requested. It will be added to the queue. Uh, we now move to Mr. Lynch, uh, number 81, is that correct? It is, sir. Yeah, thank okay. you. Okay, the clerk will please designate. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR2 offered by Mr. Lynch, number 081. Uh, the amendments considered as read without objection. Uh, the gentleman is recognized for up to three minutes. This will be very quick, Mr. Chairman. So this was a situation where uh, it looked like the local uh, municipal uh, authority was going to restrict access uh, a bridge project to a federal courthouse. And uh, I thought it was going to be necessary for us to, to prohibit uh, egress and emergency access and egress uh, to that federal courthouse, the Joe Moakley Courthouse, named after my, my predecessor and a dear friend to a lot of people here uh, in South Boston. Uh, recently, the city's design just came out and it does not uh, restrict access or emergency access or egress from the courthouse. So uh, because of uh, the prudence of that design, I'm able to withdraw this amendment. I thank the gentleman uh, without objection, uh, unanimous consent uh, to withdraw. Uh, so ordered, we'll move to the next amendment. Uh, clerk will uh, designate Mr. Bost. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR2 by Mr. Bost, number 055. Uh, without objection, the amendment is considered as read. Mr. Bost recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My amendment strikes section 4306F of the bill. As I have said before, I was involved and, and have, was raised in a small trucking business uh, that my parents and grandparents owned. Um, there are times when drivers use their trucks as personal vehicles and when they're not on duty hauling loads. And for many drivers, the truck becomes more than just a tool of their job, it also becomes their hotel room at times. It also becomes, uh, that when they are out, when they're done delivering goods, uh, they use it for travel. Uh, 
It also can be used as an RV, and they, whether they've, after they finish a delivery, quite often I can remember one particular uh, company that, that uh, the more senior uh, owner of the, of, of the company invested very well in a truck that had a tremendous amount of ability to sleep in it, and, and then when he got done hauling, he and his wife would take trips around the area in which he delivered to. Um, the FMCSA has last examined this issue and it found no reason to update the guidance in relation to pertaining to the use of trucks as a personal vehicle. And I urge the adoption of this amendment because uh, uh, we need to go ahead and leave it as it is and allow people to use their personal property as their personal property and not to have to meet all the guidelines of uh, uh, hours of service requirements. And with that, uh, I urge the, the adoption of the amendment and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Others wish to be recognized on the amendment? Uh, if not, I'll recognize myself. Uh, you know, I, I think the gentleman makes a reasonable point if there were reasonable limits. However, uh, FMCSA issued guidance that a driver can operate a truck without limits, without limits on how many miles or how much time for personal use, uh, even if that truck is fully loaded with cargo and even if such movement is on the way to a driver's next delivery point. Uh, that obviously uh, does create some pretty extraordinary uh, challenges and loopholes uh, to the already liberalized hours of service adopted by FMCSA. Uh, it could be hundreds of miles, it could be many, many hours uh, away. Uh, if there were reasonable limits, uh, if someone is returning to their residence within a certain radius, as it, many of the exemptions in the bill for hours of service uh, in agriculture and other areas have circumferences. Uh, they limit the distance. I think it's the same in, uh, you know, concrete and, and because of it will cure and, and other things. Uh, but to uh, have, uh, unfortunately, I, I, although the gentleman's intent I think is good, given what FMCSA did, saying there will be absolutely no limits or constraints upon this, whether or not the truck is fully loaded, whether or not uh, it's continuing on to its destination, but it happens to go past the person's personal residence where they stop in for a cup of coffee. Um, you know, that, uh, unfortunately, I, I believe, is uh, a road too far. Uh, so I will uh, oppose uh, the amendment. Uh, uh, any others wish to speak on the amendment? Uh, hearing none, uh, then uh, are there amendments to the amendment? Hearing none, uh, we'll proceed to a vote. Uh, those who intend to vote in favor will now unmute. Those in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, those who intend to vote uh, in the negative will now unmute. Those who are opposed will say nay. 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 Opinion of the chair, the nays have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Lynch, number 086. 086, since we've had confusion with your amendments, okay. Clerk will designate. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR2 offered by Mr. Lynch, number 086. Uh, without objection, the amendment is considered read with, and the gentleman is recognized for up to three minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This should be brief. Uh, as everyone here is painfully aware, our country has been devastated by the coronavirus, over 110,000 Americans dead and millions more out of work. While the pain has been acute at the individual and family level, it is also uh, being felt at the city and state budget levels as well. Uh, the bill that you have assembled, Mr. Chairman, already recognizes that fact in part, and it provides relief for capital investment grants. It ensures that already appropriated funds can be used to increase the federal cost share on existing grants 
and it allows local project sponsors to request temporary deferral of their local share payments. These simple changes uh, will bring much needed relief to the recipient, recipients of those capital investment grants. Uh, the text of my amendment is simple. That would extend the same relief that you have afforded for capital investment grants to build grants. Build grants are the better, build is an acronym for better, utiliza better utilizing investments to leverage development. A uh, very successful program. Uh, so it would extend that relief to build grant recipients as well. Uh, in my state of Massachusetts, we've been lucky to receive the build grants that we have, but with payments quickly coming due, and like all of us, uh, revenues dropping precipitously, uh, we're gonna face a serious shortage and some severe economic pain in the future. So the relief for us, the capital investment grants uh, is very helpful. And that's where this idea came from. Uh, I think the relief on the SIG grants is also necessary. My, my request here in this amendment is simply to extend during this crisis uh, and, and with uh, revenues being so short and uh, the situation so critical that we might extend the same relief to build grant recipients as well. So that is my ask, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Well, I thank the, the gentleman. I think it's a meritorious request. Unfortunately, it's beyond the jurisdiction of this committee. Uh, that is not an authorized program. We, therefore, we have no authority uh, to allocate uh, or to change the allocation or the cost share in that program. It is solely a construct of the Appropriations Committee. Uh, I would be happy to join the gentleman in uh, approaching the Appropriations Committee as they go to their marks in uh, an, an interminable process in uh, late July, where we'll spend two weeks on uh, on all the appropriations bills, uh, uh, which uh, none will be passed in the Senate, and then we'll negotiate some gigantic year-end budget deal, as always. Uh, but I'd be happy to uh, join him in uh, asking them to uh, extend that same uh, 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 relief. Uh, so. Uh, I would have to oppose the amendment. Others yeah. wish yeah. to be heard on the amendment? You want to yield back? Uh, the gentleman wishes. Yeah, if, if, if the gentleman is going to support the measure in, in, during the appropriations process, I'm happy to have his support and am willing to withdraw the amendment here and, and try this vehicle uh, during the appropriations process. Okay, uh, I thank the gentleman. I assure him uh, I would be happy to join him in that process. I would have thought that this would have been covered in either cares or heroes. It must have been an oversight. Uh, so, I thank the gentleman. I withdraw. Uh, the clerk will designate Mr. Gallagher. An amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR two, offered by Mr. Gallagher, number one one four. Uh, without objection, the amendment is considered as read. Uh, the gentleman is recognized for three minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, for one, am shocked at your suggestion that the appropriations process is somehow suboptimal, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. I appreciate the uh, offer, the time to talk about this amendment, which is a small fix, which I believe can have a large impact. Logging trucks are hauling raw forestry material from harvest to site to mill uh, and operating under state weight limits today on America's state and local roads. So that means, and I repeat, these logging trucks are already on the road, but because the interstate has a weight tolerance lower than many state limits, these logging trucks are forced to drive on state and local roads, which are much more dangerous. If you haven't done it, I encourage you to take a ride along with the logging truckers in your district. This will become self-evident when you do this. I did it last year and I was shocked at how dangerous it is, how we were forced to divert through towns and past schools and go through roundabouts and many obstacles that cause large truck crashes uh, throughout the year. And so uh, I believe the interstate has none of these obstacles and was, is within a few minutes drive away. I think it's an obvious solution to allow our logging trucks access to the interstate. And again, this is not a question of allowing heavier trucks on our road. 
These heavier trucks are already on our roads. We get to choose whether or not they're on the safer interstate or whether they are, they're on the more dangerous rural and city roads. And there was a 2018 University of Georgia study that found that only 5% of accidents involving large trucks occurred on interstate and 95% occurred on state and local roads. And worse, 41% of those accidents occurred within five miles of an interstate. My amendment would get them onto the interstate where we could avoid unnecessary crashes, saving lives in rural America. And as a bonus, this would also reduce carbon emissions, an average of 10 fewer gallons of diesel fuel per trip. So it's safer and it's better for the environment. And again, finally, for those who say we shouldn't allow bigger trucks on the road, I would like to remind you that these trucks are already on the road. My amendment would allow them on the interstate for only 150 air miles, sufficient to get them from harvest site to mill. It would save lives, reduce emissions, and make small businesses more efficient. That said, I understand there are still some concerns. And as we head to the floor, I'm open to working with all interested parties on a bipartisan solution. And therefore, I will be withdrawing this amendment. And I look forward to discussing this bipartisan legislation, as well as fixing the broader appropriations process the chairman mentioned in the meantime. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Yeah, yeah I'd be happy to help fix the appropriations process. Um, uh, I thank the gentleman uh, for his offer to withdraw. Let me tell you, I'm sensitive to the issue. Obviously, uh, uh, you know, I represent a, a very large district, uh, and uh, the timber industry is a very important uh, part of my district. In my state, uh, I guess perhaps not in Wisconsin, uh, you know, companies can apply for and get uh, overweight uh, permits uh, as long as they can show that they uh, do not exceed the bridge formula, uh, since we don't want to cause excessive uh, bridge uh, impacts with trucks that don't have proper axle configurations. Uh, and uh, it is, you know, it's, it's used, but, um, you know, I, I can't even say what the frequency is. So. Um, I, I don't know why uh, the state of Wisconsin uh, hasn't uh, adopted uh, similar regulations, and I'd be happy to work with the gentleman and see if there's some uh, federal barrier or rigmarole that uh, prevents states from making uh, reasonable uh, accommodations uh, for this sort of transport. And I, I would be happy to work with the gentleman and try and figure that out. Uh, so without objection, uh, the amendment is uh, withdrawn. Hearing none. Uh, next amendment is uh, uh, Ms. Brown, or Mr. Brown. Wait, I just said Brown. I don't know. It doesn't say which one. Anthony Brown. Okay, Mr. Brown. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR two, offer by Mr. Brown of Maryland, number zero, number two two two. Uh, without objection, the amendment is considered as read. The gentleman is recognized for three minutes. Uh, Anthony, you're recognized for three minutes. Please unmute wherever you are. Uh, they say you're on and you're on mute. Mute, unmute. Oh, yeah, you're up there in the top left corner right next to two blank things. You're muted. Uh, you're still muted. Everybody's on there. Different there, here, you're right? unmuted. You're unmuted. Month. Start over. Your time will start again because you so were muted. It's gonna, is it going to be retroactive? Because, like, what about the person? What's that? You were muted. You're now unmuted. Please oh, begin your statement again. Mr. Brown, I think we'll have to return to you because for some reason you keep getting muted. Uh, so we will uh, get you next as a Democratic amendment. Uh, we'll move on uh, as, as the next Democratic amendment. We will do another Democratic amendment and then a, uh, a Republican amendment, then back to you. But we need to figure out why you keep getting muted. Uh, Uh, the uh, uh, representative uh, Carson will be designate.
Amendment to the amendment in the nature of substitute to HR 2, authorized Mr. Carson, number 029. Uh, the amendment is considered as read, uh, and uh, without objection, the gentleman is recognized three minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, I, sorry about that. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you, you're fine. Oh, oh, all right. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, um, I I appreciate it. I um, moved to strike the last word. Um, you don't need to strike the last word. You're recognized for three minutes. You do not need to strike the last word. You were recognized for three minutes. You were audible a few seconds ago. Uh, Hello. Now you're muted. It looks like uh, we may. Uh, no, you're muted. All muted. I don't know sign language for, but you know. Please unmute. All right, no need to sign. My mind is refined. All right, um, duck boats. I want to talk about the duck boat. I plan to withdraw this amendment, but first I'd like to uh, raise the issue. Uh, we're affected uh, in my district. Uh, duck boats start and end their trips on the roads. Uh, and only part of their tours are on the water. Uh, duck boat safety has become a very important issue because it was one of my constituents uh, who died in Branson, Missouri in 2018 uh, when their family vacation turned into an unspeakable tragedy. Uh, 17 of the 31 passengers died when a duck boat sank. I represent the Coleman family members who survived this accident and are desperate for changes that can prevent any other family from going through what they went through. Uh, it turns out that duck boats have a long history of problems, and there's a long list of recommendations to prevent more accidents, some going back to 1999. Uh, yet these recommendations have not been implemented, uh, which is why I introduced the Duck Boat Safety Act to codify outstanding recommendations with the National Transportation Safety Administration and other agencies. Some of these recommendations include moving the canopies and in Proving buoyancy. Some of these recommendations are clear, and while I understand that uh, at least one of several investigations is still pending at this time, uh, we need to act as soon as possible, especially uh, given the previous recommendations. I commend you, Chairman DeFazio, and uh, Subcommittee Chair uh, Maloney, my good friend, for your joint statement in April pushing for a resolution to this matter, and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes. Mr. Chairman? Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, I'd just like to thank the gentleman from Indiana for his uh, uh, earnest right, concern for minutes. his constituents and the importance of this issue. And I would uh, be more than happy to work with him along with the uh, subcommittee staff to address this important issue. Thank you. Yield back. I thank uh, uh, the chairman of the Committee of Jurisdiction. Uh, anyone else wish to be heard on the amendment? Uh, I'll speak briefly to the amendment. Uh, this was a horrible tragedy. Uh, I believe with a different design criteria, well, with a better captain uh, and a different design uh, criteria, uh, it would have been preventable. We do have the NTSB report, uh, the Coast Guard Marine Board of Investigations continuing, and uh, the tradition of the committee uh, to wait for recommendations from the agency of principal jurisdiction. Uh, and they are going to make recommendations to address the inherent safety risks in the design of duck boats and their use as commercial uh, passenger uh, vessels. Not to date myself, but I'm so old I remember as a very, very young kid uh, watching the Coast Guard drive from a Coast Guard station to uh, rescue uh, someone in a capsized boat in a duck. Uh, they're pretty slow on land and very ungainly uh, in the water. So uh, uh, I believe uh, we're long overdue for safety regulations. Uh, so if the, if the gentleman is um, willing to withdraw the amendment. 
Yes, sir. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Without objection, the amendment is withdrawn. Next amendment. The Republican. Republican amendment. Uh, the, uh, this will be, uh, please designate Mr. Mast. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2, offered by Mr. Mast, number 063. Uh, without, amend, uh, without objection, the amendment is considered as read. A gentleman is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment, very simple. It would add rural farm-to-market roads as an eligible project for surface transportation block grant program, right? Local state roads that connect ag to markets, food to markets. That's the purpose of making them eligible for the, the surface transportation block grant program. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment, and I yield back my time. I thank the gentleman for his brevity, uh, I, but unfortunately that won't uh, sway me. Uh, do others wish to uh, speak to the amendment? Uh, if not, I will address the amendment. Uh, this amendment uh, allows to use STP funds to be used farm to market roads uh, without limitation. Uh, you know, uh, we already have uh, designated uh, money in the bill for, uh, uh, for uh, off-system bridges, uh, as I recall, a billion dollars. Uh, and, uh, you know, we are uh, making a substantial investment in rural roads also in the bill. Uh, but we want to focus on the state of good repair of the federal system where uh, more than 40% of the designated national highway system is in need of total reconstruction. You can't just resurface it again like Obama did under the Recovery Act, uh, put a layer of uh, asphalt on top. It needs to be rebased and rebuilt. Uh, and 47,000 bridge bridges on the national highway system need significant repair or replacement. Uh, so uh, to allow, a, a, you know, without limitation, uh, would be uh, very, very problematic. Uh, and given our other uh, designation of a billion for off-season, uh, off-system bridges and 250 million uh, for the rebuild rural grant program, uh, and up to 15% of STP funds can be sub-allocated to rural roads, rural areas to be used on rural minor collectors, local roads, critical rural freight corridors, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I believe uh, we've accommodated the gentleman's concern, but I'd be happy to engage in further discussion on those issues. I have a lot of farm to market, more timber, but some farm to market in my district. Uh, anyone else wish to be recognized on the amendment? Are there amendments to the amendment? If not, uh, then we will proceed to a vote on the amendment. Uh, those of you who are going to be in favor, please unmute. Those who are in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, those who intend to vote uh, in the negative will now please unmute. No. <laughs> those who are opposed no. to the amendment will signify by saying nay. Nay. In the opinion of the chair, the nays have it. Nays have it. Uh, the amendment is not agreed to. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes. Yeah, Congressman Brown from Maryland. Yeah, you're, we're coming right to you. You're unmuted. Hold on. I told you you'd be next. Uh, uh, the clerk. Oh, you want to be recognized and not for your amendment. Uh, yes. yes, Mr. Chairman, to, just to be recognized, uh, Congressman Brown from Maryland has no further amendment to offer during this markup. I appreciate the support from the chair on all the amendments that I've been able to offer. No more amendments this markup. Thank you. Two thumbs up, Anthony. Thank you. Two. Okay. No, no. Uh, Yeah, just simply that I'm not asking for a recorded vote. Why? Well, no, 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 but two people were talking at the same time. Oh, okay. So does the gentleman, I'm sorry, I thought that I waited for, because you're here, I waited, but I waited for the internet people. Uh, does the gentleman wish uh, to ask for a vote? No, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I, I thank the gentleman. 
All right, we have time for a few more before the agreed upon lunch break. Uh, we have, uh, well, the clerk will designate Mr. Maloney. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute offering Mr. Maloney of New York, number 087. Uh, the, without objection, the amendment is considered as read. The gentleman will proceed for up to three minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, this amendment uh, does something very simple. It makes sure that uh, none of the dollars in our legislation will go to Chinese state-owned enterprises. This is a broadly bipartisan concern. So many of my colleagues have spoken about their concern on this issue. And this is very similar to language contained in the previous NDAA language that so many of uh, my colleagues would have supported. Um, you know, each member of this committee has received testimony just last year about the uh, very real threat that Chinese state-owned enterprises pose to our economy and to our national security. My own subcommittee has examined the issue closely multiple occasions. I'd like to thank the bipartisanship shown there from my ranking member, Mr. Gibbs, and from so many members of my subcommittee, regardless of party. And at each of the hearings, uh, we were told that we must provide a hold of government response to this threat. And lest you think this is perhaps an issue that has taken a back seat to the pandemic, every nation uh, now confronts just yesterday, Reuters published a story about a new report documenting Chinese officials stating their intention to use U.S. infrastructure and recovery funds to further their own development. So I encourage my colleagues to read it. Uh, some of us on this committee also serve on the Intelligence Committee and are uh, increasingly concerned about how serious uh, threats are from the Chinese, both to our economy and to our national security. Um, so we must not blame our uh, blame just the Chinese if we leave our own back door open for them to take advantage of U.S. tax dollars. Um, and we know this is like a hydra. It has so many heads. And, and what this will do is we will close down Chinese SOEs from finding loopholes uh, to exploit and continue to use U.S. taxpayer dollars to burrow into our supply chains. So the amendment provides a broad and sweeping answer to this problem. Um, uh, so uh, as a country, we have no choice, uh, you know, uh, but to but to be more careful if we're going to confront uh, the Chinese rise on the global scene and the threat to our own system of government and way of life. Um, so I know these are difficult times and challenging times, but I'd like to encourage all of my colleagues on either side of the aisle to join me in restricting the access of Chinese state-owned enterprises using loopholes uh, to get at U.S. infrastructure funds. And so people know there are also protections built into my amendment so that the law is consistent with our international obligations and with other types of situations, but also will not affect minority interests uh, that might be held by certain entities. And so it is, it, is, it is narrowly tailored, but very important to safeguard U.S. tax dollars against Chinese state-owned enterprises. And I ask my colleagues in both parties to support it. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thanks, gentlemen. Others will be heard. Hearing none, I'll speak to the amendment. I strongly support the amendment. Uh, way back when, I uh, opposed uh, Bill Clinton's move to uh, give uh, China most MFN, permanent MFN status. That gave Congress an annual opportunity to call out uh, their unfair trade practices. Uh, and also then there's uh, ascension into the WTO. I also will be offering an amendment or a bill on the floor in the not too distant future uh, to withdraw from the WTO. We can do that once every five years uh, because the WTO um, uh, is frequently ruling against U.S. interests and has become uh, a real problem. So uh, I strongly support this. Um, I, I would just reflect that we had actually proposed a much more comprehensive ban on the NDAA and as mentioned yesterday, uh, the uh, Republican leader in the House uh, and the chair of the Ways and Means Committee uh, unfortunately prevailed uh, upon the NDAA process and got down, uh, watered down uh, some loopholes uh, which this uh, would close. And so I appreciate uh, the gentleman's amendment. Uh, are there others who wish to be heard on the amendment? Uh, uh, if, uh, if not, uh, then uh, I'm going to, I think we're going to be able to get unanimous consent on this one. I'll try that. Otherwise, we'll vote. Uh, I will. Uh, Mr. Graves? Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd ask for a recorded vote. Okay. Uh, a gentleman wishes to have a recorded vote. A re recorded vote is requested. A re recorded vote will be postponed.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Graves, uh, Louisiana. Uh, uh, designate his amendment, please. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2, offered by Mr. Graves of Louisiana, number 123. Uh, the gentleman is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, right now the states of Louisiana, Colorado, Idaho, uh, Maryland, Wyoming, uh, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Florida, New Jersey, Texas, Washington, D.C., the, the District of Columbia, and others, um, all have Chairwoman Norton, I see you looking at me. Um, uh, they, they, uh, they all are currently implementing testing or preparing to test electronic driver's license. Um, right now, under current law, uh, the law only states a physical license as opposed to an electronic license. And I just want to um, uh, make a small change to the law that indicates that um, that this could be a physical license or it could be an electronic credential. Uh, therefore, when you're uh, going to the airport, um, you could just pull out your phone and you can have an electronic ID, of course, with all of the protections that, that would need to be established. It doesn't change or any of the real ID requirements. It simply says that you could either have a physical or an electronic driver's license. Um, so again, uh, that's for identification purposes. It's trying to keep up with, with technology. And um, it's a simple amendment that simply adds electronic driver's license. Um, it is my understanding from uh, our staff conversations with the Department of Homeland Security uh, that they do not have concerns with the amendment and um, uh, just ask for adoption. Yield back. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Uh, you know, I would certainly uh, want to help facilitate a real ID. My state in its total incompetence uh, decided uh, more than a year and a half ago to issue new driver's licenses to everybody in the state that were not compliant with real ID. So I had to get a new driver's license. It's not compliant. Uh, and now they say, well, hell, now they're not going to be able to meet the deadline for compliant licenses, so maybe this would help them. Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, there are questions regarding jurisdiction, but I'm inclined to accept the amendment, and uh, I can uh, engage in a conversation uh, with Mr. Thompson and see if he will not object to uh, it being included in the bill, and he won't uh, object in the Rules Committee. That'd be great, Mr. Chairman. I just want to make note that after a little bit of research last night, we think we found a way to keep it solidly within our jurisdiction as well, so if you all want to entertain this one, um, however you want to handle it, but I appreciate it. Okay, well, um, so is that a different amendment? Or, no, okay, all right. Well, let's just move ahead. I'm gonna ask uh, unanimous consent uh, to adopt uh, this amendment. Hearing no objection, uh, the amendment is agreed to. All right, uh, we can knock off a couple more here, hopefully. Uh, the uh, this will be uh, the clerk. This will. Uh, I'm hearing. Am I okay? All right. Um, the clerk will designate Mr. Lynch. Uh, I have it as Lynch 083. Is that correct? I believe so. Yes, it is. Yeah. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2, offered by Mr. Lynch, number 083. Uh, without objection, the amendment is considered as read. Uh, the gentleman is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, this amendment provides additional funding for the Electric Vehicle Charging and Hydrogen Fueling Infrastructure Grant Program and also requires that $25 million worth of those grants be directed towards installing and maintaining this infrastructure at U.S. post office locations, uh, both local and, and central. Uh, I do applaud the chairman for including so many provisions to combat global warming in this bill, but I believe we can do more, uh, especially with the federal government. We have the opportunity to be a leader in this fight, and we should take that opportunity. The United States Postal Service, I serve on that, that committee as well. The United States Postal Service is moving First of all, it has 230,000 vehicles that it operates in the United States today, staggering number. Many of those vehicles uh, are parked and operate in our local neighborhoods. Uh, they are currently moving toward the acquisition of a next generation fleet of delivery vehicles for 
the United States Postal Service, including the use of alternative uh, fuel systems. The Postal Service provides us a great option and opportunity to begin the process of making the federal government much more energy efficient and uh, environmentally friendly to our communities. Mr. Chairman, I know that you're a great leader in this area and you share my desire to lead by example in the fight against climate change. I'd ask that we work together as we move forward. Normally, well, I had previously proposed this within the postal reform bill, uh, along with Mr. Cummings and others, Mr. Connolly. Uh, however, the postal reform bill is stuck. It's not moving. Uh, this is a vehicle that is moving, so uh, that's why I have included it, and uh, I would yield for your remarks. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, perhaps the gentleman is, is not aware uh, that uh, at the request of the speaker and with my concurrence, part of the infrastructure package uh, will contain uh, $25 billion uh, in a separate title uh, coming from the Oversight Committee uh, for the Postal Service since um, the, thus far additional funding for the Postal Service has been blocked because President Trump thinks that it uh, subsidizes uh, Mr. Bezos, who owns the Washington Post, which is critical of him. Uh, it doesn't. They actually make money on Amazon deliveries. But in any case, uh, that money, uh, it, I have uh, met, uh, staff has consulted with oversight staff. Oversight staff uh, says that the title is broad enough to uh, allow uh, money to be used to convert to the EV fleet. The post office is in the process of moving forward with fleet acquisition. Uh, and obviously, if they move to an EV fleet, they're going to have to install charging stations, and there will be many billions of dollars available for that. It will help drive the light truck uh, and delivery vehicle market. Uh, and um, the, uh, the postal vehicles they're using now are way past uh, their life expectancy. Uh, they're dirty, they're clunky, they break down, they're unbelievably expensive uh, to maintain. Uh, so I, I believe that we are accommodating this in another title of what will be uh, called the, uh, uh, I, I don't know what the overall name of the bill is, uh, whatever, the larger infrastructure package, which also includes broadband, which was mentioned by someone else earlier. Uh, so uh, I'd urge the gentleman uh, at this point uh, to withdraw the amendment. I, I understand, Mr. Chairman. I, I do agree that, uh, and, and I do support the $25 billion uh, for the post office in general. I'm just familiar with the fact that we have been stopped at the White House uh, uh, the last couple of efforts that we've made in trying to get that uh, approved. And I thought it would be more difficult for the president to, to uh, stop this bill. This is something that the country needs. And I just thought we had improved chances of success on this bill as opposed to the others. So, but I do respect the, uh, the strategy here. And, and I think the $25 billion would, would obviously uh, allow the post office to do this uh, separately with that, that $25 billion allocation. So I, I, I agree with the gentleman, and I, I will, yield, I'll, I will uh, withdraw the amendment. Uh, without objection, uh, the amendment is withdrawn. Uh, it is now, let me, I, I have an old-fashioned analog watch. Let me look at what this says. Uh, it's one minute early, but we did agree upon uh, a lunch break uh, from 12.45 to 1.45. Uh, we can't get through another amendment in one minute, so the committee stands in recess until 1.45. Oh. Hold on, everybody, quick, don't tune out. Uh, at that point, uh, we will uh, go to recorded votes, uh, however many are called for. At, uh, uh, 145. 145, Seven. we will begin recorded votes. Seven. Seven.
Washington Post Live, TMZ. So we, I, um, this map is a snapshot of just some. Great, thanks for providing that information. I appreciate it.
Am I right here? Some of you are on a hot mic, just letting you know. You, Rick. Hi, Rick. Weren't you, Rick, weren't you on the hearing room yesterday? I can't hear you. I think you're muted. Who are you talking to? Yeah, I was. Okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. I'm like, oh, there's Rick in front of the screen now.
Uh, we're we're going to delay uh, five minutes as we announced at the outset of the hearing. If any member was having t technical issues, we would do our best uh, to accommodate them. And apparently, uh, Mr. Garamendi is at the moment experiencing issues. So uh, hang on for five minutes uh, or hopefully less uh, to get his technical issues resolved. If anybody else is having technical issues, uh, let us know. Hi, Bradley. Hi, sir. Um, it says that they don't, they're saying that you don't have to. Don's on mute. Uh, committee, committee will come to order. Apparently, uh, Mr. Garamendi's uh, uh, technical issues have been resolved. Uh, out of order, I'm first going to recognize uh, Mr. Garcia on 065, on which the nays prevailed. Is the recorded vote still requested? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, uh, I seek unanimous uh, consent uh, to withdraw amendment uh, Garcia Amendment 65. Without objection. Okay, then we would move along uh, to Mitchell, uh, number 053. Uh, is a recorded vote still requested? Uh, if so, uh, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. DeFazio. No. Mr. DeFazio votes no. Mr. Graves of Missouri. 
Mr. Graves of Missouri votes aye. Ms. Norton. Mr. Young. Ms. Johnson of Texas. Johnson of Texas, no. Johnson of Texas votes no. Mr. Crawford. Crawford, yes. Mr. Crawford votes aye. Mr. Larson of Washington. Larson votes no. Mr. Larson of Washington votes no. Mr. Gibbs. Gibbs votes yes. Mr. Gibbs votes aye. Ms. Napolitano. Napolitano, no. Ms. Napolitano votes no. Mr. Webster of Florida. Mr. Lipinski. Lipinski, no. Mr. Lipinski votes no. Mr. Massey. Mr. Cohen. Cohen, no. Mr. Cohen votes no. Mr. Perry. Mr. Perry votes aye. Mr. Ceres. Mr. Siri votes no. Mr. Ceres votes no. Mr. Davis of Illinois. Mr. Davis of Illinois votes aye. Mr. Garamendi. Mr. Garamendi votes no. Mr. Garamendi votes no. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Woodall will vote aye. Does the gentleman repeat? Mr. Woodall will vote aye. Just a moment. Does the gentleman repeat that again, please? Mr. Woodall votes aye. Mr. Woodall votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. The gentleman from Georgia votes no. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Katko. Mr. Carson of Indiana. Mr. Carson votes no. Mr. Carson of Indiana votes no. Mr. Babin. Mr. Babin votes aye. Ms. Titus. Titus votes no. Ms. Titus votes no. Mr. Graves of Louisiana. Mr. Graves of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Maloney of New York. Mr. Maloney votes no. Mr. Maloney of New York votes no. Mr. Rouser. Aye. Mr. Rouser votes aye. Mr. Huffman. Huffman votes no. Mr. Huffman votes no. Mr. Bost. Mr. Bost votes aye. Ms. Brownlee of California. Ms. Brownlee votes no. Ms. Brownlee of California votes no. Mr. Weber of Texas. Weber votes aye. Mr. Weber of Texas votes aye. Ms. Wilson of Florida. Uh, someone might be unmuted there. Uh, if you could just wait until it's your turn to vote. Thank you. Wilson of Florida votes no. Ms. Wilson of Florida votes no. Mr. Lamalfa. Lamalfa, aye. Ms. Lamalfa votes aye. Mr. Payne. Mr. Payne votes no. no. Mr. Payne votes no. Mr. Westerman. Mr. Westman votes aye. Mr. Lowenthal. Mr. Lowenthal votes no. Mr. Lowenthal votes no. Mr. Smucker. Aye. Mr. Smucker votes aye. Mr. DeSaunier. Mr. Mitchell. Ms. Plaskett. Plaskett votes no. Ms. Plaskett votes no. Mr. Mast. Mr. Mast votes aye. Mr. Lynch. No. Mr. Lynch votes no. Mr. Gallagher. Gallagher votes yes. Mr. Gallagher votes aye. Mr. Carbajal. Carbajal votes no. Mr. Carbajal votes no. Mr. Palmer. Mr. Palmer votes aye. Mr. Brown of Maryland. Mr. Brown of Maryland votes in the negative. No. Mr. Brown of Maryland votes no. Mr. Fitzpatrick. No. Mr. Fitzpatrick votes no. Mr. Espelot. 
Espaillat votes no. Espaillat votes no. Ms. Gonzalez Colon of Puerto Rico. Ms. Gonzalez Colon votes aye. Ms. Gonzalez Colon of Puerto Rico votes aye. Mr. Malinowski. Malinowski votes no. Mr. Malinowski votes no. Mr. Balderson. Alderson, yay. The gentleman repeat. Alderson, yes. Mr. Balderson votes aye. Mr. Stanton. Mr. Stanton votes no. Mr. Stanton votes no. Mr. Spano. Mr. Spano votes aye. Ms. McCarcel Powell. McCarcel Powell votes no. Ms. McCarcel Powell votes no. Mr. Stauber. Mr. Stauber votes aye. Mr. Stauber votes aye. Mrs. Fletcher. Fletcher votes no. Mrs. Fletcher votes no. Mrs. Miller. Aye. Mrs. Miller votes aye. Mr. Allred. Mr. Allred votes no. Mr. Allred votes no. Mr. Pence. Aye. Mr. Pence votes aye. Ms. Davids of Kansas. Davids votes no. Ms. Davids of Kansas votes no. Ms. Finkenauer. Finkenauer votes no. Spinkenauer votes no. Mr. Garcia of Illinois. Garcia votes no. Mr. Garcia of Illinois votes no. Mr. Delgado. Mr. Pappas. Pappas votes no. Mr. Pappas, Pappas votes no. Ms. Craig. Craig votes no. Ms. Craig votes no. Mr. Ruda. Ruda votes no. Mr. Ruda votes no. Mr. Lamb. Mr. Lamb votes no. Mr. Lamb votes no. Ms. Norton. Norton votes no. Ms. Norton votes no. Mr. Young. Mr. Webster of Florida. Mr. Massey. Massey votes yes. Mr. Massey votes aye. Mr. Katko. Mr. De Saunier. Craig votes no. Ms. Craig. Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Delgado. Yes. Mr. I'm on. Sorry. I vote, I vote no. Mr. Delgado votes no. Have all members uh, voted who wish to vote? Did we miss anyone? All members having cast their votes? Uh, does Mr. Mitchell wish to be recorded? The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Webster. Yay. Mr. Webster votes aye. <clears throat> Clerk will report the vote. Cat, cat, could Catco report his vote? Catco? Yes, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, Catco votes no. Mr. Catco votes no. Any other members that uh, have not been able to record their vote? All right, the clerk will now report the vote. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there are 25 yeas and 38 noes. The amendment is not adopted. The 
question is now on agreeing to the amendment offered by Mr. Gibbs, number 027, on which the noes prevail. Is a recorded vote still requested? Yes. Yes. The clerk will call the roll. Members are reminded to have their cameras on and clearly state your name when called upon by the clerk to record your vote. And please keep your microphone off until your name is called. Thank you. Mr. DeFazio. No. Mr. DeFazio votes no. Mr. Graves of Missouri. Mr. Graves of Missouri votes aye. Ms. Norton. Norton votes no. Ms. Norton votes no. Mr. Young. Ms. Johnson of Texas. Johnson of Texas votes no. Ms. Johnson of Texas votes no. Mr. Crawford. Crawford, aye. Mr. Crawford votes aye. Mr. Larson of Washington. Uh, Larson votes no. Mr. Larson of Washington votes no. Mr. Gibbs. Gibbs votes aye. Mr. Gibbs votes aye. Mrs. Napolitano. Napolitano votes no. Mrs. Napolitano votes no. Mr. Webster of Florida. Yay. Mr. Webster of Florida votes aye. Mr. Lipinski. Lipinski votes no. Mr. Lipinski votes no. Mr. Massey. Aye. Mr. Massey votes aye. Mr. Cohen. Cohen, no. Mr. Cohen votes no. Mr. Perry. Mr. Perry votes aye. Mr. Ceres. Mr. votes no. Mr. Ceres votes no. Mr. Davis of Illinois. Mr. Davis of Illinois votes aye. Mr. Garamendi. Mr. Garamendi votes no. Mr. Garamendi votes no. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Woodall votes aye. Will the gentleman repeat. Mr. Woodall votes aye. Mr. Woodall votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Mr. Johnson votes no. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Katko. Mr. Katko votes no. Mr. Katko votes no. Mr. Carson of Indiana. Mr. Carson votes no. Mr. Carson of Indiana votes no. Mr. Babin. Mr. Babin votes aye. Ms. Titus. Titus votes no. Ms. Titus votes no. Mr. Graves of Louisiana. Mr. Maloney of New York. Maloney votes no. Mr. Maloney of New York votes no. Mr. Rouser. Aye. Mr. Rouser votes aye. Mr. Huffman. Huffman votes no. Mr. Huffman votes no. Mr. Boss. Mr. Boss votes aye. Ms. Brownlee of California. Ms. Brownlee votes no. Ms. Brownlee of California votes no. Mr. Weber of Texas. Weber votes aye. Mr. Weber of Texas votes aye. Ms. Wilson of Florida. Wilson of Florida votes no. Ms. Wilson of Florida votes no. Mr. LaMalfa. LaMalfa, aye. Mr. LaMalfa votes aye. Mr. Payne. Mr. Payne votes no. Mr. Payne votes no. Mr. Westerman. <clears throat> Mr. Westerman votes aye. Mr. Lowenthal. Mr. Lowenthal votes no. Mr. Lowenthal votes no. Mr. Smucker. Smucker votes aye. Mr. Smucker votes aye. Mr. DeSaunier. Mr. Mitchell. Ms. Plaskett. Plaskett votes no. Ms. Plaskett votes no. Mr. Mast. Mr. Mast votes aye. Mr. Lynch. Mr. Lynch votes no. Mr. Gallagher. Gallagher votes yes. Mr. Gallagher votes aye. Mr. Carbajal. Carbajal votes no. Mr. Carbajal votes no. Mr. Palmer. Mr. Palmer votes aye. Mr. Brown of Maryland. Mr. Brown votes no. Mr. Brown of Maryland votes no. Mr. Fitzpatrick. No. Mr. Fitzpatrick votes no. Mr. Espelot. Espelot votes no. Mr. Espelot votes no. Ms. Gonzalez Colon of Puerto Rico. Gonzalez Colon votes no. 
Ms. Gonzalez, Colonial Puerto Rico votes no. Mr. Malinowski. Mr. Balderson. Mr. Balderson votes aye. Mr. Stanton. Stanton votes no. Mr. Stanton votes no. Mr. Spano. Mr. Spano votes aye. Ms. Mucarso Powell. Yeah. Mucarso Powell votes no. Ms. Mucarso Powell votes no. Mr. Stauber. Mr. Stauber votes aye. Mr. Stauber votes aye. Mrs. Fletcher. Fletcher votes no. Mrs. Fletcher votes no. Mrs. Miller. Aye. Mrs. Miller votes aye. Mr. Allred. No. Mr. Allred votes no. Mr. Pence. Mr. Pence votes aye. Ms. Davids of Kansas. Davids votes no. Ms. Davids of Kansas votes no. Ms. Finkenauer. Finkenauer votes no. Ms. Finkenauer votes no. Mr. Garcia of Illinois. Garcia votes no. Mr. Garcia of Illinois votes no. Mr. Delgado. Delgado votes no. Mr. Delgado votes no. Mr. Pappas. Pappas votes no. Mr. Pappas votes no. Ms. Craig. Craig votes no. Ms. Craig votes no. Mr. Ruda. Ruda votes no. Mr. Ruda votes no. Mr. Lamb. Mr. Lamb votes no. Mr. Lamb votes no. Mr. Young. Mr. DeSaunier. Mr. Graves, Louisiana. Mr. Graves, Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Malinowski. Malinowski votes no. Mr. Malinowski votes no. Any other members wish to be recorded? All members having cast their votes, the clerk will report the vote. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there are 24 yeas and 39 noes. In the opinion of the chair, the amendment is not agreed to. The question is now one agreeing to the amendment offered by Mr. Stauber, number 031, on which the no's prevailed. Is a recorded vote still requested? Yes. The clerk will call the roll. Members are reminded to have their cameras on and to clearly state your name when called upon by the clerk. To record your vote, please keep your microphone off until your name is called. Mr. DeFazio. Mr. DeFazio votes no. Mr. Graves of Missouri. Graves of Missouri votes aye. Ms. Norton. Norton votes no. Ms. Norton votes no. Mr. Young. Ms. Johnson of Texas. Johnson of Texas votes no. Ms. Johnson of Texas votes no. Mr. Crawford. Crawford aye. Mr. Crawford votes aye. Mr. Larson of Washington. Larson votes no. Mr. Larson of Washington votes no. Mr. Gibbs. Gibbs, aye. Mr. Gibbs votes aye. Mrs. Napolitano. Napolitano, no. Mrs. Napolitano votes no. Mr. Webster of Florida. Mr. Webster of Florida votes <laughs> aye. Mr. Lipinski. Votes no. Lipinski votes no. Mr. Lipinski votes no. Mr. Massey. Aye. Mr. Massey votes aye. Mr. Cohen. Cohen votes no. Mr. Cohen votes no. Mr. Perry. Mr. Perry votes aye. Mr. Ceres. Perry votes no. Mr. Ceres votes no. Mr. Davis of Illinois.
Mr. Davis of Illinois votes aye. Mr. Garamendi. Mr. Garamendi votes no. Mr. Garamendi votes no. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Woodall votes aye. Mr. Woodall votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Ms. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Katko. Mr. Katko votes aye. Mr. Katko votes aye. Mr. Carson of Indiana. Mr. Carson votes no. Mr. Carson of Indiana votes no. Mr. Bavin. Bavin votes aye. Ms. Titus. Titus votes no. Titus votes no. Mr. Graves of Louisiana. Mr. Graves of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Maloney of New York. Maloney votes no. Mr. Maloney of New York votes no. Mr. Rouser. Aye. Mr. Rouser votes aye. Mr. Huffman. Huffman votes no. Mr. Huffman votes no. Mr. Bost. Mr. Bost votes aye. Ms. Brownlee of California. Ms. Brownlee votes no. Ms. Brownlee votes no. Mr. Weber of Texas. Weber votes aye. Mr. Weber of Texas votes aye. Ms. Wilson of Florida. Wilson of Florida votes no. Ms. Wilson of Florida votes no. Mr. LaMalfa. LaMalfa, aye. Mr. LaMalfa votes aye. Mr. Payne. Mr. Payne votes no. Mr. Payne votes no. Mr. Westerman. Mr. Westerman votes aye. Mr. Lowenthal. Lowenthal votes no. Mr. Lowenthal votes no. Mr. Smucker. Smucker, aye. Mr. Smucker votes aye. Mr. DeSaunier. Mr. Mitchell. Ms. Ms. Flaskett. Mr. Mast. Flaskett votes no. Ms. Flaskett votes no. Mr. Mast. Mr. Mast votes aye. Mr. Lynch. Mr. Lynch votes no. Mr. Gallagher. Gallagher votes yes. Mr. Gallagher votes aye. Mr. Carbajal. All Mr. votes no. Mr. Carbajal votes no. Mr. Palmer. Mr. Palmer votes aye. Mr. Brown of Maryland. Mr. Brown votes no. Mr. Brown of Maryland votes no. Mr. Fitzpatrick. No. Mr. Fitzpatrick votes no. Mr. Espaillat votes no. Mr. Espaillat votes no. Ms. Gonzalez Colon of Puerto Rico. Gonzalez votes yes. Ms. Gonzalez Colon of Puerto Rico votes aye. Mr. Malinowski. Malinowski votes no. Mr. Malinowski votes no. Mr. Balderson. Mr. Balderson votes aye. Mr. Stanton. Stanton votes no. Mr. Stanton votes no. Mr. Spano. Mr. Spano votes aye. Ms. McCarcel Powell. McCarcel Powell votes no. Ms. McCarcel Powell votes no. Mr. Stauber. Mr. Stauber votes aye. Mr. Stauber votes aye. Mrs. Fletcher. Fletcher votes no. Fletcher votes no. Mr. Mrs. Miller. Aye. Mrs. Miller votes aye. Mr. Allred. Mr. Allred votes no. Mr. Allred votes no. Mr. Pence. Aye. Mr. Pence votes aye. Ms. Davids of Kansas. Davids votes no. Ms. Davids of Kansas votes no. Ms. Finkenauer. Finkenauer votes no. Ms. Finkenauer votes no. Mr. Garcia of Illinois. Garcia votes no. Mr. Garcia of Illinois votes no. Mr. Delgado. Delgado votes no. Mr. Delgado votes no. Mr. Pappas. Pappas votes no. Mr. Pappas votes no. Ms. Craig. Craig votes no. Ms. Craig votes no. Mr. Ruda. Ruda votes no. Mr. Ruda votes no. Mr. Lamb. Mr. Lamb votes no. Mr. Lamb votes no. Mr. Young. Mr. DeSaunier. Mr. Mitchell.
Do any other members wish to cast their vote? All members having cast their vote, the clerk will now report the vote. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there are 26 yeas and 37 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. The question is now on agreeing to the amendment offered by Mr. Starber, number 043, on which the noes prevailed. Is a recorded vote still requested? It is, Mr. Chair. The clerk will now call the roll. Mr. DeFazio. Mr. DeFazio votes no. Mr. Graves of Missouri. Aye. Mr. Graves of Missouri votes aye. Ms. Norton. Norton votes no. Ms. Norton votes no. Mr. Young. Ms. Johnson of Texas. Johnson of Texas votes no. Ms. Johnson of Texas votes no. Mr. Crawford. Crawford, aye. Mr. Crawford votes aye. Mr. Larson of Washington. Larson votes aye. Mr. Larson of Washington votes aye. Mr. Gibbs. Gibbs votes aye. Mr. Gibbs votes aye. Mrs. Napolitano. Napolitano, no. Mrs. Napolitano votes no. Mr. Webster of Florida. Yay. Mr. Webster of Florida votes aye. Mr. Lipinski. Lipinski votes present. Mr. Lipinski votes present. Mr. Massey. No. Mr. Massey votes no. Mr. Cohen. Pass. Mr. Perry. Mr. Perry votes aye. Mr. Sirez. Uh, Barbara, let me phone you right back. I got to pay yeah, attention. Okay. 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 Mr. Davis of Illinois. Mr. Davis of Illinois votes aye. Mr. Garamendi. Uh, Garamendi votes no. Mr. Garamendi votes no. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Woodall votes aye. Mr. Woodall votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Johnson votes no. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Katko. Mr. Katko votes aye. Mr. Kako votes aye. Mr. Carson of Indiana. Mr. Carson votes no. Mr. Carson of Indiana votes no. Mr. Babin. Mr. Babin votes aye. Ms. Titus. Mr. Graves of Louisiana. Mr. Graves of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Maloney of New York. Maloney votes no. Mr. Maloney of New York votes no. Mr. Rouser. Aye. Mr. Rouser votes aye. Mr. Huffman. Huffman votes no and then mutes. Hint, hint. Mr. Huffman votes no. Mr. Bost. Mr. Bost votes aye. Ms. Brownlee of California. Mr. Weber of Texas. Weber votes aye and says he's glad Huffman muted. Mr. Weber of Texas votes aye. Ms. Wilson of Florida. Wilson of Florida votes no. Ms. Wilson of Florida votes no. Mr. LaMalfa. Aye. Mr. LaMalfa votes aye. Mr. Payne. Mr. Payne of New Jersey votes no, then mute. Mr. Payne votes no. Mr. Westerman. Mr. Westerman votes aye. Mr. Lowenthal. Lowenthal votes no. Mr. Lowenthal votes no. Mr. Smucker. Mr. Smucker, aye. Mr. Smucker votes aye. Mr. DeSaunier. Mr. Mitchell. Ms. Plaskett. Plaskett votes aye. Ms. Plaskett votes aye. Mr. Mast. Mr. Mast votes aye. Mr. Lynch. Mr. Lynch votes no. Mr. Gallagher. Gallagher votes aye. Mr. Gallagher votes aye. Mr. Carbajal. Carbajal votes no. Mr. Carbajal votes no. Mr. Palmer. Mr. Palmer votes aye. Mr. Brown of Maryland. Mr. Brown votes no. Mr. Brown of Maryland votes no. Mr. Fitzpatrick. Aye. Mr. Fitzpatrick votes aye. 
Mr. Espelot. Espelot votes no. Mr. Espelot votes no. Ms. Gonzalez Colon of Puerto Rico. Gonzalez Colon votes aye. Ms. Gonzalez Colon of Puerto Rico votes aye. Mr. Malinowski. He votes no. Mr. Malinowski votes no. Mr. Balderson. Mr. Balderson votes aye. Mr. Stanton. Stanton votes no. Mr. Stanton votes no. Mr. Spano. Mr. Spano votes aye. Ms. Mucarso Powell. Mucarso Powell, no. Ms. Mucarso Powell votes no. Mr. Stauber. Mr. Stauber votes aye. Mr. Stauber votes aye. Mrs. Fletcher. Fletcher votes no. Ms. Fletcher votes no. Mrs. Miller. Aye. Mrs. Miller votes aye. Mr. Allred. Allred votes no. Mr. Allred votes no. Mr. Pence. Aye. Mr. Pence votes aye. Ms. Davids of Kansas. Davids votes no. Ms. Davids of Kansas votes no. Ms. Finkenauer. Aye. Finkenauer votes aye. Ms. Finkenauer votes aye. Mr. Garcia of Illinois. Garcia votes no. Mr. Garcia of Illinois votes no. Mr. Delgado. Delgado votes no. Mr. Delgado votes no. Mr. Pappas. Pappas votes no. Mr. Pappas votes no. Ms. Craig. Craig votes no. Ms. Craig votes no. Mr. Ruda. Ruda votes no. Mr. Ruda votes no. Mr. Lamb. Mr. Lamb votes yes. The gentleman repeat. Mr. Lamb votes yes. Mr. Lamb votes aye. Mr. Young. Mr. Cohen. You're not on mute. Come on, vote aye. Mr. Cohen votes aye. Mr. Siraz. Ms. Titus. I think you muted. Titus votes no. Ms. Titus votes no. Mr. Siraz. Mr. Sears, I believe you're muted. Mr. Sears votes no. Mr. Sears votes no. Ms. Brownlee of California. Ms. Brownlee votes no. Ms. Brownlee of California votes no. Mr. De Saunier. Mr. Mitchell. Do any other members wish to cast their vote? This is Mr. Payne. How am I recorded? The gentleman is recorded as no. Thank you. All members having cast their vote, the clerk will now report the vote. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 31 yeas, 31 noes, and one voting present. Can you repeat that again? 31 yeas, 31 noes, and one voting present. The motion is not adopted. The question is now on agreeing to the amendment offered by Mr. Stauber number 045 on which the nose prevailed. Is a recorded vote still requested? It is, Mr. Chair. The clerk will now call the roll. Mr. DeFazio. Mr. DeFazio votes no. Mr. Graves of Missouri. Mr. Graves of Missouri votes aye. Ms. Norton. Norton votes no. Ms. Norton votes no. Mr. Young. Ms. Johnson of Texas. Johnson of Texas votes no. Ms. Johnson of Texas votes no. Mr. Crawford. Crawford, aye. Mr. Crawford votes aye. Mr. Larson of Washington. Larson votes no. Mr. Larson of Washington votes no. Mr. Gibbs. Gibbs, aye. Mr. Gibbs votes aye. Mrs. Napolitano. 
Napolitano, no. Ms. Napolitano votes no. Mr. Webster of Florida. Yay. Mr. Webster of Florida votes aye. Mr. Lipinski. Lipinski votes no. Mr. Lipinski votes no. Mr. Massey. Aye. Mr. Massey votes aye. Mr. Cohen. No. Mr. Cohen votes no. Mr. Perry. Aye. Mr. Perry votes aye. Mr. Ceres. He votes no. Mr. Ceres votes no. Mr. Davis of in Illinois. Aye. Mr. Davis of Illinois votes aye. Mr. Garamendi. Mr. Garamendi votes no. Mr. Garamendi votes no. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Woodall votes aye. Mr. Woodall votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Mr. Johnson votes no. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Katko. Mr. Katko votes aye. Mr. Katko votes aye. Mr. Carson of Indiana. Mr. Carson votes no. Mr. Carson of Indiana votes no. Mr. Babin. Mr. Babin votes aye. Ms. Titus. Titus votes no. Ms. Titus votes no. Mr. Graves of Louisiana. Mr. Graves of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Maloney of New York. Maloney votes no. Mr. Maloney of New York votes no. Mr. Rouser. Aye. Mr. Rouser votes aye. Mr. Huffman. Huffman votes no. Mr. Huffman votes no. Mr. Boss. Mr. Boss votes aye. Ms. Brownlee of California. Ms. Brownlee votes no. Ms. Brownlee of California votes no. Mr. Weber of Texas. Weber votes aye. Ms. Weber of Texas votes aye. Ms. Wilson of Florida. Ms. Wilson of Florida votes no. Ms. Wilson of Florida votes no. Mr. LaMalfa. LaMalfa aye. Ms. LaMalfa votes aye. Mr. Payne. Mr. Payne votes no. Mr. Payne votes no. Mr. Westerman. Mr. Westerman votes aye. Mr. Lowenthal. Lowenthal votes no. Mr. Lowenthal votes no. Mr. Smucker. Smucker aye. Mr. Smucker votes aye. Mr. DeSaunier. Mr. Mitchell. Ms. Plaskett. Plaskett votes no. Ms. Plaskett votes no. Mr. Mast. Mr. Lynch. No. Mr. Lynch votes no. Mr. Gallagher. Gallagher votes yes. Mr. Gallagher votes aye. Mr. Carbajal. Carbajal votes no. Mr. Carbajal votes no. Mr. Palmer. Mr. Palmer votes aye. Mr. Brown of Maryland. Mr. Brown votes no. Mr. Brown of Maryland votes no. Mr. Fitzpatrick. No. Mr. Fitzpatrick votes no. Mr. Espilot. Espilot votes no. Mr. Espilot votes no. Ms. Gonzalez Colon of Puerto Rico. Gonzalez Colon votes aye. Ms. Gonzalez Colon of Puerto Rico votes aye. Mr. Malinowski. Malinowski votes no. Mr. Malinowski votes no. Mr. Balderson. Balderson votes aye. Mr. Stanton. Stanton votes no. Mr. Stanton votes no. Mr. Spano. Mr. Spano votes aye. Ms. Mucarso Powell. Mr. Stauber. Mr. Stauber votes aye. Mr. Stauber votes aye. Mrs. Fletcher. Fletcher votes no. Mrs. Fletcher votes no. Mrs. Miller. Aye. Mrs. Miller votes aye. Mr. Allred. Allred votes no. Mr. Allred votes no. Mr. Pence. Aye. Mr. Pence votes aye. Ms. Davids of Kansas. Davids votes no. Ms. Davids of Kansas votes no. Ms. Finkenauer. Finkenauer votes no. Ms. Finkenauer votes no. Mr. Garcia of Illinois. Garcia votes no. Did the gentleman repeat? Garcia votes no. Mr. Garcia of Illinois votes no. Mr. Delgado. Delgado votes no. Mr. Delgado votes no. Mr. Pappas. Pappas votes no. Mr. Pappas votes no. Ms. Craig. Craig votes no. 
Ms. Craig votes no. Mr. Ruda. Ruda votes no. Mr. Ruda votes no. Mr. Lamb. Mr. Lamb votes no. Mr. Lamb votes no. Mr. Young. Mr. DeSaunier. Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Mast. Mr. Mast votes no. Ms. McCarcel Powell. McCarcel Powell votes no. Ms. McCarcel Powell votes no. Do any other members wish to be recorded? All members having cast their votes, the clerk will report the vote. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 25 yeas and 38 noes. The amendment is not adopted. The question is now on agreeing to the amendment offered by Mr. Stauber, number 046, on which the noes prevailed. Is a recorded vote still requested? It is, Mr. Chair. The clerk will now call the roll. Mr. DeFazio. Mr. Graves of Missouri. Mr. Graves of Missouri votes aye. Ms. Norton. Norton votes no. Ms. Norton votes no. Mr. Young. Ms. Johnson of Texas. Johnson of Texas votes no. Ms. Johnson of Texas votes no. Mr. Crawford. Crawford, aye. Mr. Crawford votes aye. Mr. Larson of Washington. Larson votes aye. Mr. Was Mr. Larson of Washington votes aye. Mr. Gibbs. Gibbs, aye. Mr. Gibbs votes aye. Mrs. Napolitano. Napolitano, no. Mrs. Napolitano votes no. Mr. Webster of Florida. Yay. Mr. Webster of Florida votes aye. Mr. Lipinski. Lipinski votes present. Mr. Lipinski votes present. Mr. Massey. Aye. Mr. Massey votes aye. Mr. Cohen. Aye. Cohen, aye. The gentleman repeat. Yes. Mr. Cohen votes aye. Mr. Perry. That too. Mr. Perry votes aye. Mr. Ceres. Perry votes no. Mr. Ceres votes no. Mr. Davis of Illinois. Mr. Davis of Illinois votes aye. Mr. Garamendi. Garamendi votes aye. Mr. Garamendi votes aye. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Woodall votes aye. Mr. Woodall votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Mr. Katko. Johnson passes. Mr. Katko. Mr. Katko votes aye. Mr. Katko votes aye. Mr. Carson of Indiana. Mr. Carson votes no. Mr. Carson of Indiana votes no. Mr. Babin. Mr. Babin votes aye. Ms. Titus. Titus votes no. Ms. Titus votes no. Mr. Graves of Louisiana. Mr. Graves of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Maloney of New York. Maloney votes aye. Mr. Maloney of New York votes aye. Mr. Rouser. Aye. Mr. Rouser votes aye. Mr. Huffman. Huffman votes aye. Mr. Huffman votes aye. Mr. Bost. Mr. Bost votes aye. Ms. Brownlee of California. Ms. Brownlee votes aye. Ms. Brownlee of California votes aye. Mr. Weber of Texas. Weber votes aye. Mr. Weber of Texas votes aye. Ms. Wilson of Florida. Ms. Wilson of Florida votes aye. Ms. Wilson of Florida votes aye. Mr. LaMalfa. 
LaMalfa, aye. Mr. LaMalfa votes aye. Mr. Payne. Mr. Payne votes no. Mr. Payne votes no. Mr. Westerman. Mr. Chairman, is this, is this Stauber 46 that prevents uh, minerals sourced by child labor? Yes, that's correct. Yep. I vote aye. Mr. Westerman votes aye. Mr. Lowenthal. Gentleman is muted. I think he's thinking it over. Just go ahead. Mr. Smucker. Smucker, aye. Mr. Smucker votes aye. Mr. DeSaunier. Mr. Mitchell. Ms. Plaskett. Plaskett votes aye. Ms. Plaskett votes aye. Mr. Mast. Mr. Mast votes aye. Mr. Lynch. Aye. Mr. Lynch votes aye. Mr. Gallagher. Aye. Mr. Gallagher votes aye. Carbajal. Carbajal votes aye. Mr. Carbajal votes aye. Mr. Palmer. Mr. Palmer votes aye. Mr. Brown of Maryland. Mr. Brown votes no. Mr. Brown of Maryland votes no. Mr. Fitzpatrick. Aye. aye. Mr. Fitzpatrick votes aye. Mr. Espelot. Mr. Espelot votes aye. Mr. Espelot votes aye. Ms. Gonzalez Colon of Puerto Rico. Gonzalez Colon votes aye. Ms. Gonzalez Colon of Puerto Rico votes aye. Mr. Malinowski. Malinowski votes aye. Mr. Malinowski votes aye. Mr. Balderson. Mr. Balderson votes aye. Mr. Stanton. Stanton votes no. Mr. Stanton votes no. Mr. Spano. Mr. Spano votes aye. Ms. McCarcel Powell. McCarcel Powell votes aye. Ms. McCarcel Powell votes aye. Mr. Stauber. Mr. Stauber votes aye. Mr. Stauber votes aye. Mrs. Fletcher. Fletcher votes no. Ms. Fletcher, Mrs. Fletcher votes no. Mrs. Miller. Aye. Miller votes aye. Mr. Allred. Allred votes no. Mr. Allred votes no. Mr. Pence. Aye. Pence votes aye. Ms. Davids of Kansas. Davids votes no. Ms. Davids of Kansas votes no. Ms. Finkenauer. Finkenauer votes yes. Ms. Finkenauer votes aye. Mr. Garcia of Illinois. Garcia votes no. Mr. Garcia of Illinois votes no. Mr. Delgado. Delgado votes aye. Mr. Delgado votes aye. Mr. Pappas. Pappas votes aye. Mr. Pappas votes aye. Ms. Craig. Craig votes aye. Mr. Craig votes aye. Mr. Ruda. Ruda votes yes. Mr. Ruda votes aye. Mr. Lamb. Mr. Lamb votes yes. Mr. Lamb votes aye. Mr. DeFazio. No. Mr. DeFazio votes no. Mr. Young. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Lowenthal. Lowenthal votes no. Mr. Lowenthal votes no. Mr. DeSaunier. Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Chair, <clears throat> not sure who's asking for the general lady's it's, recognized. It's Congress Wilson of Florida, is this number forty nine? It is zero four six. Offered by Mr. Starber. I wish to change my vote to no. Ms. Wilson of Florida votes no. Mr. Chairman, uh, Huffman would like to correct his vote and change it to no as well. Mr. Huffman votes no.
Mr. Mr. Cohen's going to follow Mr. Huffman's lead. Vote no. Mr. Cohen is now recorded as no. Do you, any other members wish to be recorded? Do any other members wish to change their vote? All members having cast their vote, the clerk will call the vote. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 43 yeas, 19 noes, and one voting present. The amendment is adopted. The question is now on agreeing to the amendment offered by Mr. Bost, numbered 049, on which the noes prevailed. Is a recorded vote still requested? For the property rights of people, yes, Chairman. The clerk will now call the roll. Mr. DeFazio. Mr. Graves of Missouri. Mr. Graves of Missouri votes aye. Ms. Norton. Norton votes no. Ms. Norton votes no. Mr. Young. Ms. Johnson of Texas. Johnson of Texas votes no. Ms. Johnson of Texas votes no. Mr. Crawford. Crawford, aye. Mr. Crawford votes aye. Mr. Larson of Washington. Larson votes no. Mr. Larson of Washington votes no. Mr. Gibbs. Gibbs, aye. Mr. Gibbs votes aye. Mrs. Napolitano. Napolitano, no. Mrs. Napolitano votes no. Mr. Webster of Florida. Yay. Mr. Webster of Florida votes aye. Mr. Lipinski. Lipinski votes no. Mr. Lipinski votes no. Mr. Massey. Aye. Mr. Massey votes aye. Mr. Cohen. Cohen, no. Mr. Cohen votes no. Mr. Perry. Aye. Mr. Perry votes aye. Mr. Ceres. Siri votes no. Mr. Ceres votes no. Mr. Davis of Illinois. Mr. Davis of Illinois votes aye. Mr. Garamendi. Garamendi votes no. Mr. Garamendi votes no. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Woodall votes aye. Mr. Woodall votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Johnson votes no. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Katko. Go vote yes. Mr. Katko votes aye. Mr. Carson of Indiana. No. Mr. Carson, Carson of Indiana votes no. votes no. Mr. Babin. Mr. Babin votes aye. Ms. Titus. Titus votes no. Ms. Titus votes no. Mr. Graves of Louisiana. Mr. Graves of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Maloney of New York. Maloney votes no. Mr. Maloney of New York votes no. Mr. Rouser. Aye. Mr. Rouser votes aye. Mr. Huffman. Huffman votes no. Mr. Huffman votes no. Mr. Bost. Mr. Bost votes aye. Ms. Brownlee of California. Ms. Brownlee votes no. Ms. Brownlee of California votes no. Mr. Weber of Texas. Weber votes aye. Mr. Weber of Texas votes aye. Ms. Wilson of Florida. Ms. Wilson of Florida votes no. Ms. Wilson of Florida votes no. Mr. LaMalfa. LaMalfa aye. Mr. LaMalfa votes aye. Mr. Payne. Mr. Payne votes no. Mr. Payne votes no. Mr. Westerman. Mr. Westerman votes aye. Mr. Lowenthal. Mr. Smucker. Smucker aye. Mr. Smucker votes aye. Mr. DeSaunier. Mr. Mitchell. Ms. Plaskett. Plaskett votes no. Ms. Plaskett votes no. Mr. Mast. Mr. Mast votes aye. Mr. Lynch. Mr. Lynch votes no. Mr. Gallagher. 
Aye. Mr. Gallagher votes aye. Mr. Carbajal. Mr. Carbajal votes no. Mr. Carbajal votes no. Mr. Palmer. Mr. Palmer votes aye. Mr. Brown of Maryland. Mr. Brown votes no. Mr. Brown of Maryland votes no. Mr. Fitzpatrick. Aye. Mr. Fitzpatrick Chris, votes yeah. aye. Yeah. Mr. Espelot. Yeah. Just missed your votes no. Mr. Espelot votes no. Ms. Yeah. Gonzalez Colon of Puerto Rico. Right. Gonzalez Colon votes aye. Okay. Okay. Ms. Gonzalez Colon of Puerto Rico votes aye. Mr. Malinowski. Malinowski votes no. Mr. Malinowski votes no. Mr. Balderson. Mr. Balderson votes aye. Mr. Stanton. Stanton votes no. Mr. Stanton votes no. Mr. Spano. Mr. Spano votes aye. Ms. McCarcel Powell. Powell votes no. Mr. McCarcel Powell votes no. Mr. Stauber. Aye. Mr. Stauber votes aye. Mrs. Fletcher. Fletcher votes no. Mrs. Fletcher votes no. Mrs. Miller. Mrs. Miller votes aye. Mr. Allred. Allred votes no. Mr. Allred votes no. Mr. Pence. Aye. Mr. Pence votes aye. <laughs> Ms. Davids of Kansas. Davids votes no. Ms. Davids of Kansas votes no. Ms. Finkenauer. Finkenauer votes no. Ms. Finkenauer votes no. Mr. Garcia of Illinois. Garcia votes no. Mr. Garcia of Illinois votes no. Mr. Delgado. Delgado votes no. Mr. Delgado votes no. Mr. Pappas. Pappas votes no. Mr. Pappas votes no. Ms. Craig. Craig votes no. Mr. Craig votes no. Mr. Ruda. Ruda votes no. Mr. Ruda votes no. Mr. Lamb. Mr. Lamb votes no. Mr. Lamb votes no. Mr. DeFazio. Mr. DeFazio votes no. Mr. Young. Mr. Lowenthal. Lowenthal votes no. Mr. Lowenthal votes no. Mr. DeSaunier. Mr. Mitchell. Any other members wish to be recorded? All members having cast their vote, the clerk will report the vote. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there are 27 yeas and 36 noes. The amendment is not adopted. The question is now on agreeing to the amendment offered by Mr. Mr. Maloney number 087 on which the the a's prevail is a recorded vote still requested it is the clerk will call the roll mr defazio aye mr defazio votes aye mr graves of missouri mr graves of missouri votes aye ms norton Norton votes aye. Ms. Norton votes aye. Mr. Young. Ms. Johnson of Texas. Johnson of Texas votes aye. Okay. The gentlelady repeat. Johnson of Texas votes aye. Ms. Johnson of Texas votes aye. Mr. Crawford. Crawford, aye. Crawford votes aye. Mr. Larson of Washington. Larson votes aye. Mr. Larson of Washington votes aye. Mr. Gibbs. Gibbs votes aye. Mr. Gibbs votes aye. Mrs. Napolitano. Make sure, uh, uh, Grace, I think you were muted there. Do you want to repeat that? Tano, aye. 
Ms. Napolitano votes aye. Mr. Webster of Florida. Mr. Webster of Florida votes aye. Mr. Lipinski. Lipinski votes aye. Mr. Lipinski votes aye. Mr. Massey. Aye. Mr. Massey votes aye. Mr. Cohen. Mr. Perry. Mr. Perry votes aye. Mr. Ceres. Mr. Siri votes aye. Mr. Ceres votes aye. Mr. Davis of Illinois. Mr. Davis of Illinois votes aye. Mr. Garamendi. Garamendi votes aye. Mr. Garamendi votes aye. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Woodall votes aye. Mr. Woodall votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Johnson of Georgia aye. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes aye. Mr. Katko. Mr. Katko votes aye. Mr. Katko votes aye. Mr. Carson of Indiana. Mr. Carson, no. Mr. Carson of Indiana votes no. Mr. Babin. Mr. Babin votes aye. Ms. Titus. Titus votes aye. Ms. Titus votes aye. Mr. Graves of Louisiana. Mr. Graves of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Maloney of New York. Maloney votes aye. Ms. Maloney of New York votes aye. Mr. Rouser. Aye. Mr. Rouser votes aye. Mr. Huffman. Huffman votes aye. Mr. Huffman votes aye. Mr. Boss. Ah, where's the meatloaf? Ah. Mr. Boss votes aye. Ms. Brownlee of California. Ms. Brownlee votes aye. Ms. Brownlee of California votes aye. Mr. Weber of Texas. Weber votes aye. Does the gentleman repeat. Weber votes aye. Mr. Weber of Texas votes aye. Ms. Wilson of Florida. Ms. Wilson of Florida votes aye. Ms. Wilson of Florida votes aye. Mr. LaMalfa. LaMalfa aye. Mr. LaMalfa votes aye. Mr. Payne. The general repeat. Yes, sir. Yeah, he's buffering for some reason. Uh, why don't we go on? We'll come back to him. Mr. Westerman. Mr. Westerman votes aye. Mr. Lowenthal. Lowenthal votes aye. Mr. Lowenthal votes aye. Mr. Smucker. Smucker aye. Mr. Smucker votes aye. Mr. Desaunier. Mr. Mitchell. Ms. Plaskett. Plaskett aye. Ms. Plaskett votes aye. Mr. Mast. Mr. Mast votes aye. Mr. Lynch. Mr. Lynch votes aye. Mr. Gallagher. Aye. Mr. Gallagher votes aye. Mr. Carbajal. Carbajal votes aye. Mr. Carbajal votes aye. Mr. Palmer. Mr. Palmer votes aye. Mr. Brown of Maryland. Mr. Brown votes aye. Mr. Brown of Maryland votes aye. Mr. Fitzpatrick. Aye. Mr. Fitzpatrick votes aye. Mr. Espelot. Espelot votes aye. Mr. Espriot votes aye. Ms. Gonzalez, Colon of Puerto Rico. Gonzalez votes aye. Ms. Gonzalez, Colon of Puerto Rico votes aye. Mr. Malinowski. Malinowski votes aye. Mr. Malinowski votes aye. Mr. Balderson. Mr. Balderson votes aye. Mr. Stanton. Stanton votes aye. Mr. Stanton votes aye. Mr. Spano. Mr. Spano votes aye. Ms. Micarso Powell. Mr. Carso Powell votes yes. Ms. Micarso Powell votes aye. Mr. Stauber. Mr. Stauber votes aye. Mr. Stauber votes aye. Mrs. Fletcher. Fletcher votes aye. Mrs. Fletcher votes aye. Mrs. Miller. Aye. Mrs. Miller votes aye. Mr. Allred. 
Uh, all red votes aye. For this. All red votes aye. Mr. Pence. Aye. Mr. Pence votes aye. Mr. Ms. Davids of Kansas. Davids votes aye. Ms. Davids of Kansas Certainly. votes aye. Ms. Finkenauer. Finkenauer votes aye. Ms. Finkenauer votes aye. Mr. Garcia of Illinois. I I... Garcia votes aye. Mr. Garcia of Illinois votes aye. Mr. Delgado. Delgado votes aye. Mr. Delgado votes aye. Mr. Pappas. Pappas votes aye. Mr. Pappas votes aye. Ms. Craig. Craig votes aye. Ms. Craig votes aye. Mr. Ruda. Ruda votes aye. Mr. Ruda votes aye. Mr. Lamb. Mr. Lamb votes yes. Mr. Lamb votes aye. Mr. Young. Mr. Cohen. Cohen votes aye. Mr. Cohen votes aye. Mr. Payne. Mr. Payne, you may be muted, I'm not sure. Mr. Payne votes no. You go. Mr. Payne votes no. Mr. DeSaunier. Mr. Mitchell. Do any other members wish to be recorded? Do any members wish to change their vote? Mr. Carson's an aye. Ms. Carson of Indiana is recorded as aye. All members having cast their vote, the clerk will now report the vote. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there are 62 yeas and one no. The amendment is adopted. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. We will resume with amendments. Um, the clerk will report amendment from Ms. Finkenauer. Sorry, what? Wrong Sorry, wrong. Uh, the clerk will not report an amendment from Ms. Finkenauer. Uh, the clerk will uh, report an amendment from Mr. Graves. Uh, I believe Little Graves. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2 offered by Mr. Graves, Louisiana, numbered 129. Uh, without objection, the amendment is considered as read. The gentleman is recognized for up to three minutes to discuss his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, the, the capital, capital city of our state, um, has been rated repeatedly as, as um, having one of the greatest bottlenecks in the nation. Um, the, the, the Interstate 10 that goes from California to Florida uh, crosses over the Mississippi River. We didn't put the river there, but but we're responsible for crossing it. And and that crossing is an extraordinary. It's an extraordinary cost. Uh, it's estimated to be in excess of of one billion dollars to cross the river. Uh, we have been working, trying to pull together revenue streams from all sorts of of different sources to improve that crossing because it is again an extraordinary bottleneck for that east-west corridor from from Florida to California. And I'll say it again, one of the top bottlenecks in the nation. In fact, different traffic analyses have been done have determined that the traffic in Baton Rouge, Louisiana is worse than that of Houston, worse than that of Denver, worse than that of Chicago, uh, worse than that of Dallas, Texas, cities that have much, much greater population than we do. So what this amendment would do is, um, is it would uh, put the, uh, the, the, the major roadways through this area, uh, it would include it on the list of high priority corridors on the national highway system. Um, uh, this is supported by our state uh, Department of Transportation, uh, Secretary Sean Wilson, and um, uh, this is uh, supported by um, uh, 
Congressman Cedric Richmond, who also represents, uh, represents this region. So uh, with that, I, I yield back and uh, ask, for, ask for your adoption, your support. Uh, I would suggest that uh, we suspend a consideration of the amendment until later in the markup and see if uh, the staff claims uh, they do not have uh, any indication of concurrence from the state. And if you can obtain something by the end of the markup, I would be happy to approve the amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I, what am I doing? Uh, uh, withdraw for now. All right, I will withdraw for now based on your commitment and we'll get something to you very shortly. Uh, thank you, I, I appreciate the gentleman. Next amendment. Uh, uh, now the clerk will uh, designate Ms. Finkenauer. An amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 2 offered by Ms. Finkenauer, number 077. Thank you, Objection. Mr. Chair. The amendment is considered as read. The gentleman is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I rise right now to speak on an issue of great importance to me and to my district. Uh, this amendment would authorize $400 million for fuel pump infrastructure that supports higher blends of biofuels. Biofuels offer a proven path to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, decarbon decarbonizing the transportation sector, driving economic growth and creating good paying jobs. This would expand consumer access to cleaner burning biofuels that will save people money at the pump and save lives as the American Lung Association recognizes that biofuels reduces air pollution. Cleaner air means less lung and respiratory issues. The renewable fuels industry is also facing one of the worst crises in history as a result of COVID-19 and also because of continued attempts by President Trump and this administration to weaken the renewable fuel standard, issuing large refinery small refinery waivers to large refineries, costing our corn growers billions of bushels of corn out of the market and devastating my state. We have an ethanol plant in Cedar Rapids that is shut down while demand is starting to rise again. Plants in Iowa are function functioning right now at only 80% capacity. Expanding infrastructure for higher biofuel blends is critical to supporting farmers and rural economies like right here in Iowa One. Uh, you know, it's not just about the Midwest anymore, however. We see states across the country incentivizing the use of biofuels, using it for buses and fleets because they know it's cleaner and it reduces pollution. Even California has been looking at biofuels to meet their new clean air standards. I also want to take a moment uh, to say that it's important uh, that we continue to work with our truck stops and our gas stations. They're helping us move towards a more clean fuel economy and already making very real investments in fueling infrastructure, not only for biofuels, but also for electric vehicles. Uh, they want to do the right thing, and we need to make sure that they continue to do so. That's why I support including the Clean Fuels Deployment Act. I also think that we need to take a closer look at policies that could undercut their investments, like setting up fueling infrastructures at rest areas, which have traditionally not had commercial activities to compete with our rural businesses. It's time for us to recognize the role biofuels can play in transportation sector and reducing emissions. And I look forward to working with the chair uh, and my colleagues to do that as we move forward on this committee and happy about some of the work that got put into the manager's amendment as well. Um, and because of that, I actually plan to offer and withdraw this amendment and I yield back. Uh, I thank the gentlelady. Uh, she is an extraordinary advocate. Object, I object. Withdrawal. Uh, just hold on. I was speaking. She can withdraw. I was speaking. Uh, she is a tremendous advocate uh, for a district and uh, the lady uh, fully has the right to withdraw. The amendment is withdrawn. Proceed now to, uh, she's not back yet.
Uh, Mr. Chair? Mr. Chairman, this is Congresswoman Angie Craig. Uh, sure, since we have nothing else to do, I'd be happy to hear from the gentlelady. I mean, not being <laughs> de minimis about your speaking, but uh, you're allowed to speak while we're uh, uh, par trudging through the parliamentary wilderness. Yes, you're recognized. Excellent, excellent. Well, my question is about the parliamentary wilderness. I had uh, uh, wanted to seek recognition to speak on uh, Representative Finkenauer's amendment, but didn't see the opportunity there. And uh, I believe I heard my good colleague, Mr. Davis. So. Uh, if there's an opportunity, I'd like to, and if there's not, then uh, I will uh, uh, be done with that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. I thank the gentlelady. I'm just hoping to expedite proceedings. We just had on uh, a vote, a recorded vote on an amendment, which takes about 12 minutes, that passed with one negative vote. I'm hoping uh, to not go until uh, past dawn tomorrow morning. So I'm trying to expedite proceedings in any way we can. Uh, we are going to recess into the uh, parliamentary black hole for five minutes.
Uh, the committee will come back to order. Uh, we consulted with the House parliamentarian, and unanimous consent requests are not required for persons to withdraw their amendments. Uh, that is the definitive uh, authority. Uh, thank you. We are now all educated on that. Uh, with that, we will now uh, move on to uh, uh, Mr. Graves, Louisiana. Clerk will designate the amendment. Clerk will designate Mr. Amendment Graves. to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2, offered by Mr. Graves, Louisiana, numbered 121. Mm, yeah, I've got 130. 130. Garrett, what do you... No, no, it's 130. 121 was unblocked. Okay. They're just getting... It's one... It should be 130. Yeah, the other one was unblocked. Amendment number 130. Uh, 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 without objection, the amendment uh, is considered as read. Uh, the gentleman may proceed uh, for up to three minutes to discuss his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, once again... Um, this bill and one of the priorities that you have been vocal about is about uh, reducing emissions, reducing road miles traveled, reducing fuel consumption, and, um, and this amendment achieves all of those objectives and it, and it really just improves efficiency. Uh, bottom line, Mr. Chairman, is, is once again, whenever you drive places, you take out your phone and you, you put in, you say, I'm going from A to B, and you may use Waze or Google or, or those of you that are a um, little, little older may use MapQuest, but um, in, in any case, um, all of that data is aggregated. And what it shows is it shows where trips are beginning and where they're ending. Where trips are beginning and where they're ending. Yet, we do not use that information for our transportation planning. What we do today is we go lay the rubber hoses down on roads and we count the number of cars going across existing routes. What, the, what using that data does is it allows us to revolutionize transportation planning by looking at where people are starting and where they're ending. We don't need to just keep adding lanes and capacity to existing roads. That doesn't help us to improve, improve efficiency. What, what the amendment does is it establishes a pilot program that will take anonymous aggregated data on trips, where people st are starting and where they're ending. That way we can integrate it into transportation planning and we can build roads that more efficiently connect people with where they're starting and where they're ending. Once again, reducing road miles traveled, reducing fuel consumption, reducing tailpipe emissions. It is about using the data that is out there right now, I wanna say it again, anonymous data that's out there right now, integrating it into transportation planning and building our transportation system in a more efficient manner. Um, so that's what this does. Uh, again, pilot program. I, I don't think there's anything in here that's even remotely controversial and uh, happy to answer any questions, but I urge adoption of the amendment and yield back. Other members wish to be recognized. Hearing none, I'll recognize myself. Uh, according to what I have from the staff, uh, a similar version of this amendment was included in the bipartisan on block amendment, which focused on transportation management to improve traffic flows. Uh, and, um, you know, so our bill already authorizes significant funding for DOT to develop a variety of data not restricted to and not precluding third party user data. It most certainly would use third party use of data. Uh, I don't know where else they're going to get some of it. Uh, so I believe it's already addressed in the bill and to create a duplicative pilot program on top of the other program uh, does not uh, make sense uh, at this point in time. Uh, I am totally... Before, before the gentleman uh, objects... I, I, I will yield in a second. I'm totally supportive, and I carry on at great length about stupid traffic lights and lack of management and getting uh, more throughput with existing infrastructure. This company in my district who has uh, developed uh, uh, apps that work off if cities will share their data, some are reluctant, uh, you know, uh, synchronized light signals uh, so that you can, when it's the lights are sync, you can go, you just go right on the point on their app and you will hit every light. And if, you know, because some people speed up and then they have to stop and some people go too slow and I've driven with it, it's great. So there, there is a lot of private applications coming out there. BMW, I think, is going to include uh, their uh, technology or similar technology and others are working on it. 
there's a lot of room for improvement. Uh, I would recognize the gentleman if he can tell me that there's something absolutely unique and necessary about his amendment that isn't covered by the unblock uh, amendment in the bill. Absolutely. Well, Mr. Chairman, because the amendment that you referred to is my other amendment, um, I wouldn't do two amendments that trip over each other. The previous amendment that's in the unblock, it specifically refers to real-time data. So that would be data that your phone is transmitting to these third-party entities explaining where you started, where you go, whereas this is designed to address future transportation planning. So this, this really is apples and oranges. I promise you I wouldn't file two duplicative amendments, and um, I'm, I'm, I, I would urge adoption and uh, At this point, I'm willing to accept the amendment. Do you want the gentleman wish to speak? I'll take yes for an answer. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. No, Mr. Perry wants to speak. I can't accept it until he speaks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I Thank might you. change my mind. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm, I have a concern uh, with this real-time data that's allegedly anonymous, but somehow it, uh, it knows where I left from ostensibly possibly my home and where I'm going all the time. And with all due respect, you know, I guess if, if that's my data and I give it to a third party, whether it's BMW or Google or, or anybody, that's my decision. But for the federal government to have it without my permission and, and then use it and act like it's anonymous and that they don't know it's me and they don't know where I'm going, or I, I'm concerned about the privacy implications of, of this technology. And I want it to be as efficient as possible, but I have a hard time understanding how it's anonymous, and that would be my comment. Would the gentleman uh, yield? Oh, uh, he still has time, yes. You can yield if he will yield Mr. to you. Mr. Perry, would the gentleman yield? Just to clarify, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Perry, I, I um, what happened to the clock? fully understand and appreciate your concerns and actually share it. You can look at my voting record. I have repeatedly voted on what every single to bill to protect privacy, regardless Perry. of what our party does. Um, the amendment that we're talking about does not, does not transmit real-time data. That was actually already accepted in the on block. So your comments are absolutely applicable to the on block that was accepted. This does not do that. This takes the aggregate data and, it, and it's, it's for future transportation planning. It's not real time. Re reclaiming my time, I, I understand. I have a problem with both the real time and the, uh, the aggregated data because even the aggregated data still has a record of who I am and, and where I came from and where I'm going to. And that information in the hands of a federal government Quite honestly, especially a federal government that seems to be heading the way this one does, I'm not very comfortable with that. So my comments still stand. I thank you. Would the gentleman yield? Certainly. So if I understand correctly, your concern is that even if you just know the start point, the end point, if the start point is your house, you know who you are. The government knows who you are. You can anonymize that as much as you want, but you still are going to know who it is if you know where you started or you're going to have a pretty good idea or who my visitors might have been. I just think that's concerning stuff, and I'm not saying that there's not a way to, to deal with it. I'm just not sure that we're dealing with that in this amendment, and I think it needs to be a strong consideration. Okay, uh, does the gentleman yield back? Mr. Palmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to point out that there are legitimate uses for this data. The University of Alabama is doing something in collaboration with the State Department of Transportation uh, that I think may be the only uh, collaborative effort of its type in, in the country. And one of the things, to your point about the synchronization of, of traffic lights, is that this technology will allow the uh, flow of traffic to be monitored so that you could have a single stream of traffic lights that are all green at one time. Uh, having this type of technology available will, I think, uh, help us to make a better decisions about where we need to actually have road construction versus where we can manage the traffic flow using the technology. So I do think there's a legitimate use for it. I yield back. Gentlemen, yield. Be happy to yield. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Perry, Mr. Massey, all my friends here, the, the bill specifically says anonymous crowdsourced data, number one. But therefore, if you use your address, that would violate the, 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 clear, the clear law that, that's written here. Secondly, there is a specific section on data privacy and security. Uh, the Secretary shall ensure that the protection of privacy from all sources of data utilized in the program. Um, I'm, I am 
a privacy freak. I'm more than happy to, to add anything that addresses concerns that y'all have, but we've tried to do it in this text already. Uh, yield back to my friend from Alabama. Okay. Reclaiming my time, I want to point out that I was supportive, um, uh, if, if I may, um, I am supportive of the technology. All right. I yield uh, back. Other members. Okay, then at this point I'd speak. Uh, you know, I am uh, very much an advocate. I voted against the, the so-called USA Patriot Act in the shadow of 9-11. I think there were 54 of us because uh, people were afraid to vote against something that said USA Patriot uh, after we'd been attacked by terrorists. Uh, you know, since then I've been trying to undo the damage of the USA Patriot Act. Uh, and, uh, you know, we had uh, an opportunity uh, earlier this year, uh, and it has not yet been successful uh, under FISA reform. Uh, so I've long been on record on this. Secondly, I, you know, I don't know how many of you read it, but there was an incredible article in the New York Times uh, which showed where they went to uh, vendors who had, were selling uh, individual data similar to what uh, Mr. Perry is talking about and in the private sector uh, right now they are making available exactly what Mr. Perry feels uh, and they said oh, oh, oh don't worry we're not going to sell it to divorce lawyers or we're not going to do this we're not going to do that uh, uh, yet yeah, you, you trust the private sector at least we have some protections of the federal government we have some protections built into this bill, and, and if we delete some of the sections of FISA, we'll even have better protections, or if we go and develop enforceable privacy protections like they have in Europe for this kind of data, where you actually have to look at it and they say, we're gonna sell your data to someone, and you say, no. You don't get a chance to do that. You, 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 you have no idea how many apps you're signed up to that are running in background. Right now, they're tracking exactly where you are right now, where you've been today, and where you will be later today. And they're out there for commercial use. Uh, in this case, I think we've built in the protections. Uh, we want to avoid unnecessary construction and costs. We want to get better throughput with the existing system we have. And I mean, how many times have any of you sat at a stupid traffic light, particularly now in this town, I'm just back a couple of days, but there's no one driving around and there you are sitting there like, oh, I better not run the light because there might be a police officer somewhere who's bored who's, and um, you know, you sit there, do, 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 and there's no traffic coming. Uh, so we can do so much better. And I think the, the, the kind of protections we're built in this bill are way superior to what you've signed up with when you accept and you've signed up for an app. Uh, so uh, I do support uh, the gentleman's amendment. Uh, and, uh, you know, at that point, uh, do others wish to address the amendment? Uh, all right. Uh, are there amendments to the amendment? Uh, hearing none. Uh, those in favor of the amendment, please unmute and prepare to vote. Uh, those in favor of the amendment will say aye. 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 What? aye. Okay. Uh, thank you. Those who are opposed to the amendment, now get ready. I'll give you like five seconds to touch the little screen. Uh, those opposed to the amendment uh, will please signify by saying nay. Nay. Uh, no. In the opinion of the chair, uh, the nays have it. The nays have it. Uh, I mean, the ayes have it. Sorry. Yeah, Tim. I, you know, this has gone on too long. Yeah, you, you won for a second there. Uh, I just overruled myself. Uh, the, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Uh, let's move on to the next amendment. Okay, um, uh, the clerk will uh, designate uh, the amendment uh, from uh, Mr. Graves. Uh, and again, it doesn't, 122. 122. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR2 offered by Mr. Graves, number 122. Without objection, uh, the amendment is considered as read. The gentleman's recognized for three minutes. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll try and be very quick here. So as you know, the CARES Act provided an extraordinary amount of money for transit programs. Um, these programs, at the same time, were being told that they effectively shouldn't be used because, because we didn't want folks in close proximity, so we don't want to pack people on a bus, on a subway, or anything else. Yet they were given extraordinary funding. Uh, in some instances, transit organizations were given uh, money that exceeds their needs, exceeds their needs for the entire year. And if my calculations are right, which I'll tell you they're probably a little bit off, we found one transit organization that received money equivalent to $1,000 per ride, per ride. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we have all sat here and talked about the need for additional investment in infrastructure. I would bet that every single one of us on this committee could come up with billions of dollars in needs just in our own congressional districts. For us to be overcompensating transit districts just doesn't make sense. Um, so what this amendment does is it basically says that um, any distribution of funding under the CARES Act to transit organizations that exceeded um, uh, their, their, their FY20 formula funds was in excess of 50% of the FY20 formula funds, those funds would be redistributed um, for perhaps a better purpose, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I'll say it again, every single one of us have transportation priorities in our districts, in our states, and it does not make sense for us to overcompensate uh, certain districts. I know that, um, or I believe that folks in this room perhaps were not involved in writing the formula, but we know what the formula outcome is, and I believe that um, needs to be fixed. So I urge adoption of the amendment and yield back. Other members wish to recognize. Hearing none, uh, I'll address it. Uh, I must uh, oppose the gentleman's amendment. This uh, would be a particularly hard hit on uh, smaller transit agencies, those which serve smaller uh, towns, cities, and uh, suburban uh, areas. Uh, you know, that would be a problem number one. And there are di different estimates out there. Uh, I had the uh, MTA of New York opposed to the bill because they say we're coming nowhere near uh, meeting uh, their needs uh, and, uh, and others uh, who have complained about what's in both our service bill, what was in HEROES, and what was in CARES, and saying their losses far exceed that. In many cases, transit has taken as big of a hit uh, as aviation did uh, early on. Aviation, in some cases, has actually recovered a bit more because uh, they're not under uh, local mandates uh, for uh, business closures. Uh, so um, the uh, American Public Transit uh, Association uh, says that uh, they would have needed uh, uh, $24 billion more for all of the agencies uh, to be made hold in addition to the ones I've heard uh, uh, raising opposition to the bill, like, uh, well, I guess the MTA, in the end, after I had a conversation with the president, didn't oppose the bill, although they leaked a letter opposing the bill, but then said, well, they weren't totally opposed to the bill. Uh, so, um, in any case, uh, you know, uh, I, I believe that the uh, amendment is is not a uh, uh, fine uh, tooth comb to get at those who may have received excessive allocations. For instance, in the airport allocations in CARES, the formula was written by the Senate. Uh, they're not very good at writing legislation, and uh, a whole bunch of airports got FAA finally had to say, wait a minute, we're, 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 we're going to revisit some of this and not distribute some of these funds. Uh, this, this formula, I believe, was, was better constructed than uh, the airport formula. Uh, with that, I would oppose the amendment. Do others wish to be recognized? Uh, if not, uh, there are there amendments to the amendment? If not, uh, we will uh, proceed uh, to a vote uh, on the amendment. Uh, those who intend to vote in favor will now take this moment to unmute. All those in favor of the amendment will signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Those uh, who are opposed to the amendment will take this moment to unmute. Those who are opposed to the amendment, please signify by saying nay. 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 
Uh, in the opinion of the chair, the nays have it. The nays have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Uh, we now move to uh, uh, Amendment 39 from Mr. Lamb. Cl clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2, offered by Mr. Lamb, number 039. Uh, without objection, the amendment is considered as read. Uh, the gentleman may proceed for three minutes, up to three minutes, to support his amendment. Mr. Lamb, you need to unmute if you wish to speak in favor of your amendment. Mr. Lamb, unmute to speak in favor of your amendment or we will move on and uh, come back to you. I'm here, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate the chance to make this amendment. I believe that the main reason many of us are so supportive of an infrastructure bill at this time is the chance to create not just american jobs but good paying american jobs and the purpose of my amendment is to make sure that when we allow companies to qualify for the buy america provisions in this bill that they do so by paying their workers what they deserve um, and protecting them and their families from the economic deprivations that we've all seen in the last few months uh, we don't want companies cheating on the Buy America provisions by using uh, temporary or contract labor and definitely not by using foreign labor at U.S. manufacturing facilities. And so this amendment would tighten the definition of uh, highly skilled labor for the purpose of qualifying for the Buy America provisions and in doing so allow us to deliver on the promise that comes with this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Do other members wish to be heard on the amendment? Mr. Chair, I have an amendment to the amendment. Uh, the gentleman is recognized for its amendment to the amendment. Is the amendment to the amendment at the desk? Uh, the amendment to the amendment is here handwritten. It is at my desk, and it will be uh, handed to whomever would like it. Uh, well, I, uh, the, if the clerk would like to have it. Uh, if, it's, if it's handwritten, perhaps it's not too long, and you could read it to us. Uh, rather than explain it, I not, can, that, I can I, easily, I, not that I wouldn't trust your explanation, but words. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your, the, the faith you have in me. Uh, this is what I was trying to, to offer earlier. I, I, I will tell you, Mr. Chair, uh, what I'm concerned about is that we have a substantial amount of Republican amendments left, and I'm afraid many of our colleagues might not get a chance to offer them, and, and this is one. As earlier with Ms. Finkenauer, uh, I, as the chair of the Biofuels Caucus, I supported her amendment. I wish she wouldn't have withdrawn it. I thought it was a good amendment. And uh, the biggest problem that I have is that my amendment will strike the language in Mr. Lamb's okay. amendment because I'm afraid I won't get a chance to offer this that's at a later the, time. Uh, and that's the question I have of you, Mr. Okay. Chair. Do you think uh, we'll be able to work to get some of our Republican Republic. amendments in a, a better process? Um, I, I, in responding, if the gentleman's yielding. I am yielding. Uh, 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 we have approached the Republicans. Uh, we're uh, almost finished with Democratic amendments. I believe there's 80 plus Republican, yeah, 80 plus Republican amendments uh, pending. Uh, were each of those to be uh, shortly debated and go to a vote, uh, that would probably uh, keep us here until uh, uh, I don't know, 10 to 11 o'clock tonight. I'm determined to finish the bill today or tomorrow morning uh, without uh, uh, recessing the committee for other than a brief dinner break. Uh, we have asked the Republican side, and we've already been approached by one member who uh, wants to withdraw two amendments uh, from consideration and speak to one. Uh, if others uh, would do so or look at unblock opportunities, uh, it will be up to your side to prioritize the order of the amendments. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's uh, uh, with the amendments uh, now noticed and pending, uh, you know, I will, I will uh, move through all of them. Mr. Chair, as long as we get a commitment to consider all our amendments, we're in a very good spot, sir. And uh, since I've offered the amendment to Mr. Lamb's amendment, 
uh, let me let me talk about what it is. This is a very important issue. Still needs uh, it's one that has to do has to really it really affects states like Illinois. That oh, uh, Ron, and I'm parliamentarily challenged of your amendment to the amendment, which now apparently the clerk has a beautiful collectible handwritten copy of and needs to be designated. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Wait, let me clarify. An amendment to the amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR2 offered by Mr. Davis of Illinois. A uh, gentleman is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the faith you have in me to get that handwritten amendment crafted perfectly. I really want to thank the folks behind me because they did a great job. But this is a very important issue, and I want to make sure that we got a chance to address it at this committee. Uh, states like Illinois, other states in this nation have either chosen through voter referendum or through the legislative process to legalize recreational cannabis in those states. And I appreciate the state's rights and their ability to do so. But at the same time, we clearly have to have a test available to determine if somebody is driving while impaired from using recreational cannabis. What this amendment would do, and I'm glad I get a chance to talk about it because I wasn't sure I would be able to, and I think it's one that should garner bipartisan support. This would allow our university training centers, uh, universities across this nation, including the university in my district, the University of Illinois, they are excited to be able to try and develop this testing modality that we need in this country to understand if somebody is driving in an unsafe manner while being impaired. This amendment would allow the university training centers and that consortium to be able to work together on a test that could be utilized to ensure that we have no impaired drivers that are driving dangerous, dangerously on our roadways. So I offer this amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to my friend, Mr. Lamb, and I appreciate the consideration. This is a great issue for Republicans, Democrats. Let's make this happen, and I yield back, Mr. Chair. Uh, at this point, I've just been handed the amendment, and I wish to read it. Uh, if other members wish to address the amendment, uh, I guess they haven't seen it, so. Um, Mr. Chair, I just explained it very well. I, I thank the gentleman. Let me read it. If, how long is it? Three pages? Well, go ahead and read it so everybody knows what it is. Amendment offered by Mr. Davis of Illinois to the amendment offered by Mr. Lamb. Strike the amendment and insert the following. Page 696, line 18, insert. Including an evaluation of whether and how the use of marijuana affects an operator of a motor vehicle and the development of an objective standard for measuring marijuana impairment on an operator of a motor vehicle before the period. Page 703, after line two, insert the following. E, by inserting after paragraph four, the following. Five, collaboration. In awarding grants under this section for purposes of the research conducted in the effects of marijuana described under subsection B4A, the Secretary shall consider grant recipients with a demonstrated ability of collaboration with the National Institute on Drug Abuse and other relevant agencies. Page 703 after line 18 insert the following. Six, in subsection D, A in paragraph two. I in paragraph A by striking at the end two in subparagraph B by striking the period and inserting semicolon and, and three, by adding at the end the following. C, submit to the Committees on Transportation, Infrastructure, and Science, Space, and Technology of the House of Representatives and the Committees on Environment and Public Works and Commerce, Science, and Transportation of the Senate. A report on the status of the research conducted on the effects of marijuana described under subsection B4A of such report shall identify any procedural, regulatory, or re legal barriers to conducting meaningful marijuana impairment driving research, including the quality of marijuana and marijuana products available to researchers and B, by adding at the end the following, for definition of marijuana. In this subsection, the term marijuana has the meaning given in, given the term marijuana in section 10216 of the Controlled Substances Act. Mr. Chairman, Scaramendi. Ms. Scaramendi, recognized for three minutes. Thank you. I have a point of order. I What's have that? not seen this document and until I see this document, I do not believe we can proceed. Reading it is insufficient. All right. I would suggest that uh, the uh, author of the substitute amendment uh, take the time to get it through the Legislative Council and uh, not uh, Im 
not harm Mr. Lamb's uh, legitimate. All right. Amendment. I thank the gentleman. Um, I'm going to express it a different way. Um, we have already put very substantial resources into NHTSA who are researching this. There are a large and diverse, and I'm totally uh, supportive of UTC, uh, but uh, staff believes the way it is written, uh, it would uh, too narrowly tailor safety research in the UTC program, all safety research toward marijuana impaired driving. I believe that's an unintended consequence. If the gentleman uh, would work with staff and make it permissive, a permissive use by any UTCs which wish to pursue this individually or jointly to go through the regular process of getting their research uh, request approved, I would be willing to accept the amendment. But as, as a mandate of which could exclude or would exclude, according to staff, other safety-related research by UTCs, I can't support it. So if the gentleman is willing to work with staff and make it permissive and optional uh, among UTCs, uh, I could support it uh, later uh, if corrected. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, do you, I would have to withdraw and revise. Do you intend to allow me to withdraw and revise the secondary amendment and be able to work with you on that? Uh, I don't, I, I would rather that we add it to the list uh, rather than, because I don't want to hold up this amendment, I want to move forward. Uh, so I would allow you to withdraw, to draft it as a freestanding amendment okay. in the form I just discussed, and then we'll consider it uh, later in the bill at what, whatever order it's given to me uh, by your side of the aisle, since it'll be all Republican amendments well, I, uh, for the rest of the day, evening, and morning. I, I appreciate that, Mr. Chair. I'm willing to work with you to provide more clarity in the language. It's an important issue, and I really appreciate you giving us the clarity uh, on the direction that we're going to go the rest of this markup to. So thank you, okay. and I'll go ahead and withdraw this amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Lamb. And I also uh, appreciate Mr. Garamendi's contents. I do believe that members uh, who are remote uh, have an opportunity to see it in writing, uh, you know, uh, particularly with people with a long legislative history. One word can make a big difference. You, you are um, correct, Mr. Chair, yeah. uh, but unfortunately due to the rules that were written, with remote hearings. Uh, it, this is a problem with the remote hearing process. Yeah, we, can't, Rodney, we can't figure I, it out. I, I get that. Well, All we, right. we, I if, you, if we get this done in short order, we can get it distributed to people electronically. We have email, we have text, we'll get it out to them. Uh, with someone else seeking recognition. All right, okay. I'll pass, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with that, uh, the question is now back to the uh, amendment uh, by Mr. Lamb, yeah, uh, sorry, uh, which um, uh, I fully support. Uh, I'm uh, anything that perfects uh, the Buy American incentives in this bill uh, is an improvement on the bill, and uh, therefore uh, I uh, ex am willing to accept it. Um, and I'm going to ask at jeopardy, unanimous consent that his amendment be accepted. Hearing no objection, the amendment is accepted. <laughs> Next. Uh, the clerk will report Mr. Rouser. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 2, offer of Mr. Rouser, number 026. Uh, the amendment is considered as read without objection. The gentleman is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to be eligible for the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration's Section 405C Traffic Records Incentive Grant, states are currently required to perform a mandatory traffic records assessment every five years. This assessment consists of an audit of each state's entire traffic records program, which takes a visiting team from the administration up to a week to complete. This process has been described to me as onerous and even obsolete, not to mention costly. This amendment is supported by the Governor's Highway Safety Association and would require this assessment rather than once every five years, would require it once every 10 years. This change would lessen the burden on states while still requiring state account accountability. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Um, I'm, 
willing to accept the amendment. I'll speak to it very briefly. Uh, we have put a major emphasis on safety in this bill. Uh, I don't believe uh, that uh, moving to a longer period, given other provisions of the bill uh, for this reporting requirement, will in any way jeopardize safety or create holes in the system where people are neglecting dangerous intersections or whatever places are causing these accidents. Uh, so I'm willing to accept the amendment. Do others wish to be heard on the amendment? Uh, hearing none, uh, at this point, uh, I will ask unanimous consent that the amendment uh, be uh, adopted. Hearing no objection, the amendment is adopted. Uh, the um, clerk will report, Mr. Lynch. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of substitute to HR2, offered by Mr. Lynch, number 089. Uh, sorry, uh, the amendment uh, without objection be considered as read. The gentleman is recognized for three minutes. Thank you very much, very much Mr. Chairman. Among the uh, best parts of this bill, and there are a lot, a lot to like in this bill, uh, uh, you've taken measures that uh, encourage robust investment in climate resiliency and climate change responses. Uh, one of those items is the zero emission bus grant. And uh, in the past, this has been a, a, a precious opportunity for some of our uh, more congested and, uh, and uh, less healthful uh, uh, cities to reduce some of the pollution within those cities in, in, rapid, in uh, bus transit. The Invest in America Act provides $1.7 billion over fiscal years 2022 through 2025 to ensure our climate, uh, excuse me, our, our transit authorities are moving toward a climate friendly uh, technologies. This is a 500% increase and that is outstanding because these, these were very hard to get. Uh, most of the ones that I've got over the years I've sent down to Brockton, Massachusetts, uh, an old uh, textile town and, and shoemaking town, but uh, uh, it's had its challenges uh, in terms of uh, uh, public health and, and uh, right now suffering from one of the two top cities in Massachusetts with respect to uh, coronavirus infections and, and uh, fatalities. But uh, even though we've taken steps in the past, air pollution remains a significant problem, particularly in areas like Brockton, which is an an African-American majority city uh, that I represent, where low-income and minority Americans live. Uh, air pollution is a significant contributing factor to a variety of health disparities, including asthma, infant mortality, and heart and lung disease. And this is true across the United States. So my amendment, the bottom line here is, uh, my amendment would require that of that 500% increase that we're putting into the, uh, into the zero emission bus program, 10% um, would be dedicated to uh, initiatives that will serve predominantly low-income minority communities uh, and have transit agencies in these areas which are already working hard to make zero emission buses available for their cities uh, make great use of this additional help. So that, that's the idea here is that, you know, the, the health disparities in some of these minority and low-income areas could gain the, the greatest benefit from just, just earmarking, so to speak, or setting aside 10% of what we're doing here uh, for low-income communities that have these health disparities. So uh, that's, the, that's the essence of my, my amendment. It, it, believe me, and I, and I am very, very happy that we've got a 500% increase in this zero, mush, zero emission uh, bus program. Uh, so I don't want to be... Uh, like, I'm, I'm not grateful, but uh, I do think we could do a little bit more if we steered more of the benefit. The gentleman's to some of these, time uh, has expired. I thank the gentleman. Uh, I will, uh, I'm willing to accept uh, the, the gentleman's amendment. I just actually, uh, today, I, or somewhere time this morning, uh, when I was bringing a cup of coffee, read a new study on the impacts of pollution uh, on uh, low-income communities, uh, particularly um, um, inner city, but others, and uh, the health effects uh, on, on those persons. And I think it's uh, well justified out of the major increase in this program to set aside 10% uh, uh, for those uh, predominantly low-income communities. 
Uh, do others wish to be heard on the amendment? If not, uh, dare I ask you see on this? Okay, I didn't see anybody look negative. Uh, I would ask a unanimous consent uh, that the amendment uh, be adopted. Hearing no objection, the amendment is adopted. Thank you, I yield back. Uh, now for uh, uh, the clerk will designate uh, uh, Mr. Babin, I believe it's 43. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR2 offered by Mr. Babin, number 043. Uh, without uh, objection, the amendment is considered as read, uh, and the gentleman is recognized for three minutes to uh, explain his amendment. Yes, sir, and I think this is, uh, is this, I've got number seven zero, is that, is that correct? I've got, <laughs> well, it's written in red on mine. Uh, it's the one that goes to a uh, high priority corridor. It says Babin That's 43. Right. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. First, I want to thank my colleague and friend, Jody Arrington, my fellow Texan, for his work on this amendment. This amendment will designate the Ports to Plains Corridor in Texas, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Colorado, and a portion of the Heartland Expressway between Interstate 70 and Interstate 76 in Colorado as a future interstate. Both the Ports to Plains Corridor and the portion of the Heartland Expressway are congressionally designated high priority corridors on the national highway system and are extremely vital to North America's agriculture and energy infrastructure. These corridors not only facilitate domestic and international trade among these four states, but it also allows product to be transported in and out of top agriculture and energy producing regions. The only portion of the proposed corridor currently on the interstate highway system is Interstate 27, a short segment located in Texas between Lubbock and Amarillo. Uh, this future designation would represent significant economic development for communities in Texas, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Colorado, creating very much needed jobs and expanding the tax base in, in our rural communities. Uh, I would ask that the committee and my colleagues support this amendment. However, I would offer and withdraw this amendment if, uh, Mr. Chairman, you would, uh, could assure us that you would work with the minority as we move forward in our uh, surface bill. Uh, uh, it's similar to, but it affects, uh, uh, I recognize myself, thank you. I thank the gentleman. Sure. Uh, it's similar to, but involves different states than I believe an amendment the gentleman offered, I think it was you offered yesterday. Right. And in that one, I said, if you could get an indication of support uh, from the states. The only difference with this one that would raise an issue, and again, uh, the states would have to confirm, uh, would be that it would, you know, that the, the you know, that their concurrence with this, because it also has a uh, grandfathering of the weight limits uh, for the corridor if it was converted to interstate, uh, and so, uh, you know, we would need to have the states confirm they intend to uh, bring the route up to interstate standards because, uh, as you know, often exits, entrances have to be reconfigured, uh, sometimes bridges and, and that. Uh, yeah. So, uh, could I, ask, I could I ask one, one question, Mr. Chairman? Certainly, Mr. Chairman. If, if we amended the amendment to, to address <laughs> this specific concern on the weights, uh, uh, would you would you uh, be able to offer your support for this designation? If so, my colleagues and I are prepared to work with you and your staff to amend this amendment to achieve the inclusion of this important designation. Well, does the gentleman at this point in time have uh, concurrence from the uh, it, DOTs? It affects three three state DOTs, is it? No, sir. But we okay. will we will definitely work on that. All right, if you can get that, uh, same as there have been a number of other issues like this, uh, I'd be willing at that point to, uh, uh, to uh, get it, uh, uh, advocate for it in the manager's amendment uh, for the floor of the House. So I thank the gentleman. Yes, Does the gentleman wish to uh, withdraw at this time? Absolutely. Uh, the gentleman's amendment is withdrawn. Next amendment.
10 seconds lost. Um, at this point, uh, I don't believe, is this Graves, Louisiana? Or Graves? Yes. Okay, he's not here at the moment. Oh, he's here. Okay. Uh, the clerk uh, will um, uh, designate uh, the Graves Amendment. Oh, 119 is the one you need to designate. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of substitute to HR2, offer by Mr. Graves, number 119. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read. Uh, the gentleman is recognized for up to three minutes to speak to his amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, just one clarification. Uh, on my list, I've got 120 first. I just want to make sure 120 is still on your list. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, 119. Um, Okay, um, so Mr. Chairman, what this one does is um, this one provide, uh, establishes a pre-disaster mitigation program for transportation. Mr. Chairman, you may recall in DAR legislation uh, that this committee unanimously adopted the last Congress, um, we, we included a pre-disaster mitigation program that was funded, um, known as the, as the BRIC program. And so um, what this does is it effectively does the same thing for for transportation. I know that, that the chairman has, has made uh, resilience a priority in the, in the base bill, and, and this effectively establishes a five-year uh, pre-disaster mitigation pilot, pilot program for highways. Uh, Mr. Chairman, particularly in coastal areas like the area that, that you represent, um, uh, as we've experienced challenges with, with coastal storms, as we've experienced challenges with water management, I know that in, in my home state we have seen, as I recall, I think two 500-year and, and uh, one 1,000-year storm uh, just in recent years. Um, either my math's really off or something's the matter with uh, the statistics on, uh, on those storms. Uh, I should not be experiencing that. People in, in our state should not be experiencing that level of storms. Uh, bottom line is that, is that our roads and the billions and billions of dollars in infrastructure are at risk if we don't make investments in improving the resiliency of those roads and bridges and other infrastructure as things change. And so. Um, every eligible entity under uh, the, the Federal Highway Administration Emergency Relief Program uh, will receive an additional 5% uh, every six months for mitigation activities. Once again, protecting the very assets, the billions and billions of dollars in assets that, that the federal taxpayers we represent have invested in. This program sunsets or expires after five years. It does require, require a report to Congress to, to demonstrate or not the efficacy of these investments. We have all sat in this committee as we've discussed FEMA and disasters and talked about how uh, the CBO study showing for every $1 you invest, you get $3 in cost savings to other studies um, exceeding $10 in cost savings for every $1 you invest. By providing the, the grant recipients with the extra funds proactively to elevate road systems, to improve drainage uh, and other activities, we're helping to build capacity for the next extreme weather event and reducing ultimately disaster costs. Uh, so with that, Mr. Chairman, I urge adoption of the amendment and yield back. Are there other members who wish to be heard on the amendment? Uh, hearing none, I'm, uh, if the gentleman. Yes, I'd like to be heard, Mr. Chairman. Okay, who's that? So it's Congresswoman Plaskett. Okay, uh, you are recognized for up to three minutes. Thank you very much, sir. I'd like to lend my voice in favor of this amendment. It focuses on pre-disaster planning and mitigation and creates incentives for communities to build better and smarter to speed recovery when disaster does strike. This will make communities safer and will also save money. Putting our focus on mitigation is good government and it's fiscally responsible. For every dollar we spend on mitigation, between four and eight is saved in avoided disaster recovery costs later. This is good policy that will benefit every single congressional district across the country. In 2017, the year my district was devastated by consecutive Category 5 hurricanes, 8% of the United States population was affected by at least one disaster. This startling statistic highlights the importance of investment in mitigation infrastructure before strategy, ooh, tragedy strikes. <laughs> that, that would have been a tragedy if I couldn't get that out. <laughs> this amendment would provide stable funding for pre-disaster mitigation within the Federal Highway Administration's Emergency Relief Program. I support the amendment 
thank my colleague for his continued support of looking for smarter ways to take care of our districts, which are more soft and hit by disaster, and I yield back. Uh, I thank the gentlelady. Um, if there are no further requests, I'll uh, yield time to myself. Um, as the gentleman noted, uh, we do, in the Invest in America Act, uh, distribute $6.25 billion over the life of the bill equitably uh, among the states for pre-disaster mitigation uh, resilience issues. Uh, and uh, it would also require states to prefer uh, to prepare an infrastructure vulnerability assessment, et cetera. Uh, the staff has expressed some concern that there might be unintended consequences uh, regarding the emergency relief outlays. So at this point, I am going to indicate I'm willing to accept the amendment if we find that there are potential uh, unintended consequences and it requires some refinement as we move to the floor. I'd ask if the gentleman would be willing uh, to work with us on that. Absolutely, Mr. Chairman, and I, I appreciate your, uh, your willingness to, to accept. All right. Uh, with that, uh, if there are no further requests for time, uh, I'm uh, going to uh, ask unanimous consent that the amendment be adopted. Hearing no objection, the amendment is adopted. Oh, okay. Uh, the uh, clerk will designate uh, Mr. Graves 120. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 2, offered by Mr. Graves, numbered 120. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read. Gentlemen, is recognized for three minutes, up to three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, right now in the defense space, we have an entity called DARPA uh, that, that, that looks at advanced research projects to help benefit our, our defense uh, organization, our Department of Defense, our military men and women, uh, to ensure we have an upper hand. Um, Department of Energy has advanced research, um, uh, RPE type type work that they do. Uh, the intelligence community has NQTEL, a quasi uh, government organization that 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 does research and venture capital investments uh, to to advance the mission of of our intelligence community. Once again, ensuring we have the upper hand. One of the areas where we don't have focused research in the United States is on resiliency. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've, I've sat in this committee over and over again, and I have complained about the fact that we've spent $1.7 trillion, with a T, trillion dollars, picking up the pieces and rebuilding places over and over and over again. Um, I, I, I've got my friend here from Puerto Rico, my friend from Virgin Islands. We have people in here from Florida, Texas, North Carolina. All of these folks have been through this over and over again. California, some of the water management and fire issues that have occurred there. We don't have a government entity that is focused on resilience. And so what this would do is it would establish a, uh, a, a, a FEMA-related not-for-profit that would be a research foundation that would be focused on research and development for resilience. Mr. Chairman, looking at things like, how do you improve building standards? How do you improve zoning? How do you improve um, resilient building techniques, uh, protecting not just federal infrastructure, but also private homes and, and businesses and our families. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have not learned from our mistakes. Uh, we've sat in, in this committee and elsewhere and heard these stories about, in fact, in my district, that, that, that one home has been paid for, I think, 40 times under the National Flood Insurance Program. I think that's ridiculous. We've got to get in front of this and be proactive and stop this unaffordable, reactive thing that we do every time where, we, where all of it ends up being deficit spending. And so I think that this is going to be a small investment that will be FEMA coordinating with the Department of Homeland Security, with the Corps of Engineers, uh, with NOAA, and other appropriate agencies looking at resilience measures that are cost effective, that ultimately the singular objective here is reducing disaster cost to taxpayers. Now, of course, your ancillary benefits are you're, you're, you're not flooding. You're, you're not having destruction of homes and businesses and families and evacuations. It's another rainy day. 
Um, so, Mr. Chairman, I, um, I think this is a really good model. It is somewhat based upon uh, what we've seen in other agencies that has been effective, but it's all about resilience, mitigation strategies, new construction techniques and materials, and um, in improving the performance of resiliency of our roads, bridges, homes, businesses, and, and other infrastructure and assets in this country. Yield back. Time that I don't have. I thank the gentleman. Anyone else wish to be recognized? Hearing no one, uh, I'll uh, uh, yield myself. Uh, this would create a nonprofit corporation called the National Foundation of Resilience. It would involve three federal agencies, uh, one of which this committee has no jurisdiction over, uh, one of which is not under uh, the auspices of this bill uh, being FEMA, and the other being another agency which is not under the auspices uh, directly of this bill uh, being the core. Uh, it seems that it would allow this nonprofit agency to receive and redistribute federal funds, uh, raises uh, a whole host of uh, questions about the powers of this new nonprofit foundation. Uh, and, uh, you know, I must uh, oppose uh, the amendment. Uh, others wish to be recognized. Mr. Chairman. I uh, support the amendment, having worked for two international engineering companies and, and I ran a think tank for 25 years. I understand the importance of, of planning. And uh, we used to joke in engineering that there's never time to, to do it right, but there's always time to do it over. That's the point I think uh, my friend from Louisiana is trying to make. And I think this is something that would be very helpful, particularly in regard to uh, dealing with the climate change that we know will occur. Um, that we prepare to mitigate and, uh, and yeah, design well, resiliency into the infrastructures uh, going forward. I, th I think in the long run, uh, having this type of planning will save the federal government a tremendous amount of money and possibly even save lives. That I yield back. Any others? Uh, again, I would express concern about the germaneness. I'm not going to make a point of order because I don't want to go through that again. Uh, and, uh, you know, and creating a nonprofit foundation that can uh, receive, coordinate among three federal agencies, none of which are the principal subject of this bill, one of which is outside our jurisdiction, and allow them to receive and expend federal funds. Uh, I, I, I uh, applaud the objective, but I think this is uh, complicated and problematic uh, to amend uh, to this bill. Uh, so I will have to oppose if, the amendment. If the, if the gentleman will yield, I, I may be willing to withdraw. Um, yes. For, for a, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I understand your concerns. I, I want to say if, if John Dingle were here, I'm certain he could have found this squarely within the committee's jurisdiction. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I, I, I want to ask, Mr. Chairman, I feel very strongly about the need for this. I think this has a lot of merit. If, if you will commit uh, to work with us and, and happy to discuss with you a model that you think works better, that, that, that better fits within this committee's jurisdiction, but I'd be willing to withdraw if, if we can get a commitment that will work with you and see if we can come up with uh, an approach that makes sense and, and you feel is within the, the committee's jurisdiction. Well, there is, I mean, we have a huge title. I, gentlemen, well, I guess it's still my time. Um, the... Um, I reclaim my time. Uh, I guess I'd be willing to do that, as you know, and the, as the gentleman did know, we do have a huge uh, amount of money allocated in this bill uh, into, uh, you know, into resilience, uh, pre-disaster mitigation. I think that's absolutely critical for uh, severe weather events and uh, other issues that we're dealing with. Uh, and uh, I'd be happy to discuss a way forward, whether it's to get some more focus in perhaps one of these federal agencies uh, and, uh, and look at some of the other implications of a nonprofit foundation uh, versus some other form. I'd be happy to discuss it. I'm, I'm into anything that gets us more focused on resilience. I mean, I think there are even states that don't yet have building codes that are in the hurricane, the statewide building codes in the hurricane zones of this country. So uh, that, of course, is beyond the jurisdiction of this also. So if the gentleman is willing to withdraw. Uh, yes, unanimous consent to withdraw. Uh, well, don't. You don't have to ask unanimous consent. We got past that part. Well, I can. Uh, oh, yeah, you can, sure. I just like, to, I just like okay. to work with everybody, Mr. Chair. All right, okay, all right, okay. Uh, the amendment is uh, withdrawn.
the, uh, the clerk will designate uh, Graves 131. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 2, offered by Mr. Graves, numbered 131. Uh, the, without objection, the amendment is considered as read, uh, and uh, the gentleman is uh, recognized for up to three minutes. All right, Mr. Chairman. Oh, okay. Um, putting them all together like this, you're, you're taxing my, my memory capacity here. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, this amendment um, uh, would, would amend an existing program uh, that's in the base tax. The base tax has a, has a program called the, the gridlock program, which certainly has an objective that, that has a lot of merit. It, it, it is focused on how to address uh, these major congestion points in mega cities. Uh, but, but, Mr. Chairman, that's where my, where my concern lies in that uh, the, the bill only focuses on mega cities. Uh, as I recall, um, I believe that the population threshold in the base text is a million people or greater, um, it, which excludes by far the majority of members of this committee and, and I think uh, excludes uh, a number of members of, of this body. And, and so what this amendment does is it, um, it brings down the threshold, the eligibility threshold, um, to an, an MSA of, of 500,000 or greater, which I think would, would include areas of, of many of the, the, the districts that are represented uh, here in this, um, in this room. And so it, 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 does, it, 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 it does reduce the, the population threshold. And secondly, um, it, it does provide a little bit more flexibility uh, for the Department of Transportation to implement the program to find the best solutions uh, to address gridlock. So um, I, I commend the chairman for including a gridlock program. I think there's gridlock in Congress, there's gridlock on the interstate, um, and, uh, and I think this is an opportunity to fix one of those. Right. And, um, I and I urge adoption of the amendment 500. and yield back. Ask unanimous consent the amendment be adopted. Five, four, three, two, one. Very good. Uh, you know, I don't represent a city of that magnitude, uh, nor do others at 500,000. It's not a million anymore. Uh, there is concern about the other provisions of uh, this part of the bill, which have grants that go from 10 to 50 million. And uh, that would perhaps need to be somewhat dramatically adjusted uh, to accommodate uh, unique needs in some smaller jurisdictions. Uh, so uh, at this point in time, uh, I cannot uh, accept the amendment. So uh, with that, are there others who wish to speak to the amendment? Uh, hearing none, uh, are there amendments to the amendment? Hearing none. Uh, we will uh, proceed uh, to a vote, uh, the usual process. Uh, those who intend to vote in favor will unmute now and signify by saying aye. 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 Those who are opposed at this point will unmute and signify by saying no. 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 Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like a recorded vote. Reported vote is requested. The reported vote will be uh, considered later in the queue. Mr. Lynch is going to assume the chair. Are there any amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute for H.R. 2? Mr. Crawford, 048. Amendment number 048.
Gotcha. All right. Zero four eight. Here we go. The clerk would designate the amendment. And to the amendment in the nature of substitute to HR two, offered Mr. Crawford, number zero four eight. The chair recognizes. I'm sorry. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and I now recognize Mr. Crawford to speak on his amendment for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this amendment is simple. If transit agency accepts any source of federal funding, uh, then that agency's capital expenditures will adhere to all Buy America laws. Last year, Congress passed a landmark bill, the Transportation Infrastructure Vehicle. Infrastructure Vehicle Security Act, or TIFSA, to ban federal funds from being used to purchase rolling stock from Chinese state-owned enterprises or supported companies. The logic was simple. Taxpayer dollars should not be used to subsidize any company that has made clear its intent to eliminate American jobs and displace U.S. manufacturers. Yet the threat from China's authoritarian regime persists and more is still needed. This amendment closes a loophole being exploited by Chinese SOEs and will result in taxpayer dollars flowing back into the U.S. economy. Xi Jinping made it clear at the recent Chinese Communist Party Congress, China intends to use the pandemic they allowed to fester to strengthen their economic standing. If we continue to lose these manufacturing jobs during the COVID pandemic to China, we will never get them back. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Are there any other members who wish to be recognized to speak on this amendment? Uh, with that, uh, I yield myself uh, one minute. Uh, the chair is in support of the gentleman's amendment. This amendment applies the requirements of Buy America to all transit agency purchases, no matter what the source of the funds. Under current law, transit agencies only need to adhere to Buy America if using any federal dollars in the project. This will ensure transit agencies do not steer their federal funds in such a way to avoid meeting this requirement of Buy America on a specific project or acquisition. And I urge the committee to support this amendment. Are there any amendments to the amendment? If not, the question is now on the amendment. All those in favor will unmute and signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Now all those who are opposed will unmute and signify by saying nay. 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 In the opinion of the yeah. chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. Are there any additional amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute for HR 2? And this would be uh, Mr. Crawford 054. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of substitute to HR 2, offered by Mr. Crawford, number 054. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and I now recognize Mr. Crawford to speak on his amendment 054 for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment clarifies congressional intent following subpar guidance from the FTA on TIFSA that allows CRRC to continue selling to transit agencies if an existing contract is already in place. The exemption, according to FTA, is a lifetime exemption. It applies forever in addition to a two-year delay to sign even more contracts with the other agencies before the funding prohibition takes effect. This loophole must be closed. As we saw just Monday with the cellular network attacks, cyber threats are among the gravest threats facing our nation. The Chinese Communist Party and military have long demonstrated histories of orchestrating cyber attacks and engaging in cyber espionage here in the United States, making the involvement of state-owned enterprise in the manufacturing of domestic rolling stock a grave security concern. With today's Metro Transit cars carrying Wi-Fi systems, sophisticated communications equipment, they are part of the Internet of Things. There's no question that they could be a vulnerable target cyber attack or hacking and with that i yield back the gentleman yields back do any other members wish to speak on this amendment mr chairman mr lipinski you recognize for three minutes okay. 
Mr. Thank Lipinski, you. we're having a little trouble with your audio. Okay, let me. Uh, now we're having trouble with your video. Why don't you have another crack at it? All right, is, is this better? That's better, yeah, thanks. All right, very good. Sorry about that. I want to thank uh, Ranking Member Crawford for this amendment for all his work on uh, on this issue, which is uh, also an issue that's always been very important for me. Uh, the bill already does a lot to strengthen Buy America laws, including most notably having U.S. DOT start to directly audit and certify whether rolling stock meets our laws. And we adopted a Maloney amendment earlier that prevent any funds in this bill from going to a Chinese state-owned enterprise. This amendment would add to all that by closing an existing loophole that was created by last year's National Defense Authorization Act that could allow a Chinese state-owned enterprise to enter U.S. rail rolling stock markets. However, we must be more diligent than what we already have in this bill so that we can address this specific issue. As we heard in the hearing last year, Chinese state-owned enterprises are a growing threat to this country's domestic rail and bus industry and have already had catastrophic impacts in other countries like Australia. There is no doubt that communist China is our greatest strategic threat, and the Chinese government's actions have only gotten worse recently. Therefore, I cannot understand why the Federal Transit Administration interpreted last year's NDA to mean that they should give CRRC, the Chinese National Rail Company, two years to sell their rolling stock to any transit agency and a lifetime exemption with the four transit agencies that have existing contracts with CRRC. If China is a threat, and Congress seems to agree that it is, why would we give CRRC two years to unfairly undercut other providers of rolling stock using Chinese government subsidies and the ability to sell rolling stock indefinitely to four transit agencies? Mr. Crawford's amendment puts forward a reasonable compromise that protects the transit agencies that have already contracted with CRRC and the jobs created due to those contracts while addressing the threat CRRC poses. Existing contracts in place at the time the NDAA was signed into law and the options associated with those contracts are grandfathered in. At the same time, CRRC will be prohibited from signing new contracts going forward. That seems like a reasonable compromise. Now is the time to act to address the rising economic threat from Chinese state-owned enterprises and CRRC in particular. I ask my colleagues to vote yes on its well out, out amendment, and I thank Ranking Member Crawford for offering it, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Are there any other members who would like to speak on this amendment? Hearing none, I yield myself a minute and a half. Uh, the chair is in strong support of the gentleman's amendment. This amendment strikes a loophole in the Transit Infrastructure Vehicle Security Act, TIVSA. This legislation originated in the Senate and was ultimately attached to the National Defense Author Authorization Act of fiscal year 2020, which prevents federal transit dollars from being used to procure transit rolling stock and transit buses from Chinese state-owned enterprises controlled uh, subsidized by the Chinese government. I share the concerns raised in this amendment because it allows state-owned enterprises to continue selling railing st rolling stock to the four transit agencies who have already purchased transit rail cars from the CRRC, a Chinese state-owned enterprise. These agencies, the MBTA in Boston, CTA in Chicago, Metro in Los Angeles, and SEPTA in Philadelphia, all have current contracts with CRRC and current law allows them to sign new contracts with CRRC into perpetuity. This amendment closes this loophole, and I urge the committee to support this amendment. Are there any further amendments to the amendment? If not, the question is now on the amendment. All those in favor, please unmute and signify by saying aye. 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 All right. All those opposed, please unmute and signify by saying nay. Nay. 
In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. And the measure is adopted. Are there any further amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute for H.R. 2? The chair recognizes it. Let's see. Uh, Mr. Crawford, amendment 055. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2 offered by Mr. Crawford, 055. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. I now recognize Mr. Crawford to speak on his amendment. 055 for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty. Um, for some reason. You sound, you sound good from this end. Okay. And we can see you. Yeah. All right, we just lost you. Are you muted? I think you might have muted yourself. Yeah, I've, I've my, uh, my copy is not downloaded for some reason. It was, and now it's not. So I can't read my. Well, you can make it up if you want. We won't know the difference. <laughs> Well, obviously, um, I, I, I know that the chairman supports this, and, and uh, if you have the text, you can I read do. it. I do. I do have an attachment, a, a summary of your report. Would you like me to offer it? Well, that would be helpful. Okay. And I apologize for the technical difficulty. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, well, the chairman uh, supports the gentleman's amendment, and. The basic description is the amendment tightens the definition of Buy America for components of bus and rail rolling stock if those components contain, contain materials supplied by entities that have violated fair trade laws of the United States, are owned or controlled by entities subject to United States sanctions, or are owned by a foreign government. This amendment is straightforward and seeks to provide a fair and level playing field for all manufacturers. And for those reasons, the chair has indicated support for the gentleman's amendment. I appreciate that, Chairman. I did finally, I was able to open up the copy and it's- well, You still have three minutes if you want to go is. at it. Well, thank you. Buy America laws ensure that the iron, steel, and other construction materials used to build our infrastructure are produced in the United States by American workers to the fullest extent possible. But without these policies in place or when loopholes undermine their coverage, Predatory foreign governments are free to undercut American workers' products that conflict with some of the most sacred public policy priorities. Goods that have stolen intellectual property should not be rewarded with credit under Buy America. Goods that violate our trade laws have been found to be dumped into our market at below cost or subsidized by a foreign government should not be rewarded with credit under Buy America. Goods that come from a supplier that is sanctioned by the United States government should not be rewarded with credit under Buy America. Goods that come from a state-owned entity linked to a foreign military should not be rewarded with credit under Buy America. Any goods that have prohibited telecommunications equipment or services from Huawei or other risky entities should not be rewarded with credit under Buy America. But as we sit here today, there's nothing stopping any of these goods from being purchased with taxpayer money to build our infrastructure. This amendment would simply require bidders to certify that they will not use any goods that meet these criteria. I urge the support of the committee for this common sense amendment that supports our economic and national security. And I yield back and I thank the chair for his uh, latitude. The gentleman yields back. Do any other members wish to speak on this amendment? Are there any further amendments to the gentleman's amendment? If not, the question is on the amendment. All those in favor will unmute and signify by saying aye. 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 And now all those opposed will unmute and signify by saying nay. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the amendment is adopted.
Are there any amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute for H.R. 2? We now have Mr. Crawford, amendment number 49, if the clerk could designate the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2, offer Mr. Crawford, 049. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. And once again, I will recognize uh, Mr. Crawford to speak on his amendment number 49 for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment strikes section 9204, which expands Amtrak's ability to sue railroads. With the ongoing standards and metrics rulemaking wrapping up at the Department of Transportation, uh, the legally enforceable contracts already in existence and two other options Amtrak already has for legal resource uh, recourse rather to enforce its right of preference. This provision is unnecessary at this time. Simply put, a federal judge in Arkansas with no expertise or experience in rail issues should not be the one making determinations that could impact rail service in Oregon. Congress uh, created the STB to mediate these issues and Congress should wait for the DOT to finish its ongoing rulemaking before pursuing massive changes like those in section 9204. Mr. Chairman, having read that, I am willing to uh, withdraw that at this point under the current circumstances. Well, we deeply appreciate that, Mr. Crawford. We understand you've had a good run here anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. And the gentleman withdraws his amendment. Are there any additional amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute for H.R. 2? It appears we have an additional amendment from Mr. Crawford, number 53. Would the clerk please designate the amendment? Amendment to the amendment in the nature of substitute to H.R. 2, offered by Mr. Crawford, 053. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. I now recognize Mr. Crawford to speak on his amendment, number 53, for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. The underlying bill authorizes RRIF credit risk premium payments, but only for public applicants. This is a positive step as RRIF fails to maximize its authorized potential. Shortline railroads like the North Louisiana and Arkansas in my district serve as a critical linchpin across the country for industry to connect to the national transportation network. Expanding eligibility for CRP payments to short lines and other private applicants will ensure that RRIF, a program created to assist short lines, will finally meet its intended purpose and my amendment does exactly that. The Build America Bureau and this administration have leveraged programs like RRIF to revolutionize rural infrastructure. And this amendment will help build on those successes across the country. Um, but having said that, again, I'm, I'm going to uh, state my appreciation for the indulgence of the chair, but I will withdraw that one as well. We thank the gentleman. We appreciate his concerns, and, and they are noted, but we are Grateful that he has decided to withdraw his amendment. Thank you. Are there any amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute for HR 2? Uh, we have uh, the Crawford Amendment 02. Would the clerk please designate the amendment? Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 2, offered by Mr. Crawford 02. Without objection, the amendment is. Considered as read. I now recognize Mr. Crawford to speak on his amendment for, let's see, number 02 for three minutes. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this amendment reauthorizes hazardous material safety programs at the Department of Transportation while providing additional clarity and efficiencies. The amendment contains targeted uh, reforms that create efficiencies and provide clarity and flexibility to support the effective hazardous materials regulatory program at DOT. There are an average of 900,000 shipments of hazardous materials every day in the United States with very few incidents thanks to a robust regulatory program at DOT and the significant attention given to safety by industry. This amendment would increase flexibility and promote innovation in hazardous materials transportation by reducing the amount of time in which FEMSA is required to analyze a special permit and determine if it may be incorporated into the hazardous materials regulations from 10 to six years, 10 years to six years. It also requires FEMSA to conduct such rulemaking every two years. This will lead to safer hazmat transportation and more efficient regulation. 
This amendment also subjects hazmat, uh, stored hazmat rail cars to more common sense regulations. Current DOT policy is based on various authorities between FRA and PHMSA, and this amendment would fix that. The tank car storage would still be subject to multiple federal regulations outlined below. They would not be subject to extraneous state or local regulations and treatment of these tank cars will still be held to a high safety and, and security standard. Mr. Chairman, I think it was important to get that information on the record. And uh, with your assurances, I would that you would work with me going forward on this to address the underlying concerns. I would be willing to withdraw this one as well. I will note the chairman's concerns uh, with the amendment. However, I can promise you that uh, he will work with you to try to find out a sol find a solution uh, to the concerns that you've raised. And uh, we do appreciate your willingness to withdraw the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Crawford. Uh, yes, sir. No, yeah. I yield back. Thank you. Are there any further amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute for HR 2? I believe the next amendment will be Davis 103. We're just waiting for some paper. Are there any additional amendments in the nature of a substitute for HR 2? The chair recognizes, let's see, Mr. Davis, amendment number two. Would the clerk please? Designate the amendment. Mr. Chairman, I have no amendment by Davis number 02. Is it 103? I think it's uh, 103. I think the gentleman is correct. 103. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of substitute to HR 2, offered by Mr. Davis of Illinois, number 103. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and I now recognize Mr. Davis on his amendment for three minutes. Mr. Chair, it's a good faith measure for the majority, including in the initial on block, uh, my amendment 112 to prohibit funds that are collected as fines from going into any of our congressional campaigns. Uh, this amendment also does that. Uh, I will respectfully withdraw this amendment as a measure of good faith since you already included one of these in the on block. And I uh, will not have to ask unanimous consent to withdraw it. I withdraw the amendment. We thank the gentleman and appreciate his good work. Are there any further amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute for HR 2? I believe we have Davis number 104. Would the clerk please designate the amendment? Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 2, offered by Mr. Davis of Illinois, number 104. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and I now recognize Mr. Davis uh, to speak on his amendment 104 for three minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, can I take this opportunity to offer a perfecting amendment that was crafted by my good friend from Florida, Mr. Spano, uh, that would institute a requirement that all NEPA authorizations for major infrastructure projects to be completed within two years, unless both the agency and applicant mutually agree on a longer timeline. This is actually Mr. Spano's amendment that he withdrew, so you should have the paperwork from yesterday. 
I believe uh, we would take your amendment and then we would ask if there are further amendments to your amendment, at which time the amendment to your amendment would be in order. But I think we would be wise to begin with uh, your amendment. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate uh, <laughs> that you think it'd be wise to deal with my amendment first. Uh, I, I do want to I do want to talk about this uh, amendment. I think it's a, a very important issue when it comes to continued reg continued regulatory relief that many of us have been working on for many years uh, on this committee. Uh, if you're worried about bipartisan support for this amendment that would institute a one federal decision process, uh, this is this is. Uh, a, would codify President Trump's one federal decision executive order. If you don't think this is bipartisan, all you have to do is look at the Senate EPW surface reauthorization bill, which includes virtually identical language. It garnered such support in the Senate because it provides sensible reforms to the federal permitting process, all while preserving the effectiveness of environmental reviews. Make no mistake, I am committed to ensuring we preserve our environment and nothing in this amendment takes away from that commitment. All that it states is that the review process for major infrastructure projects shouldn't take longer than two years. And that the process should be centralized across government agencies and departments. It's important to note this bill has the support of the US Chamber of Commerce, North America's Building Trades Unions, the Portland Cement Association, Association of American Railroads, American Highway Users Alliance, American Public Gas Association, and the American Road and Transportation Builders Association, AGC of America, and National Asphalt Pavement Association. We can move projects along quicker, save taxpayer dollars, create good paying jobs, and protect the environment at the same time. I would urge a vote on this amendment, and when you're ready, I'll ask for the perfecting language from Mr. Spano. The gentleman yields, right? Yes, I yield back. Okay. Uh, are there any other members who would like to speak on this amendment? Hearing none, I'm going to yield myself about 30 seconds. Uh, the chair is in strong opposition to the gentleman's amendment. This amendment seeks to add requirements that places severe time constraints on the agencies without providing additional resources necessary to meet those requirements. In addition, several of the activities required by the amendment are already being done as part of the previous administration's action or legislation. Are there any further amendments to the gentleman's amendment? Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Louisiana is recognized for three minutes. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment that uh, I believe Mr. Spano uh, offered earlier that I'd like to I'd like to offer as as a revision. Uh, it's Spano number thirty three. Was this properly noticed? I, I, I'm I'm just pitch hitting here. I just want to make sure I, I've got this right. Of course, it was, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Chairman, um, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm doing this as a second degree. Um, okay. So uh, I understand this wouldn't require the same notice. Does the clerk have the necessary uh, paperwork? Let me just ask that. Mr. Chairman, there is no amendment at the desk. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the, am the amendment's being printed right now, um, and we'll deliver to the clerk um, uh, very shortly here. Okay. It's Spano number 33. Could you clarify that? Is it 23 or 33? I've heard a couple uh, of numbers. Spano number 33. Can you have the uh, Mr. Chairman, here's the, here's the yeah. text. Yeah. Could we deliver that to the clerk, and, and could the clerk please read that amendment for the benefit of the members? So this is fashioned as a further amendment to the Davis Amendment number 104. Amendment to the amendment offered by Mr. Davis to the amendment in the nature of substitute to HR 2, number 033.
Uh, would, would the clerk read the amendment? And then we will have the gentleman who we'll yield time. We just want to get the text out there. This members uh, virtually will have not have copies of that, so it will be helpful. Mr. Chairman, if I can clarify, this is actually in the portal because um, this is spanner number 33. So I do, for those that are online, it's spanner number 33 in the, on the online portal. For clarity's sake, we will have the clerk read it, please. At the end of subtitle F of Title I of Division B, insert the following, Section 16, Environmental Reviews for Major Projects, Section 139 of Title 23, United States Code is amended, one in Section A, A, in Paragraph 3B, by striking process for and completion of any environmental permit and inserting process and schedule, including a timetable for and completion of any environmental permit. B, by redesignating paragraphs 5 through 8 as paragraphs 9 through 11. C, by redesignating paragraphs 2 through 4 as paragraphs 4 through 6. D, by inserting after paragraph 1 the following. 2, authorization. The term authorization means any environmental license permit, approval of findings, or other administrative decision related to any environmental review process that is required under federal law to site, construct, or reconstruct a project. Three, environmental document. The term environmental document means an environmental assessment, finding of no significant impact, notice of intent, environmental impact statement, or record of decision under the National Environmental Policy Act of 1969, 42 U.S.C. 4321, ETSEC. And E, by inserting after paragraph six, is redesignated the following. Seven, major project. The term major product means a project for which any multiple permits, approvals, reviews, or studies are required under a federal law other than the National Environmental Policy Act of 1969, 42 way. USC, 4321 ETSEC. Project sponsor has identified the reasonable availability of funds sufficient to complete the project. C, the project is not a covered project as such term is defined in section 41001 of the FAST Act. 42 USC 4370M and D, the head of the lead agency has determined that one, an environmental impact statement is required or two, an environmental assessment is required and the project sponsor requests that the project be treated as a major project. Two, in subsection B1, A, by inserting, including major projects after all projects and B, by inserting at the request of a project sponsor after B applied. Three, in subsection C, A, paragraph six, one, in subparagraph B, by striking and at the end. Two, in subparagraph C, by striking the period at the end and inserting semicolon and. And three, by adding at the end the following. D, to calculate annually the average time taken by the lead agency to complete all environmental documents for a project during the previous fiscal year. B, by adding at the end the following. Seven, process improvements for projects. A, in general, the secretary shall review existing practices, procedures, pro programmatic, agreements and applicable laws to identify potential changes that would facilitate an efficient environmental review process for projects. B, consultation. In conducting the review required under, required by par, subparagraph A, the secretary shall consult as appropriate with the heads of other federal agencies that participate in the environmental review process. C, report. Not later than two years after the date of enactment of the one federal decision. And the Committee on Transportation Infrastructure of the House of Representatives a report that includes, one, the results of the review required by subparagraph A, and two, an analysis of whether additional resources would help the secretary meet the requirements applicable to the projects under this section. Four, in subsection D, A, subparagraph eight, one, in heading by, strike, heading by striking NEPA and inserting environmental. Two, by amending subparagraph A to read as follows, A in general, except as inconsistent with paragraph seven and except as provided in subparagraph D to the maximum sense practical and consistent with federal law, all federal author authorizations and reviews for projects should rely on a single environmental document for each type of environmental document prepared under the National Environmental Policy Act of 1969, 42 U.S.C. 4321 ETSEC, under the leadership of the lead agency, and three, by adding at the end the following, D, exception, the lead agency may waive the applicable application of subparagraph A with respect to a project if the project... Mr. Chairman? The Mr. Chairman? Uh, I ask unanimous consent to, to dispense with the reading. Uh, I object. I think the members really, even this is not this is not helpful. It does give members Mr. a Chairman. sense of the 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 detail of the, uh, of, the of the further amendment. Uh, the clerk will please proceed. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Well, Mr. Chairman, I just want to clarify that this amendment was filed yesterday. It has been available on the internet. It is available on the internet, and 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 I think that it, it's available to members. All right. Okay. Gentlemen, we'll suspend. 
And the gentleman is recognized for three minutes to try to help explain that amendment. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, what this does is it, is it, it provides a requirement for NEPA authorizations for major infrastructure projects that those projects, excuse me, that that NEPA uh, authorization or the NEPA process be completed within two years. Uh, we have all seen sitting in this committee with jurisdiction over infrastructure, uh, the amount of time that it takes, the amount of money that it takes uh, to complete the NEPA process. As I recall, I think just recently, uh, Mr. Chairman, a statistic came out indicating that the average NEPA process for a, a transportation project takes seven years, seven years. And it's not just time, Mr. Chairman, it's money as well. And so um, the, it's money that's being taken away from laying asphalt, from pouring concrete to actually advancing transportation projects that I know Republicans, Democrats, all of us in this committee uh, feel very, very strongly about. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I heard the, 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 uh, Mr. DeFazio repeatedly make note in this committee that 97% of infrastructure projects don't go through a NEPA analysis. And I'm not sure if that was an off-the-cuff estimate or if that's a, 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 a backed-up number, but, but, but here's the reality. The reality is the majority of infrastructure projects in this country do not go through a NEPA analysis. And the reason for that is, is that NEPA is only triggered when federal dollars are brought to the table, whenever a federal dollar is, is involved in an infrastructure project. So if a local government does it with their money, no NEPA. If a state government does it, no NEPA. It doesn't matter if it's a trillion dollar project unless a federal dollar is involved or there is a major uh, uh, environmental impact or a water resource impact. I believe there are three criteria that trigger NEPA. So the majority of projects don't go through this. This doesn't waive NEPA. It doesn't undermine NEPA. It simply goes back to, I think, what Congress intended, a more streamlined process that does look at environmental impacts and, um, and ensures that money's not being wasted on this process uh, to the detriment of actually carrying out infrastructure work. So with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Would any other member uh, want to be heard on the, the Spano Amendment offered as an amendment to the amendment uh, by the gentleman from Louisiana? Hearing none, I yield myself 30 seconds. Uh, the chair is in strong opposition to the gentleman's amendment. This amendment seeks to add requirements that place severe time constraints and obstructions on agencies without providing additional resources necessary to meet those requirements. In addition, several of the activities required by the amendment are already being done as part of previous administration action or legislation. Are there any further amendments to the further amendment? Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry, who's, uh, is that Mr. Mr. Garamendi? The gentleman from yes. California is recognized for three minutes. I seriously object to uh, what is taking place here. We're talking about a major change uh, to the National Environmental Policy Act. And being done in a committee, I think, beyond the jurisdiction of this specific committee, and beyond that, not even a chance of understanding the way in which these two amendments work together for, and for what purpose. Uh, so I seriously object to the entire process that is underway here and would urge a no vote, both on what may or may not be substance, and secondly, on process. And with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Are there any other members who would like to uh, speak on this further amendment? Mr. Chair? Chair recognizes uh, the original sponsor. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Davis. Chair, um, I, I don't want the perfecting amendment to get in the way of what this is really about. This is about, okay, this is about codifying an executive order that is, actually, that is actually saving money, moving projects along quicker, making sure we create good paying jobs, and at the same time, protecting the environment. I don't know why it's that much of a controversy. Uh, if, if you want to see policy that's already in place be codified by this institution, which I think we should do, that would do those four things, then vote yes. 
That's why this is important. Let's not, let's not get away from the process because of a small perfecting amendment that everybody had a copy of because it was withdrawn yesterday to save time and to combine later on in the markup, and here we are. But it is a process that's going to allow projects in every one of our districts to actually go further and get done more quickly. I don't know why anybody would want to be against that. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Are there any other members who would like to speak to the further amendment? Hearing none, if not, the question is on the further amendment. Um, all those in favor of the amendment, the further amendment, uh, will unmute and signify by saying aye. 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 All right, those people will mute. And now all those opposed to the amendment will unmute and signify by saying no. 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 In the opinion no. of the chair, the no's have it. And that is on the further amendment is not adopted. Now we have a question on the Original amendment number 104 Mr. by Mr. Davis. Mr. Chairman, uh, can we have a recorded vote on the second degree? It's too late. We called it no. We're taking up uh, Mr. Davis's at this point. Uh, did Mr. Davis have? All right. We now have the question on the original amendment by Mr. Davis, number 104. All those in favor will please unmute and indicate by saying aye. 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 Okay, those people will mute and now all those opposed will unmute and signify by saying nay. 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 No. Nay. In the opinion of the chair, the nays have it. Mr. Chair, I'd ask for a recorded vote. Okay. As previously agreed, we'll uh, dispense with the uh, reading of the typical script for postponing votes, and we will take the vote up at a later time. On 104. On 104. Uh, the chair is now going to uh, institute a recess until 5.30, 5.30. Are we having votes when we come back? Or more? For, for more debate on amendments, further debate on amendments, until 5.30. Thank you.
Hey, Eddie Bernice, I guess you and uh, Chewy and I are the only ones on. No, I'm also here. Oh, hi, Eddie. I'm here. Hey. <laughs> how long is this break? I'm here. I don't know how long. We haven't heard. Have you? I'm here, I'm here too. Hey, guys, I'm here too. Mitchell. Hey. Salud. How are you?
When I hear meatloaf, I think Paradise by the Dashboard Lights. <laughs> Good song. Hey, I got a cop to the meatloaf comment. <laughs> I have the big I, I mute button here. Up. Bring it up, guys. Party's I, over. I am totally socially challenged. I only became aware of the meatloaf in some movie that I'm not aware of reference. So whatever. <laughs> uh, we're just about ready. Chairman, any idea when are we finishing tonight? What's that? Hello, who's that? That's me, Albio. Albio, any speak up a little, Albio. You're faint, which is very unusual for you. <laughs> <laughs> I said, do you have any idea when are we, when are we finishing tonight? Uh, we are going to go back to amendments uh, at this point. Uh, we've offered to accept a few Republican amendments. I, I'm not certain uh, that they want uh, to do that. We've also offered to unblock amendments, which we know we're going to oppose and we know on which we will prevail. They don't want to do that. So at this point, I'm uncertain. Um, but I think at this point, are we proceeding to Mr. Webster? Or soon. Okay, are, thank you, Chairman. I believe Davis. And Mr. Ch yeah. Mr. Chairman Mitchell here, you can unblock mine. And well, I haven't called us back into session yet. Through. I'm just trying to get organized. I'm just talking to people. Sorry, I shouldn't be on there. Oh, that's okay. I'm just kidding you. No problem. I was just trying to be helpful there, Lloyd. What's that? Oh, yeah. I was, just, I was just trying to be helpful, you know? Are you with the VP now? No, that's over. I'm just driving back out. All right. We're going to, uh, everybody's going to mute. Uh, the committee's going to come back to order. Uh, and uh, what is in order at this point in time uh, is Mr. Webster uh, from Florida, uh, number 10. Uh, the clerk will uh, report the amendment. An amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 2 offered by Mr. Webster of Florida, number 010. Uh, without objection, uh, the amendment uh, is considered as read. The amendment, uh, the, the gentleman is recognized for three minutes to uh, discuss his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I believe if uh, we need to think big if we're going to. Uh, basically rebuild the nation's infrastructure. I also believe that we need to think outside the box and look to innovative solutions to meet the needs of the American people. Uh, while while this, am uh, this amendment is why I uh, sponsored it as a piece of legislation recently, it would establish the Infrastructure Bank for America, or IBA. This new infrastructure bank would be set up as a government-sponsored enterprise Serving the lender to state, send, serving as a lender to states, regional entities, and local entities, it would provide loans, loan guarantees, and direct investments in infrastructure projects of all types. The bank would not only rely on, would not at all rely on federal funding, nor would taxpayers be on the hook for any loan guarantees or unsound investments. We require a rural set aside. We guard against undue foreign influence. We ensure sound risk-based practices and enable federal oversight. But otherwise, we allow the bank to operate using market-based approach to finance projects that it deems worthy of investment. Make no mistake, this intent, the intent of this legislation is to supplement, not supplant, direct federal investments that we make through this bill and in our uh, appropriation process. The IR RBA serves as a complement, not a replacement for existing programs and encourages states and municipalities to pursue all available funding sources. 
Uh, while uh, the federal infrastructure investment is crucial, uh, the current level of resources for the federal government will be, not address America's infrastructure needs on its own. The IBA will work with state and local governments to identify priority projects and infuse private capital to help address our critical infrastructure needs. I only see positive impacts uh, coming from this uh, proposal. Uh, we'll have uh, created, if we do this, a mechanism to help build our roads and bridges, expand our ports, and uh, repair water infrastructure, um, and even invest in broadband expansion, all at no cost or no risk to the federal taxpayer. I thank the chairman for his indulgence, and I'm hopeful that we can all come together and continue this conversation in a bipartisan fashion as we move forward. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I, I'd like to... Matt, no, vote. if the gentleman would just suspend yes. for a moment. I'd like to speak to his amendment. I actually uh, appreciate this as a constructive suggestion. Uh, we had a, uh, proposals from Rep. Carbajal on my side of the aisle, which he deferred. Uh, I've been pressed by Representative Rosa DeLauro for probably a decade on this issue throughout the Obama administration and ever since. And I've always said I see this as a potential addition to the toolbox. Uh, in this bill, we have uh, substantial funding for the TIFIA program, which underwrites almost every P3 project. Uh, and for the RRIF rail program, uh, which are, will uh, meet a lot of the needs of projects which do not generate positive cash flow. Uh, I think the, actually the most appropriate place for either Mr. Webster, Mr. Carverhall, or uh, Ms. DeLauro's amendment lies either with with the uh, Banking Committee or potentially with the Energy and Commerce Committee because, as the gentleman mentioned, uh, it could play a role in broadband, it could play a role in energy transmission, uh, it could play a role, uh, although uh, with our hearings uh, with a bipartisan joint committee on private financing, we came to a negative conclusion on on water, given a disastrous uh, privatization of water in Atlanta and a number of other places, but uh, you know, uh, uh, for you know, wastewater, which is in uh, the, the overall infrastructure proposal, wastewater is a total public responsibility, and uh, you know, uh, would would not fall within that. Transit, uh, there's no transit system in the world that makes money. Uh, except, well, Hong Kong claims they do, uh, but uh, all the others are subsidized. I mean, Virgin Rail talks about making money in Europe, except the government owns and maintains the rail bed, so if you just want to run train sets over it, that's pretty damn easy to make money. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I, I think the proposal has merit. It could potentially attract uh, pension funds and other money that doesn't seek a high rate of return uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I believe it, it merits individual consideration uh, in the House and would suggest uh, that the gentleman might want to work with Ms. DeLauro, who has been pushing me really hard on this for 10 years, um, and uh, Mr. Carvajal, and I'm sure there are others on your side of the aisle who are interested. There's also some interest from pension funds and others who would accept a long-term stable lower rate of return as opposed to uh, other projects. So I think it has merit. I don't think it quite fits into this proposal given the fact that we have a, a plus up in uh, both TIFIA and RIF, uh, which will uh, go to transit, rail, and highway projects uh, that aren't told or potentially to P3s in terms of highways that are told as an underlying support. Uh, so I, again, I, I uh, applaud the gentleman on his initiative and suggest that perhaps if we could get both sides together uh, to discuss a way to, to move this proposal forward and capture some of those 
uh, investors willing to go uh, not on daily returns or monthly returns, uh, but looking for long-term stable rates of return at a reasonable interest rate for, for projects that do generate revenue, uh, I, I think it has great merit. Well, thank you, thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you for that uh, support. I have filed it as a individual, separate, standalone bill, so uh, we'll see what happens, and we'll definitely I'll take your advice on some of the people to talk to. And with that, I would uh, like to withdraw the amendment. Well, uh, I thank the gentleman for withdrawing, and I, I will help to facilitate those discussions. I've had infinite discussions with them. I'm happy to sit you down in the room and, and, and see if we can work this out. So I thank the gentleman. Uh, the next amendment. Uh, the, uh, uh, the clerk will report uh, the next uh, amendment, which is uh, Mr. Davis, uh, number 106. Uh, no, I can't hear you. Mike wasn't on. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 2 offered by Mr. Davis of Illinois, 106. Uh, without objection, uh, this amendment uh, is uh, considered as read. And, and the gentleman is allowed to proceed for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my amendment to section 2603 would create an exemption for transit agencies looking to use automated vehicles or mobility as a service if they certify to the secretary it would save money, improve service, or be more environmentally sustainable. Uh, I'm willing to work with you on this issue, Mr. Chair, and with the rest of the members of this committee. So I will respectfully withdraw this amendment, uh, but I do want to address uh, some of the comments that were made earlier about our offer of amendments to speed up this process. It wasn't too long ago where you and I were having this discussion, Mr. Chair, about uh, what it would take to get through the Republican amendments that remain, but I wanna go back to the beginning of this process. I, I've been here, for previous surface transportation bills. I've been the recipient of being on the wrong side of a Four Corners Agreement on amendments, even when we were in the majority. We didn't get a chance to have a Four Corners Agreement this time. We were shut out of the process. And now we're left with Republican amendments only, but that is the only voice that our members have to be able to get their issues that are important to their constituents across this committee floor. And in good faith, in good faith, you asked us to offer a group of amendments to speed up the process, and all of us want that to happen. And we offered you 10 amendments. You took three. That's it. That's not something done in good faith, and that is not helping our members to have their voice. Don't silence our Republican members on this committee. This is what is frustrating, Mr. Chairman. We all, want to bring, we all want to get through these amendments that remain, but every one of these amendments are important to duly elected members of Congress. I withdrew this one, and I hope and pray we can come together over the next few hours, get an agreement, but be serious about it. Let's not say, oh, we're gonna to work to, to get through these amendments, we have 80 left, but we offered only 10. You took three. Maybe we should have offered 80. But it looks like you don't want to deal with this. It looks like you don't want to have, allow our members to have a voice. And if that's the case, it looks like we're going to give our members a voice tonight and we're going to be here a while. So with that, I withdrew the amendment and I'll yield back. Uh, well, I, I, I thank the gentleman's offer to withdraw. I, I would uh, contend the statistics I said of the remaining amendments, which we have reviewed, uh, we were willing to upfront take three. Uh, and the gentleman said, we've only taken 10 Republican amendments uh, and we've only considered, I don't know however many, we've considered well over 200 amendments and more than half of them are Republican amendments. Um, I can't remember another time in the history of this committee when 200 amendments have been offered on a bill uh, and 
I'm not certain when the gentleman came, but uh, uh, you know, I was here for the MAP Act, uh, where uh, every Democratic amendment uh, was rejected, uh, and uh, you know, the uh, the bill itself had been written by someone, presented to us on Monday and marked up on Wednesday. Uh, it wasn't written, as far as I can tell, in-house by Ledge Council or uh, the Republicans. Uh, contained bizarre provisions. Uh, for instance, the president could waive any and all laws, any and all laws, not just environmental laws, which you're focused on, uh, for uh, projects which he or she deemed to be in the national uh, interest. Uh, after, at 2 o'clock in the morning, I asked the clerk to read and asked for an interpretation from counsel. Um, there was a bit of embarrassment, although Representative Nadler did offer to support it because he thought, well, then, great, you can bring in illegal immigrants and pay them nothing uh, to do it. Uh, yeah, that was tongue-in-cheek, of course. Uh, it, it was withdrawn. But that process uh, did not in any way mirror this process. Uh, the gentleman uh, has indicated a willingness to work on climate issues. Uh, however, I would note uh, that the uh, substitute uh, that has been offered by the Republicans uh, contains zero provisions on climate. Uh, and that was the sticking point from the beginning. There have been complaints that we've woven climate uh, into a state grant programs and other provisions of the bill, and yes, we have. Uh, my side of the aisle does believe uh, in, uh, is that 2-6? Okay. Uh, we have, uh, we believe that not only do we need resilience for severe climate events, we believe severe climate events are accelerating uh, because of climate change, and we believe that climate change is substantially caused by human activity and greenhouse gas pollution. Uh, some on your side of the aisle, I believe, support that concept. Many others, uh, uh, including the president, uh, completely deny that context and think we should move, use even more fossil fuels. So in order to construct the bill, so it comprehensively addressed these issues, uh, we had to work independently. And given that your Starter Act contains nothing on those issues, uh, but even though you have indicated a willingness to work on climate change issues, I don't believe there is a majority on your side willing uh, to admit that we need to do fossil fuel reduction or deal with those issues uh, as we go forward. So that is why we came to this point. It's why I offered the bill Two weeks ago, no, I've been here a long time. Uh, no one has ever offered and put out a bill two weeks in advance for amendments. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have at this point uh, accepted 26 Republican amendments. I think you gave a much lower number. Uh, and uh, I've indicated a willingness to accept at least from those we know of another three. Uh, but uh, at this point, uh, I appreciate the gentleman's willingness to withdraw, and we will proceed to the next amendment. The amendment is withdrawn. Mr. Chairman. Yes, I'll, I'll recognize uh, Mr. Graves for a statement out of order because i sorry, I didn't know he wanted to be recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, um, one, I, I, I want to tell you thank you for working with us on, on, on some of the amendments that, you, that you've worked with us on. But, but I, I, I do want to echo, and I, I didn't have any plans on speaking, but I do want to echo the concerns of, of Mr. Davis. Now, you, you, you commented on how many amendments we've been through. Well, actually, let me back up. You, you talked about when Mr. Micah was here and your frustration in the process. So, so obviously, and, and look, I wasn't here. I had, had nothing to do with that. I don't know anybody. That's right. I don't think any of us were here. And so to sit there and reflect upon a process that you went through that was painful, that was inappropriate, and then to turn around and replicate it, but, but being in the majority and us in the minority, come on. You're, you're better than that. The reason we have so many amendments on this bill, over 300 and over 100 Democrat amendments on the bill, 
is because this, this bill wasn't written in the way that all the other bills, save the one that you brought up, have been written. And I understand coronavirus, everybody was in different places, and I absolutely understand the complexity of trying to, to, to build a bill w under those circumstances. But, but over 100 Democrat amendments, and yes, there's a disproportionate number of Republican amendments, and, and that's because we were especially shut out of the process. Um, we all represent people, and so we're here trying to represent them. That's what we're trying to do. And I understand ideologically or policy-wise, philosophically, you may not agree, and that's fine. You're representing the people that sent you here, and I respect that. But, but we're, we're, look, some of these amendments, I get it, Mr. Chairman. Y'all aren't on board. You don't agree. But some of these amendments are good policy amendments. A disproportionate number of Dem amendments were accepted in managers and, and agreed to work with them. They're going to show up later in the process. Um, in, in regard to the climate stuff, I, I, I got to tell you, I heard Sam say that we're willing to talk about it and negotiate it. I've said it over and over again. I know that Mr. Westerman, Mr. Palmer, uh, other people on this committee are willing to have that discussion. I know that the United States has been, has resulted, the United States actions, even under the Trump administration, have resulted in the greatest reduction in emissions in the world more than the next 12 countries combined. And yes, I take issue, as other members of this committee do, including Ms. Fletcher, I take issue with the fact that people come in and say, we need to get rid of fossil fuels. I hate to say this, but fossil fuels and, and better technology associated with them is the reason we are the global leader in emissions reduction. It, it's not the fuels. It's the way that the technology associated with the fuels is being used. Challenge me on that. I would love to have this debate with any of you. You sit there and make things up and then go out there and, and base policy on it. The facts are that the reason we've had the greatest reduction in, in emissions in the world is because of natural gas, which we're producing and we're trying to export, and we're exporting now to 35 different countries, which results in greater emissions reduction around the globe. So, so Mr. Chairman, we're willing to work with you on that and other issues. But, but we want to be able to have a voice and represent the people here just like you wanted when the MAP Act came up years I, ago. I thank the gentleman for his remarks. The gentleman's time has expired. Um, at this point, there are no amendments pending. Uh, we will move on to the next amendment. That amendment was withdrawn. Uh, the clerk will recognize Mr. Davis, number 113. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2, offered by Mr. Davis of Illinois, uh, number 113. Uh, I, if, if the gentleman would allow, before I recognize him, um, I thought that we discussed earlier that if we made this as uh, something discretionary on the behalf of UTCs to propose through the regular research process, uh, that we'd, we'd go forward, but we didn't want to see uh, a mandate which required uh, the marijuana, which already uh, in HTSA has uh, uh, funded a massive amount of research on trying to figure out a way to detect impairment. And uh, we were concerned that it would jeopardize many other uh, uh, safety programs. And I, I thought we already discussed that. And the gentleman was going to work on language to make it discretionary on the part of UTCs. Uh, before Mr. we go Chair. into the amendment, I would recognize the gentleman briefly. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm more than willing to work with you and your team on this issue. I, I showed my willingness earlier. I, I thought we might be able to get some language uh, or at least discussion before we got to this point in the amendment process. If you're willing to work with us, I'm going to trust you to do that on this. I think it's an important issue. We have to have, even in states that have legalized recreational cannabis, like my home state of Illinois, we have to have a test to determine what the level of THC may be for an individual 
to determine whether or not they're safe to drive on our roadways, to protect our families, protect everyone. So I'm willing to work with you. I, I do believe, Mr. Chair, that you uh, and I agree on this issue. Uh, I am willing to withdraw this amendment with uh, that, that, uh, that willingness. Uh, but I do want to add to what Mr. Graves said. Not one member of this committee in here present today was here during MAP 21. Okay. We were here, many of us were here during the FAST Act. The process was much, much different. And you know as well as I do, Mr. Chair, that during that process, when we got to this point in the markup, when we got, number one, there weren't nearly as many minority amendments because a lot of them were included in the underlying text. We didn't have that opportunity. Now we're here and we offered a good faith effort, just like we said we would. And the answer is a minimal amount of accepted amendments. I, none of us want to stay here till midnight. None of us want to be on video or here tomorrow. So please have your team sit down and do what people asked to be done before this markup even started. Give us a chance as the minority to have the same voice that the minority members had when Chairman Schuster sat in that chair and there were many more opportunities to have a bipartisan bill. I was optimistic before this committee markup started. I said that in my opening statement that we could come together. There are plenty of chances, but here we are now. We offered, we're working with you. We're gonna continue to work with your team. And I certainly hope they come back with an offer that's a lot better than accepting such a minuscule amount of our members' voices. Otherwise, we're going to make sure that their voices are heard, and we're going to make sure that we get a chance to represent our constituents from across this great nation, at the same time affect surface transportation policy. These are not political amendments. It's good transportation policy. Help us out. We want to work with you, be it climate change, be it any other issue that's related to surface transportation. It doesn't have to be this way, Mr. Chair. I thank the gentleman. This time has expired. Uh, again, I'm trying to remember what, what's the name of their alternative? The starter bill. Uh, the other side of the aisle did have an opportunity and two weeks to draft an alternative. The alternative excludes any investment, zero investment, none, nada, zilch, in reducing fossil fuel pollution or climate change initiatives. Unlike, unlike, this is my time, Senator Barrasso's bill on the Senate side. And early on, I heard, and I uh, both spoke to you and Mr. Graves, that uh, your staff was absolutely appalled that the Republicans in the Senate would ag agree to any reduction or any programs targeted toward fossil fuel reduction. You and Mr. Graves and a few others have indicated an interest to work on that. Uh, unfortunately, it is not reflected in any part of your bill. In terms of uh, the FAST Act, uh, I, yes, uh, we worked together. The numbers were way below what I wanted. The pay-fors were fake. Uh, and there were numerous other issues with the bill, but basically it was a status quo bill. It was just a status quo bill of the previous compromise and a status quo bill of the one before that and a status quo bill of the one before that and the one before that and the one before that, which takes us back almost to the Eisenhower era. Uh, it's the 21st century. We are confronted with the issue of climate change. Now, you don't have to believe in it. I do. And uh, virtually every Democrat in the House of Representatives serving in the majority, and we did win the majority in the last election, believes it's a serious issue. And if it is not dealt for in a meaningful way with the sector that provides the largest source of carbon pollution in this country, then 
uh, since Trump has withdrawn from the Paris Agreement. Uh, and uh, there were figures thrown out that we've shown the biggest, yeah, we've got a huge reduction in carbon pollution going on right now because no one's driving. Uh, but no, we have not adhered to, nor are we on uh, a track to meet the targets that have been set through the Paris Accords. We've withdrawn from the Paris Accords. Uh, and uh, we are determined in this bill and in other bills uh, to deal with that issue. So that is why, at this point, uh, we have gotten to this point. And uh, with that, uh, I uh, would turn to staff uh, to see what the next amendment is. OK, let me. Uh, at this point, uh, uh, we would uh, go to Mr. Uh, Schmucker, the uh, clerk will report. Sorry, designate. Mr. Schmucker, 025 is what I have in front of me. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR2 offered by Mr. Schmucker, number 025. Okay, uh, the, without uh, objection, the amendment is considered as read and the gentleman's right advised for three minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, we're all familiar with uh, Amtrak uh, track and the uh, Northeast, Northeast Corridor uh, and the lines associated with that. Amtrak has owned that corridor since uh, 19... 76 after an $86 million purchase funded by Congress. One of those Northeast Corridor lines includes the Keystone Line, which runs right through the district that I represent, Pennsylvania's 11th Congressional uh, District, uh, which runs between Philadelphia and Harrisburg in Pennsylvania. Uh, the uh, Northeast Corridor Lines were conveyed to Amtrak as part of the bankrupt railroad reorganization of the 1970s required by the Regional Rail Reorganization Act, or what we call the 3R Act, and then the Railroad Revitalization and Regulatory Reform Act, or the 4R Act. Uh, additionally, uh, Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority, known as SEPTA, operates its Paoli uh, to Thorndale commuter rail services along the Keystone Line, uh, and serves the majority of the Amtrak stations along that line, and in fact, Amtrak uses only four of the stations that are used by SEPTA. Uh, SEPTA and Pennsylvania pay all costs of maintaining and improving the Amtrak stations that are used solely by SEPTA. The uh, 4R Act, in fact, um, uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and SEPTA have supported Amtrak uh, with payments of more than $263 million. These are taxpayer dollars that uh, we think could be more effectively spent if kept uh, within the Commonwealth. This is dollars coming from Pennsylvania. Uh, despite PennDOT subsidies, Amtrak loses money on the Keystone Line and derives no benefits from the sa uh, stations that are solely used by SEPTA on the Northeastern Spine. Uh, the public interest in an efficient, streamlined Amtrak uh, and in better service for SEPTA commuters would be best served if the Keystone Line, the Keystone Line stations, and the stations solely used by SEPTA were conveyed to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, and that's exactly what this amendment does. It would require Amtrak and the Secretary to make that conveyance no later than June 30th of next year. Uh, importantly, Amtrak's passenger rail operations could continue business as usual in this amendment, would preserve Amtrak's right to operate over the Keystone Line and use the stations conveyed to Pennsylvania on the same terms as existing law. State and local control over this line would allow for more frequent service and at a lower cost uh, to travelers, uh, improving the frequency of the trips along the line. Uh, would provide residents along the line more access to job opportunities and businesses access to new markets. It would also mean that more cars are taken off the road, leading to less congestion uh, and less vehicle emissions. So I urge my colleagues to support this amendment and yield back my time. Thank you, gentlemen. Others wish to be heard. Uh, hearing none. Uh, Chairman. Uh, I will entertain a discussion relevant to the amendment. 
Mr. Chairman, I'm uh, parliamentary inquiry. Um, the, the chairman was able to give a response to, to our comments, and, and um, I, I want to be able to give a response to that. It was my understanding that I controlled my three minutes. That would be response to a response to a response to a response, but if the gentleman wishes to drag this out till 3 or 4 in the morning, go right ahead. Mr. Chairman, that's not my intent. It's not my intent. It's that if things are said that aren't accurate or, or mischaracterizing things that we've done or said, I think it's important for the record, I think it's important for the American public that we're here trying to represent to understand exactly what our position is. We, we have been, in, in, the, in the amendments we've offered, in the, in the Republican alternative, there, there is a resilience title, 93 pages worth of resilience provisions in there, number one. Number two, Mr. Chairman, um, I'd like to remind you that 45Q, which is the Tax Incentive for Carbon Sequestration, was a Republican initiative that is law today. Number three, I'm the ranking member of the Climate Committee. That committee was charged with coming up with a comprehensive climate change strategy for this Congress. And, and, and now that's not going to happen and there's going to be some type of alternative report. But it was my understanding that there was going to be a comprehensive strategy released that then was going to be farmed out to all of the relevant committees. That way we wouldn't be doing this thing piecemeal by doing different things to cars and then something else to energy and something else to telecommunications or whatever. We'd be looking at it holistically. And so that's what I thought we were going to be doing. Um, uh, next, I, I, you, you made reference to some staff rumors about our position. I, 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 I speak for myself. I'm willing to have a climate negotiation with you and with anyone else. And, and I believe that the ranking member has, has made the, 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 the same offer to, to the committee. Um, no one came to us with text saying, hey, this is what we'd like to do. I'd be happy to look at that. And lastly, Mr. Chairman, in regard to the Paris Agreement, I, I understand that, that we may have differences of opinion on the Paris Agreement, but let's be clear. There's no country virtually that, that is on track to meet their targets. The United States, I'll say it again, we've reduced emissions more than the next 12 countries combined. And yes, I think and I fully support withdrawing from Paris, and here's why. Because for every one ton of reduction, that we've reduced, China has come in and increased emissions multiple times the reduction that we've had. And that's allowed under Paris. I don't agree with that. I think that's awful policy to allow other countries not just to not have a reduction target, especially countries like China that are out there doing some of the, 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 the uh, offensive activities around the world that they're doing. A country like China to, to, who, who is countering U.S. interest all over the globe to be able to continue increasing emissions while the United States is reducing, therefore resulting in a net increase. So I think we should continue on an emissions reduction strategy, but not be a party to an agreement that says it's okay for China and other countries to be releasing emissions to the extent that they are. Go back. I think those are the folks that agree. Gentlemen, I don't want to belabor the debate. Resilience is something in response to climate change and severe weather events. It does not deal with climate change. It deals with its results. With that, um, I will speak uh, on the amendment unless someone else wishes to be recognized. Uh, the uh, amendment uh, goes to, uh, there are a number of issues here. Uh, there, you, Amtrak has a very unique status according to numerous Supreme Court rulings. Uh, and uh, I believe uh, one of the first problems with this amendment uh, is it would violate a previous ruling to the Supreme Court regarding the status of Amtrak. Secondly, um, it sets a uh, extraordinarily bad uh, relationship uh, for uh, the future of states with Amtrak. Uh, Mr. Lipinski from Illinois wanted to do something similar, and I discouraged him from offering a similar amendment, which I suppose a number of other jurisdictions would want to do to further fragment uh, the Amtrak system. 
Amtrak has owned, maintained, recapitalized, dispatched the 100-mile Harrisburg line for 40 years after taking it over from a collapsed, bankrupt private entity called Conrail. SEPTA runs commuter trains over portions of the line, and its use of stations and parking was governed by the terms of a 30-year lease that expired in 2017 and required $1 per year. Now SEPTA and Amtrak are having a hard time negotiating a new lease. Maybe they should pay $2 per year. Uh, and uh, negotiating uh, that, they've had multiple filings at the Service Transportation Board, which has clear jurisdiction under court precedent and under statute as I understand them. Uh, and uh, there is going to be an adjustment over and above the $1 per year. And I understand that the local agencies may not want to pay more than $1 per year. Uh, but uh, we are, uh, you know, at this point, uh, you know, it looked like Amtrak would actually break even on operating this year. We're still paying their capital costs, uh, which is totally justified since there, again, is no rail system in the world that both maintains its train sets and the rail bed and makes money. Uh, so that's justified. Uh, but uh, reducing their opportunity to get fair rental uh, revenues uh, would uh, not uh, be appropriate. Uh, and the amendment says it designates Amtrak as an agency, which the Supreme Court has said it's not, uh, is uh, not enough to violate, uh, to avoid a violation of takings clause in the Fifth Amendment, giving uh, Amtrak unique status. So I would have to oppose the amendment. Do others, Chairman. Do others wish to be recognized on the amendment? Heard somebody out there. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is uh, uh, uh -huh. Tucker. Sorry, uh, speak a little louder, please. Okay, uh, listen, I'm I'm uh, willing to withdraw uh, this amendment. Uh, I do think it is important. I do want to just mention that uh, the CEO of Amtrak, in a hearing before our committee, said they were better designed to run the longer. Uh, lines like the Northeast line and not a commuter line like uh, the Keystone. I think this would be beneficial for the constituents that I represent and people up and down uh, this line, but uh, I'm willing to withdraw it from consideration for the markup today and hope to revisit this proposal uh, as this process moves forward. Uh, I thank the gentleman. I thank Mr. Schmucker. Um, you know, the, we, it, this is a confusing status, but there was a Supreme Court ruling that it's actually a private corporation. Uh, therefore, you know, taking does apply. Uh, I'm willing to help the gentleman. As I told Mr. Lipinski, I would be to negotiate a fair agreement and, uh, you know, better agreements with the commuter lines who are putting a lot more people on those lines than Amtrak. Uh, just as long as it doesn't disrupt with their utilization of the line, and I'd be happy to work with you. We do have a new CEO, or whatever, whatever we call him, president of the Amtrak private corporation, private public sort of corporation. Uh, and, uh, you know, I just recently, I, I knew him when he ran Atlas Airlines. He does have some experience with rail, uh, and uh, I would help facilitate discussions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that and look forward to that. All right. Uh, with that, the amendment is withdrawn. We'll move on to the next amendment. Uh, next amendment. Uh, this would be an um, amendment by uh, Mr. Graves, number 128. Uh, clerk will designate the amendment. I shouldn't amendment. have to say that. I, th I think maybe if I just sort of say that, you. but anyway, I'll say that. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2, offered by Mr. Graves of Louisiana, number 128. Uh, the, uh, the amendment uh, is considered read without objection, and uh, the gentleman is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, I don't know if this is uh, um, coincidence, serendipitous, or, or divine intervention, um, but the timing of this amendment is, is pretty fascinating. So this is an amendment that would take an existing Department of Energy um, uh, categorical exclusion 
and it would apply it to projects uh, in airports, on airport property. And let me, let me give you an example, Mr. Chairman, of the type of projects that this categorical exclu exclusion would apply to. It would apply to solar energy farms, 10 acres or larger. It would apply to charging stations, vehicle charging stations. Um, it would apply to ground source heat pumps. Um, Mr. Chairman, these are, these are, I think you would agree, um, emissions reducing technologies, approaches. Uh, this is an amendment that I filed well before um, this conversation that we just had. Um, and, and Mr. Chairman, I also want to um, make note that resilience projects are absolutely, positively foundational to any climate solution or approach that, that, we, um, that we move on, that we take, that, that, that we act on. Because Mr. Chairman, as, as we know, the science, which I think we need to be incorporating more of into these discussions, the science has been clear, is crystal clear, that there's anywhere from 50 to 75 to maybe even 100 years of momentum built up in the atmosphere right now. Uh, I recall my, my friend from Alabama, uh, Mr. Palmer, a fellow member of the Climate Committee, asking, uh, I believe it was three experts, um, the witnesses, that, and I think there were even majority witnesses that, that came to the committee and, and asked them a, a question, and I'd yield to him to tell the story. One of the witnesses was one of the uh, principal editors of the International Panel on Climate Change Report uh, and one of the authors, and I asked them, if the United States went to absolute zero CO2 emissions, would it stop climate change? And after an embarrassing long pause, they admitted it would not. Then I asked if it, the entire world went to zero CO2 emissions, would it stop climate change? And the British scientist who was on the IPCC panel admitted that it would not. Thank you. Um, uh, reclaiming my time, Mr. Chairman, um, we know that there's momentum built up, and we must respond to that momentum that's built up, which means addressing sea rise and other challenges that, that, that we know are before us. Um, so let me, let me just come back to this amendment and say that this amendment would apply an existing approved categorical exclusion that the Department of Energy has applied. It would simply allow the, the FAA to apply it uh, to projects that result in the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, um, uh, like the examples that I laid out, I urge adoption of the amendment and yield back. Other members wish to be heard on the amendment. May I speak on the amendment, Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to echo my colleague from Louisiana's sentiment that we are totally committed to uh, improving the use of energy, uh, including renewables but we're also committed to doing things that make sense. Uh, for instance, we know that uh, there are ice sheets in Antarctica that are breaking off. There's one ice sheet, the last time it broke off was 125,000 years ago. Uh, you know, the reason it broke off was because of climate change. We know the climate is changing. The question is, are we going to take measures uh, to prepare for that, to mitigate against it, resiliency measures that we hope to get into uh, our surface transportation bill that make sense. Uh, I've mentioned a couple times that I worked for two international engineering companies, one of which was uh, uh, combustion engineering in the environmental systems division. So I have an understanding of the importance of, of clean air, clean water. Uh, we all breathe the same air, our kids breathe the same air, they drink the same water. We're committed to making sure that we have a livable environment. And to do that, we need to, to make sensible reforms. We need to prepare ahead of time for what we know will happen. And there's no question that, that the climate's changing. The interesting thing is that the science shows that CO2 rises after uh, climate uh, temperatures have gone up, not before. So I just wanna encourage you to, to to work with us, uh, and, and I, I it really, I, you know, it's my first term on, on this committee. Uh, at the very beginning of this committee, as I said in my opening remarks uh, yesterday, I was very um, um, 
optimistic that we would be able to work together to get a surface transportation bill. Uh, I thought that, that this was, of all the committees in Congress, uh, alongside uh, the Armed Services Committee, the most bipartisan committee in Congress. And it, it is extremely disappointing to be shut out of the process. Uh, you, you mentioned our, our starter bill. Well, that starter bill is not just the bill, it's a start of a conversation that never took place. And um, I appreciate your indulgence to, of the amendments that, that my colleagues and I are offering. Uh, it would, in my opinion, though, sir, it would have been much better if we'd had the opportunity to do this uh, as you did with uh, your colleagues to come up with a better bill. And uh, I thank you for, for indulging my comments, and I yield back. Well, I thank the gentleman. I thank him also for his recognition of climate change. Uh, unfortunately, I don't believe you're in a majority on your side of the aisle. Um, you know, uh, we have a provision in the larger infra infrastructure package that would increase uh, investments in critical airport projects that would reduce emissions. It's particularly targeted to decreasing emissions, increasing climate resiliency, and make other needed investments, including the potential to make available renewable fuels for aviation. Uh, it'll be a very significant uh, title, uh, uh, numbering in the billions of dollars. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would urge uh, the two gentlemen uh, to work with us. I'm, I'm, you know, as I mentioned earlier, 93% of federally funded projects go forward under a CE. From the things you listed, they could probably fit in a CE. Uh, but it potentially can include wind turbines, which interfere with radar and potentially with uh, navigation, uh, and uh, also uh, issues uh, regarding pipelines, which could go under the runways, and uh, tunneling under a runway is always very problematic given the massive weights uh, they have to sustain with 380s and well, 747s are going away, but who knows what's out there in the future. Uh, so I have a concern about doing it in this particular bill, in this form, uh, but I'd be happy to work with the two gentlemen or others concerned and see if they think we have adequately addressed this in the other title to the infrastructure bill, which will be offered when we go to the floor. And, uh, you know, if uh, you don't think it's uh, broad enough, but I'm not going to go there for wind turbines. Uh, you know, that is a, uh, a known hazard, both vertically to aviation and also in terms of radar reflection uh, and other things. So I, I'm not willing to just give as broad an exemption. I don't believe it belongs in the service bill. It belongs much better in the aviation title. Uh, which will be part of the infrastructure package and be happy to work with the two gentlemen on uh, that. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the offer to work with us. Um, uh, very quickly, the existing categorical exclusion already allows for a three-acre wind farm to for categorical exclusion under, under existing FAA policy. Um, I, I'm actually I do appreciate your offer to work with us, and I, and I certainly would welcome that, but I, I, I want to say that I'm actually even more concerned to hear that there's going to be an aviation title that's going to be added on the floor because that does circumvent regular order and, and is even worse than the, than the uh, process that we're going under right now. So I, I, I apologize, but, but in light of that, I, I am going to ask for a recorded vote. Okay, recorded votes. Request to report to code will be delayed to an appropriate time. Mr. Graves has yet another amendment. Mr. Graves will be recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2, offered by Mr. Graves of Louisiana, number 127. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the gentleman is recognized for three minutes, without objection, you. considered as read. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, the... the the Congress directed the FAA to develop a, 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 and implement an expedited uh, environmental review process for a, a limited number and scope 
of, of aviation projects, projects that address uh, capacity, aviation safety, aviation security. Um, and um, the, the, this process has taken place. Unfortunately, the FAA has applied it to a, a very small number of projects. Uh, the Council of Environmental Quality did a report in 2018 that determined that the FAA actually has the longest average environmental review process in the federal government. Um, I'll say it again, these are projects, not just capacity, Mr. Chairman, but aviation safety, the safety of passengers, the, the aviation safety and aviation security, the security of airports, the security of passengers. And so what this amendment would do is, um, is it would effectively would, would um, extend uh, the application of this expedited process um, to more projects moving forward and allow for us to um, expedite implementation. Mr. Chairman, we discussed earlier in light of some of the transit and aviation dollars in the CARES Act that there are substantial dollars that have been uh, allocated to airports, in some cases, uh, outrageous amount of money. Um, but, um, but, but this would help to implement those projects, certainly uh, getting dirt turned and projects moving as quickly as possible. Um, and someone is not muted, please mute. Gentlemen will proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the, the, all this does is it directs the FAA to consider application of this expedited process to additional projects. Again, Mr. Chairman, I think that uh, some of the aviation safety and aviation security projects, certainly you and I share uh, the, the, the objective of improving both of those categories in addition to capacity. And, uh, and so I'd urge adoption of the amendment and yield back. Thanks. I believe the gentleman would uh, should ask the Federal Aviation Administration to report on their current authority um, to expedite urgent projects for especially those for congested airport and those for security is working and whether or not they need uh, additional authority. And we're going down the road of gradually expediting or exempting everything. With that, I would oppose the amendment. Are there others who wish to speak in favor of the amendment or? or on the amendment, uh, hearing none, uh, then uh, we will move to concert, oh, are there amendments to the amendment? Hearing none, uh, we will move to consideration of the amendment. Uh, the amendment, uh, uh, those who are in favor of the amendment uh, will please unmute and prepare to vote. Uh, those who are in favor of the amendment will vote by saying aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Those who are opposed to the amendment will unmute, prepare to vote, and at this point, I signify by saying nay. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the nays have it. Uh, the amendment is not agreed to. Mr. Chairman, ask for a recorded vote. A recorded vote is requested, will be added to the queue. Uh, next in order will be Mr. Smucker. Uh, the clerk will report Mr. Smucker 026, I believe. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR2 offered by Mr. Smucker, number 026. Uh, the amendment will be considered as read without objection. Will uh, the gentleman is recognized for three minutes? Thank you, Mr. Chair. This amendment grants the FF. FAA flexibility to use a small amount of airport improvement program funds to facilitate, facilitate innovative financing of airport projects. Uh, you know, flexibility and certainty are in short supply. The air aviation industry is facing tough times, and, and this would help uh, in creative ways to address that. Uh, there is an existing pilot program that this amendment replaces that has never been used by the FAA, even as our nation's infrastructure is uh, really desperate for new and innovative ways to finance and complete projects. Uh, this will make this program, this amendment will make this program more useful, helping airports fund important infrastructure projects and creating jobs. 
the amendment also extends FAA's successful letter of intent program to smaller airports under conditions reflective of their size. Uh, it will allow airports in small and rural communities take advantage of stable funding and financing opportunities that previously were reserved only for the larger mega hub airports. Uh, these small changes will add important and potent tools to the FAA's toolbox and help our nation's airports, large and small, to deliver projects more efficiently. So I urge my colleagues to support this amendment and uh, yield back my time. Uh, this gentleman, the gentleman's amendment goes directly to airport infrastructure, not other uh, related and or extraneous issues, and I'm prepared to support the amendment. Uh, anyone else wish to be heard? If no one else wishes to be heard, uh, I will take the risk and ask that the uh, amendment be adopted by unanimous consent without objection. So ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the gentleman will designate uh, an amendment by Mr. Graves from Louisiana. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 2 offer Mr. Graves, Louisiana, number 133. Uh, without objection, the amendment is considered as read. The gentleman uh, is recognized for three minutes to uh, up to three minutes to address his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I know that uh, the, the lack of drivers uh, for 18-wheelers, uh, for, for trucks is a, is a concern for many of us in the committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I know that you, I know that Mr. Davis and others have have worked to try to improve the, the capacity training and others uh, to, to help meet that demand because it does have an impact on, on consumers around, around the United States. Um, right now, especially with, uh, with the high unemployment rates that we're experiencing uh, around this country, I think it's especially important that we work to try to uh, expedite the, the availability and the training for um, some of these uh, CDL drivers, these commercial uh, drivers to, to get them uh, behind the wheel, of course, when they're ready and safely. Um, what we found, Mr. Chairman, is that um, around the country, uh, there are um, a number of states, in fact, I think they're, they're around um, uh, tw over 20 states that, that have pretty extraordinary delays in the testing uh, for commercial driver's license. So, so as a result of the delays in testing by the states, uh, it delays the uh, availability of truck drivers. In fact, we have uh, found over and over again that truck driver uh, job offers have actually been withdrawn because they have been unable to simply get through the bureaucracy of states waiting weeks and weeks uh, to, to get their actual CDL testing. And Mr. Chairman, I know that you share this concern. And I ask unanimous consent that this letter uh, be inserted into the record to the um, Government Accountability Without objection. Office, Government Accountability Office, uh, signed by uh, members of this committee, including uh, Ms. Norton, Mr. Cires, um, Mr. Johnson of Georgia, uh, and, and you, Mr. Chairman, asking uh, that, that this issue be looked at, that they come up with a solution here. And so what our amendment does, uh, Mr. Chairman, is it simply says that, that any state um, that has a delay in the, in the testing uh, that does delay or result in greater unemployment that prevents people from being able to get jobs in the trucking industry to help address that backlog, um, that those states uh, open up to a third-party testing option. And so, again, the states don't have to do this as long as they can ensure a short time frame like 27 states today have where they allow for third-party testing. And so, Mr. Chairman, I, um, I urge adoption of the amendment. Um, I know this is something that, that many of us in this committee on, on both sides of the aisle share, and it does address an important priority uh, for uh, uh, many people in this nation, including consumers that are, that are impacted by the driver shortage during this high unemployment. Uh, yield back. Uh, do other members wish to be heard on the amendment? Hearing none, I'll speak to the amendment. I do agree with the uh, gentleman's intent uh, that we have an efficient system of licensing commercial drivers uh, in 
as the particularly recently the demand for goods movement is continuing to rise. However, this amendment would prohibit, prohibit, ban, stop, end, providing more than $250,000 in grant funds to state DMVs. Now, I don't know all your state DMVs. Uh, unless the state allows private commercial driving schools and independent commercial driver's license testing facilities to serve as third-party testers. I don't know uh, what percentage of DOTs currently allow that. Uh, I am reluctant to uh, do such a mandate on the 50 states. I know in my state uh, it is not allowed. Uh, and we're not having problems processing. Uh, there may be some states, perhaps Louisiana, that is having problems. Uh, and uh, the other thing I would reflect on, not the jurisdiction of this committee, uh, but in considering the uh, loan forgiveness programs, uh, which Ms. DeVos has blocked, uh, one of the greatest offenders uh, was uh, so-called commercial driving schools with incredibly low uh, placement rates and low standards, and the people could not pass uh, their DMV exams. So I'm reluctant to allow a private firm to do the work, given a poor record of some of these companies, and then allow them to set up a subsidiary that would also test the people that they had, that they had trained that can't pass a state DMV test and allow them uh, on the highways. Uh, you know, the, uh, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration's process of implementing strong entry-level driver training rules. Uh, you know, state DMVs do need to upgrade their IT system. It stinks in my state. Uh, and to ensure verification of driver training uh, prior to issuing a CDL, uh, this bill provides significantly more money for CDL improvement program to help states with this effort to update uh, their IT systems. And I don't believe that we should limit states to $250,000 with a new federal mandate that they must, must uh, defer to independent, uh, not only uh, training, but also independent certification for CDLs. With that, I strongly oppose the amendment. Mr. Chairman? Do others wish to be heard? Uh, Has expired and... Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm um, willing to make an offer to withdraw. I, I just um, want to clarify one point and, and, and I will withdraw uh, the amendment um, with, a, with a, a, a agreement from the chairman that we can work to see if we can find a way to make this happen. I just, I, I do want to clarify for the record, it doesn't just penalize states and take money away. It only, the, the penalty only comes into place under this amendment if um, a state is unable to reduce the delay in, in, the, in the backlog of testing. So every state is given the option to keep full funding. Um, it is only if that state is unable to, to address the backlog in testing, then they would be required to open up to a third party, and if they refuse to do that, then they would uh, to be subject to the penalty. So I just want to clarify, but with that, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be withdrawn if, if, the, if the gentleman will agree to work with us to see if we can address this backlog. I thank the, uh, the gentleman for the offer to withdraw, and, and I believe uh, that in the uh, additional funds we are providing to the states, like mine, with outdated uh, computer systems, uh, that we are addressing that issue, but we can look at ways to further enhance uh, the expedition of you know, fully certifying uh, training and testing drivers. Uh, I, I thank the gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the amendment is withdrawn. Um, the uh, next amendment uh, is, um, oh, it's a strike, so it doesn't have, oh, there it is up there. It's a different format. Um, the clerk will designate Mr. Smucker, number 24. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2, offer Mr. Smucker, number 024. 
Uh, without objection, the amendment's considered as read. Uh, and uh, I would, the uh, gentleman is recognized for up to three minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, uh, Chairman DeFazio. I don't think this will take long. Uh, freight and commuter railroads regularly collaborate to find solutions that allow for both parties to meet the needs of their customers over the same rail line. Uh, negotiations between both those parties for use of these lines are unique to each project and need to be evaluated, are evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Current law allows for non-binding mediation related to trackage use requests and right-of-ways uh, use requests to resolve any disputes that arise from those negotiations. And the only uh, prerequisite under current law uh, is that the parties could not reach an agreement after a reasonable period of negotiation. Um, this bill doesn't change that, but it does add a potential barrier to non-binding mediation uh, because the Surface Transportation Board would have to determine whether the railroad gave, uh, quote, good faith consideration to the commuters, again, quote, reasonable request. Uh, these provisions, I believe, could actually create a barrier to that access by requiring the STB to make a legal determination before mediation could begin. I think the process is working as is. Why make it more complicated uh, and uncertain? Uh, so this uh, amendment would strike the language that makes changes to that process. Uh, so I urge my colleagues to support this amendment and uh, yield back my time. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for yielding back. Uh, are there other members who wish to be recognized on this amendment? Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes. Mr. Lipinski. Lipinski, yes, you're recognized for up to three minutes, Mr. Lipinski. Uh, thank you. I, I think that I uh, agree with uh, Mr. Smucker. Excuse me, Dan, on, Dan, uh, Dan, you started out louder, you got softer. Move a little closer to the microphone so all can hear you, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, it seems like that I agree with Mr. Smucker about the uh, the need for commuter and freight rail to be able to come together when uh, commuter rail agency wants to add more, more service. And, and right now, a, uh, a freight rail uh, railroad uh, can simply ignore or um, you know, not be cooperative in any way with the commuter rail. I've, I've seen that many times happen in, uh, in my district. Uh, most of the time, I should say, the freight railroad does is a corporate citizen, good corporate citizen, but we have to rely on that. Uh, the intention of this, of putting in the requirement of a good faith uh, consideration by the freight railroad or when the commuter railroad wants to add service is to give a little bit more leverage to the commuter railroad. Uh, Mr. Smucker uh, seems to think that this is going to be an impediment uh, to uh, the commuter railroad having the ability to add new service and be able to negotiate, make it harder to negotiate with the freight railroads. The intention certainly is to require freight railroads to negotiate in good faith. And I think this strengthens, and certainly the intention is to strengthen the position of commuter railroads. Uh, so. Uh, I, I oppose this, this amendment. Uh, if there are issues that Mr. Smucker has that he thinks uh, that uh, this will actually weaken uh, the commuter railroads vis-a-vis -vis the freight railroads, uh, then uh, hopefully that uh, we can defeat this amendment. We can talk about that after, uh, after the, this bill passes and uh, maybe come together on something. But uh, I, I really think that uh, this language as it is in, in the bill in, in requiring the freight railroads to enter into good faith uh, negotiations is a, a step forward for commuter railroads. I'd like to see uh, it go further than that. I'd like to see commuter railroads have more leverage, uh, but today is not the day to, uh, uh, to talk about that. So that I ask uh, the, my colleagues to oppose the, uh, the amendment and I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Do others wish to be heard? Um, just briefly, I uh, uh, endorse the amendments by the uh, subcommittee uh, chair. 
Uh, you know, um, there has been multiple litigations by the freight rail industry to get around the law, which says uh, Amtrak should have preference. Uh, and currently, um, you know, we are seeing uh, delays that are principally caused by freight and any, uh, we're attempting to improve that modestly in this bill. Uh, versus, uh, you know, other much more vigorous mandates that I think uh, the committee uh, should think about. So uh, I, I would also oppose the amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, uh, I, I appreciate uh, the uh, comments and particularly appreciate also uh, Mr. Lipinski's comments. I value his uh, opinion and appreciate the offer to work together to uh, try to solve this. So, uh, you know, I will be happy to withdraw uh, this amendment from uh, consideration for uh, markup today and hope that um, it, we can continue to discuss this and uh, revisit this uh, moving forward. All right. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Will yield? What? Uh, the gentleman will yield? Uh, yes. Yes. I, I appreciate that, uh, and, and the, uh, we will work. Uh, we will work on this. Make sure it uh, is doing what uh, we intended to do. All right. Thank you. Uh, thanks to you both uh, for working that out virtually, uh, and the uh, amendment is withdrawn. And uh, at this point, uh, for uh, I'm going to confer with the uh, ranking member, and the committee will stand in recess for. Uh, till quarter after the hour. That's seven minutes from now. What? Oh, okay. We're in recess.
long anticipated moment has arrived. Uh, the committee uh, will return uh, to order. Uh, we have had some discussions with minority and we found out a way to not go till three or four in the morning uh, and accommodate uh, people. So uh, I appreciate uh, the discussions and the agreement and the members uh, who participated. So thank you. Uh, at that point, uh, we are first going to call up an on block amendment uh, to, uh, to move. And I will uh, list them, then the clerk will designate. Uh, it'll be Miller 033. Whoop. <laughs> Thank you. We have a footnote. Uh, Spano 037, Spano 038, Gibbs 032, Garrett Graves 133, Garrett Graves 148, and Garrett Graves 129 as revised. The clerk will designate the on block amendments. Mr. Chairman, who is offering the on block amendment? Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, the ranking member, Mr. Graves, is offering what? Yeah, do it. Who wants to do it? Who's offering the? Uh, yep, yeah, the ranking member, Mr. Graves, is offering the on block amendment. An on block amendment offered by Mr. Graves to the amendment in the nature of substitute to HR two, consisting of the following. An amendment offered by Ms. Miller, 033. An amendment offered by Mr. Spano, 37. An amendment offered by Mr. Spano, 38. An amendment offered by Mr. Gibbs, 32. An amendment offered by Mr. Graves of Louisiana, 133. An amendment offered by Mr. Graves, Louisiana, 148. An amendment offered by Mr. Graves, Louisiana, 129. Could you uh, revise? Could you clarify that that's the older Graves, wiser Graves? Uh, well, I believe the offerer of the amendment is the older, wiser, so-called Big Graves, and the author of the three amendments is the, uh, shall we not say anything beyond the Little Graves? Uh, is that clarification enough? Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> all right, uh, we're getting a little punchy here. Uh, without objection, all of the amendments uh, shall be considered uh, with read, as read, uh, within the unblock. Uh, what members wish to be recognized to speak on the unblock? Uh, Mr. Graves uh, from uh, Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad to, uh, I'm very glad that we could find um, amendments in the package that, you know, that we could group together and, and move forward. And I very much appreciate your uh, willingness to work on this. You know, this is a process that uh, is not easy. Um, you know, in all my years of being here, uh, it doesn't get any easier, but I very much appreciate uh, your willingness and, and, uh, and your candor and your friendship. And with that, I urge support of the on block and yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, other members wishing to be recognized, Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My amendment is just a wonderful bipartisan solution to a troubled Appalachian development highway system known as ADHS. The underlying language in the bill undermined the ADHS as a viable road network by moving states that had been slow to use their money off of the ledger and leaving states that are in desperate need of these funds in a lurch. The amendment I'm offering now is language from a bipartisan bill, the Aid in Appalachia Act, of which I'm a proud to be a, an original sponsor. It's a commonplace solution, common sense co solution that will make it possible for states to reprioritize federal dollars from the ADHS after applying and gaining approval from the Secretary of Transportation. The amendment will allow states to transfer monies they are not using from the ADHS to states that are in need in exchange for unrestricted funds from TIFIA. This will allow more total funding for states borrowing the money and the states that have refused to spend their ADHS funds without the need for Congress to authorize more funding. I yield back. I thank the gentlelady for her amendment, a meritorious amendment, and for her brevity. Other members wish to be recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Gibbs? Gibbs, uh, Mr. Gibbs, yes. Yeah. 
Mr. Yeah, Gibbs, you're like, recognized uh, for up to three minutes. Yep, yeah, yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be really short, like I usually am. I just wanted to mention that the amendment I got in, we got in the envelope, appreciate that. It's, uh, it deals with, in transit title 2000, 2303, deals with uh, bus testing standards. Uh, the, uh, please uh, move the mic, mic a little closer so we can hear oh. you. Okay, Bob. Okay, yeah. Uh, with bus, uh, uh, doing research development bus standards. And back in the 1987 highway bill, Pennsylvania State, uh, Altoona was, uh, the facility is doing that and they're still doing that, uh, my understanding. But this will also add the, the, uh, a, a premier research facility at the Ohio State University with a, a TRC facility in here in Ohio. Uh, uh, that's a, a, a one of the premier facilities in the world and uh, will help complement that in Altoona and uh, for bus safety and testing and uh, going forward. So I just want to say it's good that's in there. Uh, it's common sense. It makes sense and it'll help with uh, bus transit safety and as we move forward, autonomous vehicles and driver safety. So I feel that. Uh, I thank the gentleman for his brevity and the merits of his amendment. Uh, are there other members who wish to be uh, recognized? Uh, Mr. Graves from Louisiana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, I want to thank you for working with us on these amendments. Uh, number one, uh, uh, Amendment 131, which addresses uh, some of the backlog on uh, commercial driver's license and uh, some of the testing education. And look forward to working with you to continue to perfect uh, that language because I know that you you uh, share the same concerns that we do there. Number two, um, uh, Amendment number 148, which uh, pertains to inundated roads and, and having FEMA and the Federal Highway Administration working together uh, to develop new and better guidance related to inundated roads as it as it uh, applies to disasters. And I know that my friends from Texas, Florida, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, and many other states have been through some of the incredible frustration that we have with FEMA and others in dealing with uh, some of the flawed, uh, short-sighted policies there. And then lastly, Mr. Chairman, uh, this is just following up, and I, and I want to Reiterate, Mr. Chairman, you're, uh, you, you indicated it is revised 129. Um, just want to make note for the clerk, uh, revised 129, which, uh, of course, um, is the high-priority corridor uh, for the Baton Rouge area. Um, and, um, Mr. Chairman, I, I ask unanimous consent to include in the record a letter from Louisiana Department of Transportation uh, that does support uh, that uh, high-priority corridor designation. And, um, and lastly, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm for uh, Mr. Babin and for uh, folks from Louisiana, ask unanimous consent to submit a second letter into the record um, from the Louisiana Department of Transportation related to the I-14 corridor. Um, so without objection, uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask that those two letters be included uh, in the record. And I want to thank uh, you and uh, fellow members of the committee for working with us on, on this uh, subset of the amendments. Yield back. Uh, I thank the gentleman, thank him for his cooperation, thank him for the promise of his state DOT in providing uh, that letter. I doubt I could have pried one out of my state DOT in that period of time. It's always important uh, to have leverage, sir. <laughs> and um, and um, I, I'm not certain that we've got all the states uh, for I-14 yet, but that is helpful uh, to Mr. Babin in his amendment. Uh, in getting that also uh, ready for the Mandarin's Amendment. This one will be adopted now, his hopefully later. Uh, with that, uh, other members wish to be recognized on the on block Amendment. Okay, um, hearing none, uh, at this point uh, I'm prepared uh, to move and I, I'm going to take a risk here and uh, uh, say that um, as far as I am aware, uh, there is no dissension uh, on either side of the aisle from this amendment, and therefore I will first ask uh, for unanimous consent that the on block amendment be approved as offered. Hearing no objection, observing a 15 minute pause for those remotely, uh, the amendment is agreed to. And I'm now waiting for the piece. All right, uh, there will be a brief pause for commercial uh, while they provide the next script for the next things we will consider. So I, I don't think we need to go to recess, but let's not start 
chatting. How long do we think this will take? All right, we'll, um, let's just say we're in recess for two minutes. All right, Joe.
it's back. Hello, it's back, thank you. I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, the house does need some work on technology. Uh, Mr. Uh, Davis. Anyway, um, I uh, call up the uh, following amendments to move in block. The clerk will designate the amendments within the unblock. An unblock amendment offered by Mr. Graves of Missouri as follows. Graves, Louisiana, 124. Gonzalez Colon, Puerto Rico, 121. Gonzalez Colon, Puerto Rico, 130. Mr. Balderson, 20. Gonzalez Colon, Puerto Rico, 150. Gonzalez Colon, Puerto Rico, 152. Mr. Babin, 44. Mr. Graves of Louisiana, PL01. Lamalfa, 65, revised. Mr. Balderson, 23. Mr. Miller, 29. Mr. Crawford, uh, 047, Crawford, 057, LaMalfa, 63, Spano, 35, Miller, 30, Crawford, MN19, Crawford, MN28, Crawford, MN33, Gibbs, MN26, Gibbs, MN22, Gibbs, 30, Westerman, 30, Westerman, 43, Westerman, 44, Westerman, 45, Mitchell, 66, Miller, 20. Miller 42, Miller 41, Smucker 27, Graves 136, Graves 140, Graves 144, Graves 145, Miller 34, Miller 35, Perry 122, Perry 126, Perry 127, Perry 131, Perry 132, Perry 133, Perry 134, Perry 135, Perry 136, Crawford, 58, Palmer, 29, LaMalfa, 67, Browser, 33, Smucker, 28, Perry, 137, Graves, 155, Babin, 048, Perry, 138, Gonzalez Colon, 136, Palmer, 028, Graves, 155, Graves, 139, Westerman, 047, Graves, 132, Mast, 064, Mast, 065, Smucker, 023, Balderson, 025, Batten, 046, Graves, PL03. Mr. Chairman. Can we clarify uh, just the fourth one? You said Balderson 30, and I've got on my sheet Balderson 20. I do, I also have 20. Uh, it's Balderson 20. Okay. 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 All right. And that was the entire 57. Okay. All right. I wasn't paying attention. The clerk read quickly. I thank the clerk. Uh, uh, with that, uh, the uh, without objection, uh, the amendments the amendments will be considered as read. Uh, do members wish to be recognized to speak on the unblock? Mr. Chairman. Who, who's seeking recognition? Yes, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and uh, I, I look forward to continue this process, but I would like to speak on, on an amendment that was very important to me, and it was the Drive Safe Act amendment that was included in the M Block. Uh, this amendment would establish a two step apprenticeship program to allow qualified drivers between the age of 18 and 20 that already have taken the CDL knowledge test received a commercial learner's permit, passed the CDL road test skills, and currently hold a CDL to ultimately participate in interstate commerce. First, the apprentice would need to complete 120 hours of on-duty time and prove that they are competent in the following areas. Interstate, city traffic, rural two-lane and evening driving, safety awareness, speed and space management, lane control, minor scanning right and left turns, and logging and complying with rules related to hours of service. After completing the first probationary period, the CDL holder would need to complete an additional 280 hours of on-duty time and must meet an additional set of performance benchmarks. It's important to note, while the driver is completing the 400 hours of additional training, the apprentice must be accompanied in the cab by an inexperienced trucker, and the commercial motor vehicle the individual is driving must be equipped with various safety instru instruments, including 
automatic manual or automatic transmissions, active braking collision systems, forward-facing video event capture, and govern speeds of 60 miles, 65 miles per hour at pedal. Uh, gentlemen, we'll suspend for a moment. Someone is not muted, please. We're, uh, we're moving along toward a conclusion this evening, and we need everyone to be muted so the gentleman can be clearly heard. There's like burbling going on out there or someone talking. Hello, hello, who's not muted? Thank you. Wait, no, hello. Please mute your phones. Mute. Thank you. The gentleman may continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Govern speeds of 65 miles per hour at the pedal and 65 miles per hour under adaptive cruise control. During last week's committee hearing, I was able to discuss the workforce needs of trucking industry with Randy Gullett, president of Triple G Express Incorporated in Southeast Motor Freight and the chairman of the American Trucking Associations. As Mr. Gullett noted, the trucking industry faces a shortage of more than 60,000 qualified drivers and will need to hire roughly 1.1 million over the next decade. Additionally, the COVID pandemic has only worsened the delays and backlog of CDL testing. Mr. Chairman, I ask for unanimous consent for the record from a following letter uh, that I have here uh, for the Drive Safe Coalition supporting this proposal. This letter is signed by nearly 100 organizations and companies in a wide variety of industries, including the Ohio Beverage Association, UPS, National Gro Gro Grocers Association, National Retail Federation, the National Restaurant Association, National Association of Manufacturers, American Chemistry Council, and American Trucking Association, just to name a few. The, without objection, and the time of the gentleman has expired, and the, it will be entered into the record. Do other members wish, uh, Ms. Miller? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My amendment today is an important step in protecting drivers and communities that have already been devastated by the opioid epidemic. According to the most recent data, most drivers do not know that driving under the influence of certain prescription medications can be illegal, not to mention very dangerous. In my home state of West Virginia, more drivers receive DUIs for driving under the influence of drugs than they do from alcohol. It's essential that the public be made aware of this danger. That is why my amendment, which mirrors my legislation, the Reinforcing Impaired Driving Education, or RIDE Act, is an important first step in reversing the dangerous trend of driving under the influence of medication by studying the best ways to communicate with the public in the regions that are most affected. My legislation creates a pilot program through the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration to market the dangers of driving while on prescription drugs. This bill is a way to help curb drug driving and pre prevent needless deaths. I urge my colleagues to support this common sense amendment. I yield my time. I thank the gentlelady. Mr. Uh, Chairman. Yes, uh, sounds like Ms. Colon, perhaps. Yes, yes. Jennifer Gonzalez. Gentlelady is recognized for three minutes. Please be close to the microphone so we can hear you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me now? Barely. I, I like Ken, it's a, it's a little faint and echoey, but uh, please speak up. Okay. Uh, I would like to offer my amendment uh, to increase the level of funding for uh, the Puerto Rico Highway Program as well as the Territorial Highway Program um, uh, by $200 million. Prior to the passage of the Transportation Equity Act in the, uh, for the 21st century, uh, Puerto Rico received a formula of funding, uh, but since switching to block grant funding for federal aid highways, uh, Puerto Rico has not been adequately, adequately funded. Uh, that's the reason this amendment will address uh, that inequity by raising by uh, the, the authorization level of $510 million for the territories, including Puerto Rico. And to put this on, just into perspective, uh, if we compare Puerto Rico to other similar states, such as Connecticut, uh, Puerto Rico will receive roughly uh, more than $431 million based on the metrics uh, for determining formula funding for states. And those metrics are population, population density, federal highway lane mines, uh, other principal uh, lane mines, bridge and principal uh, areas, vehicles, uh, miles traveled on principal uh, interstate and freeways, among others. 
So complying with all the same uh, requirements, Puerto Rico should receive that amount and this, as, as the rest of the territories. Um, but instead of that, we only get $158 million a year. And this funding uh, is, is, has been capped, and we are in a stagnant uh, moment uh, since 1993. Uh, those are the levels of funding on highways in Puerto Rico. And as you mentioned it uh, during the markup in February of this year, I know many people visited the island during the hurricanes, during the earthquakes, and this, uh, this is the reason of this amendment, just to increase the authorization level for all, uh, all the territories, uh, because it's not enough. Um, a stagnant level of funding means the island uh, could, in the best case, just maintain the current infrastructure and hardly uh, address any new needs. Uh, while FAST Act made great reforms and have innovative programs, Puerto Rico's authorization was capped to $158 million for five years. Uh, stagnant funding, while inflation just increased more than 7.7%. After those hurricanes, adequate funding uh, will allow Puerto Rico and the rest of the territories to invest in pre-disaster mitigation, to withstand or lessen the impact of natural hazards, alternative uh, evacuation routes, improving access to rural communities, creating good paying jobs, and providing better, better access to markets uh, to help restart our uh, uh, manufacturing uh, industry. Uh, that's the reason we need to amend uh, the invest and invest in this infrastructure uh, bill. And I urge uh, the reason uh, for this amendment is not just Puerto Rico, it's all the territories. And I hope uh, my colleagues can uh, vote for it as well. I yield back, Chairman. I thank the gentlelady. Other members? Uh, Mr. Perry. Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to talk particularly about two amendments of the ones that I have in this on block. And I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, Perry 138, this amendment helps alleviate the privacy concerns I raised earlier in the markup. Uh, transportation policy, in my opinion, should not be used to limit Americans' freedom of movement, and I don't think it's anybody's desire to do that. Uh, given the provisions in this bill to collect individual user data real time or in the aggregate, there are significant and I think reasonable concerns that this data could be used to limit the travel or mobility of America whether due to COVID-19, to limit emissions or otherwise. This amendment alleviates these concerns by simply stating that the federal government cannot use that information it has acquired to limit travel or mobility. And I hope that uh, my colleagues would uh, consider voting in favor of that. The other one is uh, 132. The, the amendment prohibits waivers to the Buy America Act regarding zero emission buses. So let's be clear, right now we're trying to buy zero emission buses, but we waive the Buy American component to that, so we can buy them anywhere. And we do, of course. It's vital to remind everyone that the phrase zero emission vehicles is a deceptive and misleading labeling practice as it fails to account for the emissions related to energy intensive battery manufacturing process and the power generation necessary to recharge the battery. The reality not only limits the net emissions reductions offered by transition to those vehicles, it requires significant amounts of rare earth minerals necessary for battery production. Now, China has a stranglehold over the component mineral supply chains in the battery manufacturing industry. We heard from our colleague, Mr. Starber, about not only is China's involvement, but child labor's involvement. Uh, China is projected to supply around two thirds of global battery demand in 2020. The extremely energy intensive manufacturing process will be powered largely by coal well into the future. Today, 70% of China's power is generated at coal-fired power plants, and they will continue to generate over half a million of the nation's power through 2040, which according to Mark Mills at the Manhattan Institute means over the lifespan of these batteries, there would be more carbon dioxide emissions associated with manufacturing them than would be offset by using those batteries to say replace internal combustion engines. It's important to note that these projections likely underestimate the emissions in question as they are prohibited by prior uh, published prior to China's recently announced plans to massively expand coal-generated capacity while cutting funding for renewables by 40%. There is nothing environmentally friendly about relying on Chinese batteries, child labor, uh, or otherwise for zero-emission vehicles. We should not be rewarding our enemies in the majority's uh, pursuit for the Green New Deal. And so let's not give these waivers. I urge my colleagues to support my amendment, and I yield back the balance. I thank the gentleman. Other members? Uh, Mr. Westerman. Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would actually like to speak um, on Mr. Perry's amendment. Well, you can speak on in, any of these. In support of it, and then I've got some amendments as well, but. You got three minutes to talk about whatever you want. That's per, per amendment or per? Or no, per? I'm sorry, sir. <laughs> so I'm the, I think you referred this morning to uh, people like me as the pointy head engineers. So uh, I'm one of those pointy head engineers that I haven't said a whole lot because actually to be a pointy head engineer, you, uh, you have to take this exam called the professional engineers exam that talks about this code of ethics for engineers, and, and one thing engineers are not supposed to do is to talk about things that they don't have uh, knowledge of, and if we would ap adapt that code of ethics to the committee, our meetings would be a lot, a lot less time consuming. Um, I'm willing to consider something along those lines. But uh, Mr. Perry reminded me of a topic that's come up multiple times in the discussion. Um, talking about when he talked about zero emission vehicles and, and there's this idea out there that, and I've, I've heard you say it several times, Mr. Chairman, that the, the largest greenhouse gas emitting sector is transportation, which is true, a whopping 28%, a big one percentage point ahead of electrical generation. But we're dealing with automobiles and trucks in this committee, which are only a fraction of the 28%. And uh, when you talk about zero emissions in these beautiful electric cars, we forget to ask, well, where does that electricity come from out of the, uh, out of the wall? And it comes from the second largest greenhouse gas emitting uh, sector, which is energy production, which is still about 60 to 70% from fossil fuels. Uh, all the, uh, the wind and solar, as good as it is, it's only about 9% of the, uh, electricity production. So when you have an electric car, you're still emitting uh, carbon at the electrical generating facility. And I'm all for electric cars and uh, renewable energy, but if we wanted to be intellectually honest about it, we would be pursuing uh, nuclear energy because it has zero carbon emissions. But when we talk about nuclear energy to produce clean energy for these electric vehicles, that's taboo and off, off subject. So um, we, uh, we kind of talk about things in, in misleading ways and reminds me of something a, a statistics professor in graduate school said. He said, numbers and people are a lot alike. If you torture them long enough, they'll tell you anything uh, you want to know. And we, we definitely torture the numbers in here. But unfortunately, or, or actually fortunately, math and, and science, they kind of hold true and uh, they don't they don't get involved in, in political things, but they sure take the brunt of a lot of political discussions. So as we talk about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, I hope we could really look at the, the science and we could look at solutions that Republicans offer. It's not that we disagree on wanting to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It's just that we actually have logical, uh, well thought out ideas on how to do it that doesn't fit into your political, um, okay. your political Narrative. Okay. All right. I thank um, the gentleman. So the gentleman's time. Work. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, I would uh, know that other parts of the package, not authored by this committee, coming from Energy and Commerce, will deal with the production of renewable electricity and reinforcement of the grid to better transmit renewable energy around the country. I don't know what they, uh, what definitions they're using for renewable or zero emissions that is beyond the jurisdiction of this committee. But I thank the gentleman for his uh, not pointy-headed engineering points. So uh, with that, um, we will, uh, who else? Someone, I think there's someone where, someone where I hear them. Uh, you're recognized, sir. You're recognized. Uh, so, uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have three amendments that I'm hoping to have considered uh, that are part of the unblock now. Uh, one made uh, significant improvements to the RIF program, RIF program, which have resulted in additional and uh, unleashed investments in rail. Uh, another would have renamed the U.S. Department of Transportation headquarters in D.C. after the late former Secretary William Thaddeus Coleman, Jr. Uh, who died in 2017, born in my home state of Pennsylvania, served as the fourth United States Secretary of Transportation 
was the first African American to serve in that position and only the second African American to serve in a cabinet level position. So I think it'd be appropriate to uh, rename uh, the headquarters in his honor. And then finally, um, we still desperately need help uh, for ag producers in my district and across the country who still are forced to deal with unworkable regulations for shipping uh, perishable goods and livestock. We do currently have uh, an exception uh, for up to 150 mile radius, but that just is not sufficient for uh, ag producers. We've all seen during COVID, uh, the great supply chain that we have, they uh, changed their, uh, quickly to address the changing needs of consumers. Um, and we made, we provided some flexibility during this time and need to continue to extend that. The bill that I had, uh, or the amendment that I had is based on the TREAD Act, which is a bipartisan bill that I had introduced along with Representative Angie Craig, and I greatly appreciate her on this important issue. And I, I just want to say again, um, you know, I'm very proud of the area that I represent. Uh, we, we're one of the top egg layer districts across the country, one of the top dairy producers, uh, among other uh, ag products as well. Uh, they need our help. And so I hope uh, this is one that uh, we can address uh, sometime soon. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I thank gentleman for his brevity. Other members who wish to be recognized in the room or virtually? Uh, Mr. Graves from Louisiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have about 142 amendments in this on block. Um, and um, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I um, I want to make note that I, I, I think we, <laughs> you go through and add everything up. I mean, there are like 150 amendments that are that are somewhere um, that I don't think we've 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 fully digested. Um, I know we've been doing this for about 23 hours, um, and uh, and I do appreciate the opportunity to work with you all on on some of the amendments and and a number of them that are in here are, are really important. Uh, number one. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've talked a good bit about the environmental review process, and I've, I've built uh, billions of dollars, in fact, tens of billions of dollars worth of, of infrastructure projects and um, have been through EAs and EISs and um, FONSIs and all the other uh, fun components of NEPA that we get to go through. And, um, and it, it is a flawed process, and the flaw is often in the implementation of it. Um, that process of pre-construction now, as I mentioned before, it takes more time and it takes more money than it ever has before, and that detracts from the actual purpose of the project. An I-10 bridge in Lake Charles, an I-10 bridge in Baton Rouge, finishing the I-49 connector up uh, in North Louisiana, all of these are priority projects that in many cases are obstructed or challenged or uh, dealt curveballs as a result of, of NEPA reviews that, that, that we're not asking to short circuit the environmental process. We're, we're simply asking to, to finish that process faster and their ways of doing it without compromising um, the, the environmental objectives. Uh, secondly, one, one other thing to bring up, Mr. Chairman, is, is uh, I want to I wanna follow uh, some of the comments of Mr. Perry, Mr. Westerman, uh, Mr. Palmer, and others in regard to climate. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think that we actually do share some, some goals uh, but as indicated by, by Mr. Westerman, um, uh, pointy head, Mr. Westerman, I, I, I think that um, in many cases, the solutions that are being advanced in this legislation and in other legislation that's being proffered uh, this Congress, it, it does not actually advance or look at the, the full picture. It doesn't look at where these minerals are coming from and how those environmentally insensitive uh, uh, mining practices are having an impact on the global environment, looking at child labor, looking at end-to-end at, at -end emissions of some of these practices, like Mr. Westman just noted, some of the electricity generation that, that how are we charging these cars? The electricity doesn't come out of the socket, it doesn't come out of thin air. Um, and, and looking at the end-to-end -end aspects, looking at the incredible role that natural gas in fact, domestically produced natural gas, which has the cleanest emissions profile in the planet so far, um, and the role that plays in actually em reducing emissions moving forward. Uh, there are a lot of things I think we can do to improve this bill, and I hope that we have a chance to do that before this becomes law, um, because otherwise I think we could actually find ourselves back there. Uh, with that, I, 
I uh, yield back and um, uh, urge adoption of the amendment. Uh, I thank the gentleman, although he did have no time to yield back. Uh, other members uh, who wish to be recognized on the amendment? Uh, Mr. Palmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for working with us on this. Um, the amendment I want to talk about first would strike language designed to prohibit states from using federal fund exchange programs. These programs allow localities to swap their federal funds for state dollars and so complete projects without costly federal requirements. In Kansas, which pioneered the system in 2010, three counties used money from their exchange to do chip sealing on their roads, a maintenance type improvement not eligible for federal aid. The Kansas Department of Transportation highlights the economic benefit of these programs. A cost comparison revealed that a project completed under federal guidelines would cost 20% more than if completed using state dollars because of the $423,000 project revealed a 20% savings when it was completed by the locality using state funds instead of federal dollars. The programs are so beneficial that localities are willing to accept less money overall because without the red tape, they will still come out ahead. In Nebraska counties and first class cities netted 23.2 million for road projects in 2016 after trading 25.8 million in federal funding to the state. While that's 10% less than the original allocation, the money will go further because it's free of federal conditions. Uh, the mere fact that more than 10 states have created such programs is a testimony to the benefit of the federal fund exchange program. These states include Minnesota, which has an even exchange. Oregon exchange rate is 94 cents on the dollar. Nebraska, South Dakota both do 90 cents on the dollar. Ohio, uh, Indiana, and South Dakota all have these programs. It's not just the states that support these programs. In 2015, during the Obama administration, the Federal Highway Administration identified Kansas swap program as a noteworthy practice, noting that the swap programs allow the local agencies to better meet their highest needs. So I would encourage support for this. Uh, uh, the, the gentleman would suspend for a moment. Someone online has unmuted. Please don't unmute until you're seeking to be recognized. The gentleman will continue. Reclaiming my time. My other amendment would expand the global climate change goals to include life cycle emissions and recognizes the importance of innovation that is both affordable and exportable. Efforts to reduce emissions must take a holistic view of technologies to ensure we understand the full impact of a particular policy prescription. My amendment would ensure we look at life cycle emissions, not just emissions from a snapshot in time. The United States has led the world in reducing emissions over the last 15 years, but globally emissions have increased dramatically during that same period. If we're to address global emissions, whatever we do here in the United States has to be exportable to the world. And for it to be exportable, in particular to developing nations, it must be affordable to those countries. Policies that increase the cost of energy, transportation, or manufacturing will fail to be adopted globally and thus will not reduce global emissions. I urge adoption of the, the amendment. And I'd also like to point out that I've gone green. Uh, I bought a battery-powered chainsaw and then immediately went out and cut down some trees. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, I've been using my chainsaw lately, too. So. Uh, I'd like to introduce this into the record, if I may. Uh, without, uh, without objection, the gentleman's statement is entered into the record. There is still someone online. If they're not seeking recognition, they should be muted. If they are seeking recognition, I will look to the screen and see who it is. Is someone online seeking to be recognized? Uh, not seeing any hands up at the moment. Anyone else in the room who wishes? Uh, Were you already recognized once? It's this bite. Yeah. Well, I no, we don't get two bites at this apple. Uh, <laughs> I know we are allowing three. If you want to ask another member who has not been recognized to yield you time for their seat. Other still, there's someone online. Please. Thank you. We're, we're, you know, I know this has been a very, very long process. Uh, many of you have the luxury of having remained in your districts. I flew across the United States of America. It took me 11 hours to get here. I'm here. I've been here for a long period of time. And I wish that everyone would observe the decorum of muting while they're not uh, seeking to be recognized. Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, where's uh, Mr. Chairman? I, I hear someone I can't. <laughs> Where? 
It's oh, well, Rouser. Uh, Mr. Rouser, you recognize. I yield uh, as much time as my uh, pointed head friend can consume. Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Rouser. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I had five amendments, Mr. Chairman, and, and we didn't get to talk about any of them, but they're in the, the end block. But there is, there's one that I hope that we will give some consideration to because it's in the, the federal lands uh, transportation program that has about $550 million in it, and, and your bill designates about three-fourths of that to the Park Service and leaves out the other federal agencies. And if you look at the, the Pew did a study that said the Park Service has about 5,000 miles of roads where the Forest Service uh, has 400,000 miles of roads. So I hope that we would do a better job of allocating those funds uh, to all the federal agencies. And when you look at Forest Service roads in my district, they're not just there for the Forest Service. They're where a lot of rural residents travel to the uh, to school, to the doctor, uh, and, and it's in some instances the only roads that they have. So uh, I think there's a big disparity there in the amount of funds that are allocated or authorized for Park Service versus the funds authorized for uh, Forest Service and Fish and Wildlife. And there's also another amendment that I had that uh, would make NEPA more effective by uh, not allowing suits until a final decision was made, uh, which uh, would actually help with environmental uh, permitting and, the, and help the environment overall. So I know these, um, these, my five amendments got squished before they ever get a chance to get heard, but I hope that uh, you will take that into consideration uh, when the bill gets on the floor and when it ultimately meets up with something more reasonable that the Senate has put together. Uh, I thank the gentleman. I'm very sensitive to the public lands issue uh, more than uh, Half of my district is owned by the federal government, predominantly Forest Service and BLM. And uh, we did increase uh, by more than 100% the allocation to the Forest Service. The Park Service, I mean, and there is a multi-billion dollar deficit in both the Forest Service and the Park Service. Uh, and we're trying to address both needs and you know, actually, we could use more money in both programs. I'd love to find a way to do that. So I thank the gentleman for his advocacy. Other members uh, wishing to address the amendment? Uh, hearing none, uh, then uh, we will uh, move. Uh, I got one. I got whoop, one. Whoop. Who is it? Lamalfa. All right. Uh, Mr. Lamalfa from California, in California, is recognized. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate it. And I guess uh, I'm bringing it home uh, here, uh, so. Um, pull it just a little just, closer. Uh, You're a big guy and I know you speak loud, so just bring the mic a little closer. Okay, I'll bring it. Um, thank you. Uh, just, just uh, both have to do with rail that I'll try and talk about in the time here. Um, California high-speed rail, of course, uh, we hear a lot about that. Uh, my colleague, Mr. Perry, talked about the uh, funds that could still be expended that should not be the 900 plus million. And uh, what, what I'm looking at is that uh, my amendment would ban any advancement of general of federal funds to the project partners that do not spend simultaneously. California has not upheld its part in matching funds with uh, the three and a half billion that the federal government allotted it back in 2009 right after the rail uh, bond was passed in 2008. Here we are in 2020, and it's way behind schedule. Uh, requir requires a project cost estimate to include the cost of the rails and engines that are actually capable of speeds of 150 or greater miles per hour. We're not even talking high-speed rail right now. They want to use diesel tra trains on the short bit of track they're doing. So this breaks the covenant between the voters who passed it barely in 2008 and the federal government who were told California was going to use it for a high-speed rail system. So that's, again, more lies, more misdirection by the high-speed rail authority. They have metrics such as how many jobs the, the rail is going to provide. They were trying to tell us back about nine years ago it was going to provide a million jobs. Instead, they finally admitted it was a million job years, which is something completely different. So we don't want them to use that type of language anymore in, in order 
to try and sell the public on this continually. Even hey, the LA Rodney. Times came Rodney. out and said, and said that there's big problems with this and needs to be rethought in, a, in an uh, article the other day. So the high-speed rail clown should fully reimburse any funds granted them if they do not pay the landowners, the farmers, the renderers, the, the schools that they're ramming us through in, um, in, in Central California right now. I'd also like to enter into the record a, a, a letter from my colleague, Mr. Kevin Brady from Texas. He has one talking about the Texas system there where he's asking there not be public funds in Texas, which they had asked never asked for them before, now they're starting to. And this is a place where uh, they uh, are not seeking to do the rail. There's many opponents to it now. California, they can't meet the goal with a bunch of uh, state government still wanting to do it. So uh, a lot of issues with high-speed rail in California ought not be uh, getting more funds. Indeed, it probably owes the federal government a reimbursement for not adhering to the goals. The other amendment I'll touch on real quickly has to do with uh, rail workers that we need random drug testing for them because these are the folks that do the maintenance of, of freight trains, of passenger trains, even prospective 220 mile per hour high speed trains. And so right now there's not a drug testing policy for them. The industry is asking for this so they can be responsible for what their workers are doing and that they have people that are showing up that are capable of doing the maintenance and keeping the trains safe and running on time, et cetera, et cetera. So that's my other amendment on that with that. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate uh, us coming together here at the end of the day and working something out on having these uh, abilities to uh, get some of our amendments done and at least talk about them. So thank you. I yield back. Uh, I thank the gentleman. I, I know that uh, the high-speed rail project in California uh, has been an issue of contention for many years, and uh, I won't delve into that at this point. Are there other members who wish to be recognized? Mr. Uh, Chairman, Paul Mitchell here. What's that? Mr. Chairman, Paul Mitchell here, question to be recognized. Oh, Paul Mitchell, uh, Mr. Mitchell, yes, you're certainly recognized given that you helped expedite proceedings. I'll give you a liberal three well, thank minutes you. if you need it. Well, Don Quixote is going to yield his three minutes to uh, Ms. Colon. To whom? Ms. Oh, Ms. Colon, okay. Ms. Thanks, yes. Don. Okay, Ms. Colon. Do you have Thank a wind you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Thank you, uh, Mitchell, for, for, for yielding uh, the time. I want to speak about another amendment that uh, we do have there uh, in the in blog and was uh, requested by, actually, uh, the Puerto Rico Public Service Bureau uh, to include Puerto Rico in the commercial driver's license program. Right now, Puerto Rico is... Can you hear me now, then? Uh, the, uh, Puerto Rico is not included uh, in that program. And uh, the driving uh, a commercial motor, uh, motor vehicle requires a higher uh, level of knowledge and uh, experience, skills, and physical abilities that uh, require to drive a non-commercial vehicle. Uh, so in order to obtain that commercial driver's license, or CDL, uh, the applicant must pass both skills and knowledge testing uh, geared to the highest standards. Um, those CDLs are not required in Puerto Rico. That's the reason the government was requesting uh, this amendment that is included in the M block. Uh, so the CDL holders must meet uh, those, uh, those standards. And having those standards in Puerto Rico will help uh, raise the confidence in among, among uh, all those who want to invest in business in Puerto Rico by knowing there's a similar standard, standard of training and safety as in the rest of the country. So that was the reason we included this amendment uh, that will also help uh, drive any driver moving uh, to or from Puerto Rico by ensuring that they have the skills to allow them to automatically uh, be qualified to find a work. In the current driver shortages in the nation uh, experience uh, will count. Uh, this amendment will also provide a five-year transition period to have time to update technology, uh, educate drivers, and ensure the program will work effectively for all involved. And uh, uh, thank you, Mitchell, again, uh, for yielding uh, the time. And uh, thank you, Chairman. I yield back. I uh, thank the gentlelady. Uh, the gentleman has one minute left. Does he wish to utilize it? Apparently not. OK, thank you. I can, I can, I can take it, Mr. Mitchell. No, oh, I, I thought you were concluded, Jennifer. Come on. <laughs> I, I, I yield back. Mitchell, OK, I thank the gentleman. He yielded back. Uh, other members, Mr. I, see, I see Mer, Mer, uh, Ms. Mer, 
Uh, McCrussell Powell has raised her hand. Uh, you're recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Quickly, um, I don't have the language in front of me, but I'd like to express support on this amendment. I think that it's critically important to make sure that we, whatever we're doing here in the continental United States, we also apply it to Puerto Rico, especially to um, build trust in, in investing in the island. So I just wanted to state my support for this amendment. Thank the gentlelady. The um, uh, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands and other territories have been too long neglected. This bill does uh, increase funding uh, very substantially. It's the first time in more than, I think, a quarter of a century. So um, in any case, I appreciate the advocate uh, advocacy of most, uh, both Ms. Plaskett and uh, Ms. Cologne on these issues. Uh, Mr. Balderson has indicated he would like to be recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I ask unanimous consent to remove Balderson Amendment Number 25 from this M block, from the M block. And as I understand it, uh, it was earlier adopted. Correct. It was earlier adopted. Okay. Yes. It does not to be in. I guess uh, I thank, thank the gentleman. And uh, is there any objection? Uh, with no objection, so ordered. Uh, other members who wish to be recognized. Seeing none, hearing none, uh, we will move forward. Uh, therefore, uh, okay. Uh, the question is on the amendment, on block, uh, with the uh, lengthy list of amendments, uh, which have been discussed uh, for some time. Uh, and we are gonna go through a voice vote. Uh, and then see if we need a recorded vote. So the, uh, we will first go to the eyes. Uh, regular procedure, please prepare, please unmute. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. All right, thank you. <laughs> please mute. Uh, those uh, who are opposed to the amendment, uh, please prepare, please unmute. Those, and let's try to do it all together this time. Maybe on the last try we can do it. Uh, those who are opposed to the amendment signify by saying nay. 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 You guys would not be good cheerleaders, let me tell you. I mean, you're like way off key. Um, in the opinion of the chair, the nays have it. The nays have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Mr. Chair. What, uh, we will now proceed. Um, Ms. McCarthy Powell, uh, we were about to proceed to recorded votes. Oh, no, Garzoli's cologne. He told me it was, uh, sorry, uh, Ms. Cologne. Yeah, I just do have the recorded voice. Well, uh, well, there is the lag, and she's in Puerto Rico. So it, we will add it to the list of recorded okay. votes. No, I, I, given that probably the lag for Puerto Rico is worse than everywhere else, uh, I will... Uh, Retract the gavel, and we will add it to the list of recorded votes. All right, so now we will proceed uh, to recorded votes. Uh, okay, uh, the first uh, question is on agreeing to the amendment offered by Mr. Graves, numbered 131, on which the no's prevail by voice vote as recorded votes are requested. Mr. Chairman, asking him his consent to withdraw the vote request. Uh, you don't have to ask him his consent, and uh, uh, I appreciate that. Okay, we'll move on to the next. Uh, the next question is on agreeing to the amendment offered by Mr. Davis 104, on which the notice prevailed by voice vote as a order of votes so requested. Hearing nothing. Uh, Wait, Mr. Davis, uh, he, he's been serving us all coffee because we're all getting a little tired here. So he probably went out to get some more for everybody. 
Okay. We will pause for a moment. One hundred four, uh, Mr. Davis, as recorded votes are requested. Uh, Mr. Chair, I apologize. I was on the phone with my daughter. Uh, I will withdraw my recorded vote request. Well, I, I thought you were fetching us more coffee, but uh, that's <laughs> an even better excuse. So, I do want to say thank you for uh, the on blocks and thank you for uh, your cooperation with this markup at the end. Thanks. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, uh, the amendment uh, or the vote is withdrawn. Uh, the next question is agreeing to the amendment offered by uh, Mr. Graves, no. 128, no's prevailed, as recorded vote so requested. Ask me to have consent to withdraw voting request, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry, I, you had your mask on. I, oh, okay. Ask you to have consent to withdraw the voting request. Okay, well, I don't think you have to ask you to see, but uh, it is withdrawn. Thank you. I appreciate you're wearing a mask, by the way, unlike some other members. Um, the question is on agreeing to the amendment. I'm talking too much, so I haven't put mine on. The question is on agreeing to the amendment offered by Mr. Graves, number 127, on which no's prevail as recorded vote so requested. Mr. Chairman, I ask you to withdraw a voting request. Uh, without objection. The question is on agreeing to the amendment offered by the other Mr. Big. Sam Graves from Missouri uh, on block on which the nays uh, prevailed uh, is a recorded vote still requested. You don't have to, it's up to you. Okay, sure, okay. Uh, recorded vote is requested, the clerk will call the roll. <laughs> 